David DeAngelis Presents The Magnificent Life by Anthony Norvell Digitally narrated using the voice of Edward Herman Introduction There is a constant and impelling urge within man to find the magnificent life. This inner urge colors his emotions and his every experience. It causes him to search far and wide for the good, the beautiful, the opulent, the creative and inspiring forces of life. The philosophy of the magnificent life is one admirably adapted to the crying needs of this age of materiality. On all sides war, confusion, chaos, and destruction greet man. The future of civilization hangs precariously in the balance. Nations are tottering on the brink of disaster. Atom bombs threaten to obliterate all that man has achieved. It is in such bleak times that the soul of man cries loudest in the Stygian darkness. Then that the inner promptings cause man to look to the spiritual dawning for the light that announces the new age. It is then that the magnificence inherent in man rises to meet the challenge of obliteration. Then that he is prompted by the divinity within to find new hope and courage, to tackle anew the problems which engulf him, and to leave for posterity another brilliant page of achievement in his historic rise from the dismal miasmic swamps of life. This book traces the spectacular ascent of man's struggling soul to find the light. It is particularly fitting that man's final epitaph should be termed magnificent, for in his rise upward from the primordial forces that have always threatened him with extinction, there is something of greatness in his deeds, and something exalted in his aspirations. His climb has been marked by splendid achievements, and he has lavished upon the elements of which his life consists the prodigal talents which he has wrested from the womb of time itself. There is a breathtaking splendor about man's remarkable feats, his audacious disregard of danger, his sublime comprehension of the divinity within, his brilliant flights into fantasy, his munificence of creation, his stateliness of being, and the majestic beauty with which he has chosen to clothe civilization. These temples to man's magnificence, which are represented by his palaces, bridges, inventions, and industry, rival the exalted glories of ancient Rome. His systems of philosophical thought, his creation of iridescent beauty, his splendid endowments to human knowledge in the arts and sciences, give man a right to claim the heritage which God has entrusted to him. This book but attempts in an humble manner to attest to this inherent magnificence in man, not to gild the lily, but to refresh the memory, when the stigma of man's intolerance, hatred and barbarism rear their ugly, blood-stained heads. It attempts to chart the course which man has set to find his ultimate destiny and to choose the bright stars by which he may guide his frail bark on the cosmic sea, on his journey into the unknown. Those ever-present stars of beauty, peace, hope, and joy, set in the diadem of a resplendent civilization, dimmed occasionally, yes, by man's unfortunate temporary folly, but only dimmed momentarily, for the full effulgence which blossoms in man's soul reflects the eternal radiance of the living God, whose ultimate purpose man fulfills when he discovers the magnificent life. Norvell, New York City, 1946 Chapter 1. Make Your Life Magnificent Life is a magnificent adventure. In this transitory earthly existence which is man's life drama, there have been given to him all the elements with which he may make of his life a resplendent and glorious pageant. All the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exit and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts. So too your life is a play, and it should have in it all the elements that go to make up a well-rounded drama. There should be characters, purpose and plot, suspense and uncertainty, romance and beauty, some tears, but also much happiness. All lives reflect these elements of a great drama, but your individual life is much more extensive than that offered on the limited confines of a stage. Beyond the proscenium arch of your earthly stage is the master stage director, the creator, giving you the cues, arranging the scenes, and directing the cast of characters which make up your personal drama. And what is the title of this play in which you are the star? Is it the life magnificent or the dismal life? Are the characters peopling your life play idealistic, beautiful, charming, and loving? Or have you filled this play with cheap melodrama, tawdry situations, common and vulgar characters? You and you alone may determine what shall take place in this drama of your life. You are also the playwright, devising the plot, 
writing the dialogue, and choosing the setting. Man is not a victim of circumstances, as many think. He can choose the events that make up his destiny. You have it within your power to fill your consciousness with any emotion, thought, or experience that you consciously choose. You can elevate your mind to the lofty mountain peaks of life, or you have the power to allow it to stagnate in the lowly shadow-filled swamps. The choice remains with you as to which type of life you are to choose. If you are one of that myriad throng who feel the transcendental urge of some inner power inspiring you to rise triumphantly over life's limitations, if you feel the soul urge of love trying to express itself in your thoughts, words, and acts, if you experience a flaming universality within your heart for all humanity, you are being prompted by the divine force within you to a finding of the magnificent life. These subtle soul promptings are trying to lead you onward towards the spiritual light. Since prehistoric times, Man has felt this divine intelligence, which caused him to leave the dark caves of his lowly animalism. It was this divine spark which first caused man to see in the trees and stones of earth the material with which to build homes and experience the more abundant life. When man began to obey these subtle impulses to harness the forces of the universe, he subdued the earth and had dominion over the land, sea, and air. It was then that man experienced the full flowering of divinity. He then discovered the magnificent life, a life compounded of tenderness and love, beauty and sacrifice, loyalty and courage, joy and tranquility, purposefulness and endeavor. In this upward struggle from the primordial ooze of life, man has often become confused and discouraged. Many times he has strayed from the divine promptings within. He has become entangled with the tools from which he forged his own salvation, his industry has become perverted into an enslaving, mechanistic force, which destroys him. His purposefulness often becomes a monstrous materialistic intent, which swallows the beauty and tenderness it was trying to create. His creation of palaces and bridges, airplanes and television, guns and bombs, at times dimmed the splendor of his divine origin, and temporarily threw it into oblivion. This decline into limbo has always been temporary, however, for always this resplendent force, the magnificence inherent in man asserts itself and reveals its permanence in human experience. Man is still trying to find the great experience, the perfect adventure, the purpose of living. This search is bound up in all his thoughts, emotions, and acts. He is still trying to pierce the mystic veil of the future, to fathom the secrets of the universe. And this inspiration, this ever-recurring dynamic force, leads him to more and more idealistic concepts of life. There is a magnificence and opulence about life. It often lies undetected and awaits your joyous discovery in the very environment in which you exist. If your perspective is unlimited, if your mind is attuned to the fine inner promptings of the soul, you suddenly see with vision other than the physical eye, the broader vistas of life, and create the type of life you seek with whatever situations you find at hand. What then is this magnificent life for which man eternally searches? How may you find it? Is it a mystical experience alone, revealing its wonders only to the eyes of the few initiates? No true comprehension of life and its ultimate meaning can exist until we investigate all phases of human experience. Man is not a unicellular organism, made up only of body, nor is he merely mind without body or soul. Man is, rather, a triplicity of mind, body, and soul. These three entities, separate yet still united, furnish man with external experiences, emotional responses, and inner promptings of divinity, which must all be encompassed and fully comprehended if man is to live a balanced and harmonious life. This trinity of experience reveals itself in the natural course of existence, if we are but aware of it. It comes upon us in various forms, in isolated fragments, from strange experiences and sequestered incidents. Most of us expect the magnificent life to exist in one outstanding experience. Does it? It cannot, it must not. That one single experience in which we expect to find completion may be distorted and may not fit into the ultimate pattern of your existence. It may be wrong, it may be limited, and lack elements which make it complete. Do not expect then to find this transcendent and sublime experience in one single situation or you may be doomed to bitter disappointment. In searching for this magnificent life, 
Know that there is no one single outstanding experience furnished by your marriage, family, friends, business associates, fame or fortune, which is the one outstanding experience for which you search. They are only contributing causes to the final effect which you are trying to create in your life. Your life experience must go further than the solitary, isolated incident if you are to enjoy the fruits of your labor and find the destiny for which you were created. Pope aptly expresses it when he says, All are but parts of one stupendous whole, whose body nature is, and God the soul. So too, you are a part of the stupendous life experience, and each incident is another facet in the universal diamond. You may be doomed to bitter disappointment if you think you are unhappy because of the lack of some one thing in your life. You may feel that you are miserable because you do not possess beauty of face or body, financial security, love, happiness, or social prominence. These may become the causes which threaten to unseat your reason and bring disquietude to your soul. You may become temporarily unhappy because of those universal cataclysms of depression, chaos and war, which often threaten the very existence of civilization itself. But when you learn that no one situation, person or experience has the key to your ultimate destiny, you will turn to the infinite intelligence within and find there the comfort, security, peace and happiness which you seek. Then there is the group of misfits in life who expect to find the ultimate in the building of fame or fortune. Many would barter their souls for a crown, forgetting that too often a crown bears heavily on the brow and brings no peace of mind. Those who have built earthly fame and glory find that it too is a fleeting experience and cannot survive the eroding effects of time. The sacrifice in health, privacy and peace is often too great a price to pay for such illusory and perishable glory. It is a good sign to have a normal interest in achieving success. Success cannot always be measured in terms of money and fame. The man or woman who lives in comparative obscurity may be just as much of a success and just as happy or happier than the big business success. Many times the so-called failures of life are but following the natural bent of their inner natures and seeking that expression of their talents which fulfills their ambitions perfectly. The measure of success then, that can be the magnificent life, is that degree of happiness a man finds in his work and his usefulness to the world. The magnificent life is something that you must create with the materials you now have at hand. What these materials are and how you may use them to fashion from the invisible stuff of life, the beauty, love, peace, joy and happiness you desire, we will now explore. Man creates his destiny through the power of his mind. His mind interprets external experiences through his feelings or emotions. External forces exert a very powerful influence over man, but internal emotional experiences are undoubtedly greater in shaping the magnificent life. As man is a creature of feelings, and as feelings are translated into words and acts, his external life must inevitably reflect these inner states of consciousness. Man's entire reflex action is inevitably motivated by these inner urges, promptings, and even conflicts. If these inner compulsions are base and lowly, then they must externalize themselves in conduct which is base and lowly. If they are high and noble, then they too must reflect in man's actions and shape his environment. These emotional states or feelings that motivate and condition man are vital. We shall now study these inner drives and see their effect on man's destiny. 1. The sensual feelings in man. Because man is a physical being, science places him in the same classification as an animal. It is true that man possesses animal functions, physical appetites, and even tendencies to lustful living. Is man compounded of these physical appetites and passions alone? They are the sensual feelings in man, and they are transmitted through his five senses. These sensual feelings determine his physical reactions and his relationship to the world in general. Base sensuality exists only when man corrupts the finer instincts and perverts his natural physical functions. Man must eat and drink, propagate and raise his young, but these animal acts or functions need not degenerate into animalistic acts of gluttony and lustful sensation alone. They may be made rich experiences which contribute much to happy, balanced living. Through the sensual feelings man may know love and tenderness for his mate. 
This elevates the sensual animal passions to the highest and most sacred province of human experience in which love is kindled in the human heart. This creative force of love, when elevated to the social spheres, becomes universal in scope and welds all humanity into one great brotherhood of love. As love develops in the human consciousness, man begins to become aware of the divinity within. It is then that intelligence truly awakens and gives rise to. 2. The Intellectual Feelings in Man When reason begins, animalism ceases to exist. Man then branches off from the limited physical functions of the animal and adds a mental dimension to living. His experiences in the external world are then interpreted by his mind. His relationship with the world is investigated and understood. He advances in the arts and literature. Invention and industry become more complex. Ambition is awakened and leads first to the creation of necessities, then broadens into the development of comforts and luxuries. With these advances in intellection comes a new and keener appreciation of life. Knowledge increases and man uses for the first time the various forces which he formerly only tentatively explored. Finally, man's cultural growth is assured, his moral and ethical self awakens, and he assumes the responsibilities of the new world which his intellect has created. Then, too, come the philosophical concepts of life, the speculative theories, conquest of languages, interchange of conversation, and all those intellectual pursuits which give added richness and deeper significance to human experience. From this intellectual experience, man evolves higher and higher in the universal scheme. There is a greater refinement of manners and methods, a spiritualization of sensations and emotions, an elimination of bestiality, and a greater desire for peace and contentment. It is then that man attains the highest apex of creative thinking. The workings of the conscious, subconscious, and superconscious minds are correlated, and the intellectual products of great minds are released to the world. Then are born the powers of such giant intellects as Galileo, Socrates, Shakespeare, Michelangelo, Milton, Newton, Einstein, Beethoven, Lincoln, Freud, Madame Curie, and others who have left humanity richer because of their intellectual outpourings. Through such intellectual processes, civilization is given added impetus, a spiritually progressive evolutionary force is set into motion, which is capable of changing the entire face of the universe. The purpose of our mortal existence is intimately bound up with this dynamic intellectual force which we release to the world. Happiness is always in direct proportion to the intellectual value of each to the universe. This does not imply that those who are not intellectual cannot be happy, but if they expand to their fullest capacity and contribute the products of their intellects, no matter how seemingly limited, they attain benefits which are commensurate with their usefulness to the world. As man's mental evolution logically continues upward in the intellectual realm, we find that pure cold intellect, scientific logic, processes of reason and rationalization alone do not give to life that sublime magnificence which is the purpose of living. Intellect is but the inner force which fans the spark of life into a roaring flame and which combusts in the human heart and consciousness as our next upward step, the growth of. 3. The Sentimental Feelings in Man Sentiment is purely a mental attitude, thought or judgment permeated or prompted by feeling. It is an emotional experience of tender susceptibilities. When our feelings or emotions are refined, they can be said to enter the realm of sentiment. Sentiment melts the heart, and creates between human beings that fine feeling, which makes of even ordinary experiences magnificent adventures. It colors existence with beauty, gives purpose and meaning to life's various events. Persons who do not respond to affection or who have no sentiment are emotionally dead. They are unappreciative of the finer emotions and see in life none of the delicate shades of meaning which are revealed to those in whom sentiment flowers. The average harsh and realistic concept of life leads to a killing of the natural sentiment which tries to express itself in the human heart. When sentimental feelings are lacking, there is a brusqueness in human conduct which often shatters the sensitive, sentimental soul. Refinement of manners and responsiveness to others is indicative of the evolving of sentiment in the human soul. 
Do not be ashamed to show your feelings when they are sentimental and beautiful. Let tender sentiments be aroused often, and let them carry you onto exalted and beautiful realms. Let music inspire in your soul a new awareness and a sense of joy. The beauty within you is crying aloud for recognition and wishes to be released to the world. Sentimental expression will cause you to color your words and acts with iridescence and splendor, which cannot help but beautify all you touch, and which will alleviate the suffering and sordidness of the world. It will help to inspire beautiful dreams in those who are hopelessly lost in the quagmire of life. As man progresses in this evolutionary upward path, he begins to be more and more aware of his environment, his body and his intellect. He develops an upward soul surging which is capable of sweeping him onto the Elysian Heights. Under this compelling drive of emotions, man begins to see beauty in all things. It is then that man's struggling soul breaks through its restraining physical bonds and bursts forth in all the flaming incandescence of divinity. Then it is that this blossoming sentiment of the human soul gives rise to. 4. The Aesthetic Feelings in Man The aesthetic feelings add richness and joy to an otherwise drab and ugly existence. The aesthetic feelings may be developed by man, and with them he may mold or create from the materials at hand the beauty and joy which he seeks. The aesthetic feelings express themselves in the quality of your environment, is it ugly and barren? If so, it will offend and stifle this newly awakened consciousness within your soul. The environment must be changed to conform to your inner vision and to appeal to your evolved senses. You will not be able to tolerate ugliness in your environment when these feelings of beauty and tenderness are fully aroused in your soul. The means for deliverance from squalor and barrenness exist within your own mind. You need not live in any atmosphere that is ugly, and which reflects dismal poverty. You may beautify your environment with the labor of your own hands. Many have woven rugs of bright colored rags to cover barren floors, clipped pictures from magazines to adorn humble walls, and fashioned gay drapes from the flimsiest of materials to bedeck the windows that might look out on the ugly evidences of man's unfortunate poverty. There is no premium on cleanliness and orderliness other than a willingness to spend a little time in such pursuits. The sole need for outer radiance expresses itself in the desire to adorn the temple of the living God in beauty also. The clothing then, selected with care and concern for color, regardless of the inability to purchase expensive clothing, is a vital concern in developing the aesthetic feelings. Inexpensive clothing can be imbued with an aristocracy of soul, a dignity of bearing and a radiant acquiescence, which weaves into their fabric a gentility and beauty that gives them new value. The aesthetic feelings of man truly soar to unlimited spheres when man applies them to the human relationships of life. They express themselves in courtesy, kindness, consideration, and the positive encouraging words of beauty, which kindle inspiration in the souls of others. Man attains new dignity, approaching that of divinity itself, when he can rise to lofty heights the feelings and emotions of others, when he can inspire others with high ideals, humanitarian principles, and brotherly love. No more noble purpose can be discovered in living than to bring the aesthetic feelings into such universal or cosmic relationship. As we deal with the aesthetic feelings in man, we become more and more concerned with man's conduct toward one another. We begin to search for purpose and intent, to guard against those human and subhuman tendencies of the unevolved soul. It is then that we find the awakening of 5. The Ethical Feelings in Man the study of ethics is principally concerned with morality. It is the science of the ideal human character. It consists in not only seeking to explore right methods of conduct towards others, but in creating for others a state of happiness and completion. Everything that tends toward that goal is ethical. On the other hand, that which tends to degrade, abuse, pervert, or destroy the ideals, dreams, or morals of others becomes unethical. That which injures others destroys you also. The ethical conduct then is on a very high plane. It gives unselfishly of its fruits to rich or poor. Inevitably, good moral conduct brings its own rewards, whereas conversely bad moral conduct produces sterility of the soul and engenders human misery. 
To lie, cheat, and betray others is unethical. This type of conduct is a cause that must produce a like effect. It is a fundamental truth that we attract that which we give out. Do unto others as you would have others do unto you is not only a maxim, which is true, but becomes a universal law, which cannot be violated without serious consequences. When man becomes conscious of these spiritual laws and judges his conduct by these universal rules, he awakens within himself a new consciousness which leads to. 6. The Spiritual Feelings in Man Since time immemorial man has asked, Why do I exist? Where am I going? From whence do I issue? These are intangibles, which cannot be answered simply through a casual physical or material explanation. Such problems correctly repose in the invisible or spiritual realms of life. Man exists only because he is aware. He says, I think, therefore I am. New consciousness awakens as his thinking is elevated. He thinks further, I am what? And some deep inner voice answers, I am divine. This deep-seated conviction then becomes a state of awareness, a new consciousness. It is true because man is aware of it. For him it is a simple, indisputable fact, which requires no scientific explanation or proof. His belief is based on blind faith. His thinking is thus broadened to include a creator, a god from whom he came, and in whose image man is created. As Voltaire once said, even if there were no god, it would have been necessary for man to have invented him. The human need for recognizing a supreme power, a creative intelligence, is so great that unerringly even primitive minds create their own idea of a god which they may worship. This deep instinctive awareness of some great creative force is so unmistakably a part of human experience that it cannot be ignored by intelligent men and women. Spiritual feelings more definitely crystallize through man's tender emotions. Love generates a new awareness in man. Love is the ultimate spiritual expression of the human race. It is the creative function of life and is symbolical of the generous love poured out by the Creator when He formed the universe for His children. Thus, it is that all through life, woven in the warp and woof of destiny, is the golden thread of love. There are many different types of love. Love of man for woman, love of family, love of friends, love of community, love of country, and finally, as the human ego evolves higher and higher, cosmic or universal love. Love of self is only the animal expression of love. When self-love is submerged in that final self-abnegation of love for others, the selfish individual ultimately merges with the great cosmic stream of radiant love which envelopes the universe and which issues from the divine creative fount. It is then that the true spiritual feelings awaken in man. To fully awaken these spiritual feelings then, concentrate occasionally on the great mystery of your life. Get away from the maddening throng. Stop feeling that your life revolves entirely around people and their physical and material problems. Enter the inner citadel of the soul and there discover the infinite riches of spiritual wisdom. An amazing revelation awaits you in this inner chamber of the mind. Intuition will proclaim newer and greater mysteries of life. Astounding vistas open, which too often lie undiscovered on the threshold of your conscious mind, unobserved and undetected by your five senses. There too in that cathedral of the soul, the deep responsive, sympathetic spiritual cord which ties you to your Creator, pulsates with new emotion and brings you a revitalizing, refreshing stream of life energy which gives you new purpose and makes of life a truly magnificent adventure. Chapter 2 Keys to Your Inner Kingdom The magnificent life is truly revealed in man's inner spiritual self. There in that hidden inner kingdom, he may find the power, the beauty and peace that he seeks. There he may experience the ecstasy reserved for those who become tuned to the divine force that reflects in all men. We are told, It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, and, behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Mystics and sages since time immemorial have spoken of this inner kingdom. To find it in this day and age of commerciality requires certain keys, for it is only by unlocking certain doors with these spiritual keys 
that man may truly find the comfort, peace, and security of this mystical realm, which is his inner kingdom. The first key is harmony. There is order and harmony in all the universe. When your mind is clouded with chaos and confusion, it is impossible for the inner kingdom to be revealed. God speaks to man in that still small voice within which can only be heard when the conscious clamor is stilled. When there is order and harmony within your own mind, this inner voice may guide you. It knows your right work, the environment you should reside in, the health you should have, the love you desire, the friends you require for happiness. This inner intelligence is trying to speak to you, to lead you into that inner kingdom where new worlds will be revealed. To find this harmony and order then, it is essential to still your own confused mind, to retire from life and people occasionally, and reflect on the purpose of life. A. Do not live for the world entirely. There are times when it is essential that you find completion within the self. You are an isolated entity in life, tied only to the God who gave you birth. You must learn to enrich your inner self so that solitude is not a curse. There are times when you may have to be alone, and if your soul is not stilled, if you have not learned to rely on your own inner resources, you will suffer loneliness and unhappiness. B. Retire into the self occasionally with your thoughts, books, music, or some creative gift. You will find then that new and more glorious riches will be revealed to your inner spiritual eye. When you retire into this inner kingdom, do not let any person or disturbing, negative thought enter with you. Close the door to the outer world and put yourself in tune with the music of the spheres. C. Radiate harmony to all you meet in your everyday contacts. If you wish to live in harmony, it is essential that you radiate harmony in your relationships with people in your home. Try to create harmonious relations, even if it is necessary to withdraw in seeming defeat. You will be the victor in the long run, for control of self is the most important essential in attaining harmony. In your business environment, try practicing harmony and order. Meet others with a smile and let your entire attitude be one of good cheer and happiness. It will soon pay big dividends and will have the added advantage of increasing your energy threefold. The second key is kindness. Kindness is a potent spiritual force. It unlocks many doors and releases to the world a dynamic form of energy which is irresistible. Show this kindness to those around you first, and no matter how negatively they may react at first, continue to give out kindness and bless them with your thoughts. Soon there will be an amazing change in their attitude toward you. Kindness heals the minds and bodies of others. The world gives you back the type of treatment you give it. People are sensitive, even though they may appear harsh and cruel on the surface. Everyone wants to be treated with consideration. Fear causes most people to be cruel. They fear that others are apt to take advantage of them. If you completely disarm them with kindness, you will remove one of the principal barriers to happy relations with others. Through kindness, you unlock the power within your inner kingdom. It flows in a radiant stream to others. You are doubly enriched, for you help the world, and in turn, the world helps you. The third key is joyous acquiescence. When we are in conflict with ourselves or our environment, the beauty and peace of the inner kingdom is completely shattered. There are certain restrictions in life which are inevitable. Times when tragedy strikes, when unhappiness threatens, when poverty seems imminent. To meet such situations with terror, worry, or resentment blocks the divine intelligence within and shuts the gate of your prison house, making you a lifelong prisoner to hopelessness and despair. To acquiesce means to tacitly consent or to accept the inevitable without undue agony of mind or struggle. To joyously acquiesce means to submit quietly and peacefully to that which is inevitable. This is not passive resistance, for all resistance is removed from the consciousness. We do all we can to help a situation improve itself. But if we find ourselves inundated by a negative condition, we withdraw into our inner kingdom and say, Father, thy will be done. The fourth key is peace of mind. 
Mind is an unruly force when it is not controlled. Your conscious mind is an instrument of torture if you allow it to wander aimlessly uphill and down. The mind must be made to heal like an obedient dog, as the ancient master said. You must tell your mind what to think and what not to think. When it starts thinking of personal strife or external wars, chaos and depression, fear and hate, worry and limitation, pull it back to the positive peaceful thoughts that you wish it to entertain. The best method for attaining this peace or inner tranquil state of mind is to pick up a book and let your mind dwell on its message, or to turn on the radio and become interested in a program of beautiful music. Many times sitting down and writing out in detail the things that are worrying you will help dissipate them and establish the peace which has been temporarily shattered. To attain peace, it is vital that you control others instead of letting them control you. People must not be permitted to bring their problems, their negativity, their confusion, commonness, and vulgarity into your circle. When this is permitted, your peace of mind will desert you. Control people with firmness, for when they are unevolved, their basic animal natures are predominant, and they lack consideration and spirituality. Do not let them put their clouds in your sky, for often they are jealous of your happiness, and they have a selfish desire to destroy it. The fifth key is creative power. Nothing will open doors to your inner kingdom so readily as this one great key. You were born to create, not children alone, but beauty for the world. To each has been given a gift. To find that creative gift is the entire purpose of life. To fully unlock this creative power within yourself, it is vital that you be inspired. Inspiration can be mental, physical, or spiritual. If you are creating on the physical plane alone, your creative gifts will be limited. If you are creating on the mental plane, in the realm of ideas, literature, art, music, speech, etc., your powers will be more expansive. If you are creating mentally for the benefit of others, you will unlock greater power, for unselfish purpose lends itself to greater energy and creative inspiration than selfishness. If your creative power is released on the spiritual plane, your gifts will flourish and radiate to the entire world. This spiritual plane is the cosmic adjustment which man must make to the universe before he is fully attuned to the highest form of intelligence that exists. When we create on the spiritual plane, we lose sight of the personal element. We create for the sheer love of creating beauty for the entire world. We then work to create for the race, to better and improve social conditions to eliminate war, to make the world a better place in which to live, to evolve philosophies and codes of ethics which lead to the elevation of the standards of all peoples, regardless of race, color, or creed. The sixth key is visualization. This key to the inner kingdom is a vital one. Visualization reveals new dimensions to life, new horizons to explore, new experiences to share. It was inner vision which caused what to see in steam the power to turn motors. It was visualization which caused Franklin to harness the lightning bolt. Inner vision produced Edison's electric light bulb, Marconi's wireless, Bell's telephone, Whitney's cotton gin. We are indebted to some man's visualizing for radio and television, sulfur, drugs and penicillin, the airplane and trains. Turn to your inner kingdom and seek the answer to life's baffling problems. Ask advice and guidance. Seek new inventions, musical compositions, stories, industrial improvements, financial security. When you turn to this inner kingdom and let the divine intelligence flow through you, you become an unobstructed channel for all the ideas that have ever been conceived by the mind of man and a repository for new ideas, new forms and patterns, still unborn in the womb of time. Emerson has spoken of this universal mind. There is one mind common to all individual men. Every man is an inlet to the same, and to all to the same. He that is once admitted to the right of reason is made a freeman of the whole estate. What Plato has thought he may think, what a saint has felt he may feel, what at any time has befallen any man he can understand. Who hath access to this universal mind is a party to all that is or can be done for this is the only and sovereign agent. 
The seventh key is wisdom. The greater the capacity of your brain, the greater will be the accumulated knowledge you store in your brain cells. As knowledge increases, wisdom grows. New and amazing doors are opened by an expanded consciousness. New values evolve as our comprehension of the phenomena of life grows. We become citizens of the universe as we probe and investigate all things. Wisdom comes through knowledge we absorb from several sources. 1. Through studying the self. The mystery of all life is bound up in the atoms and cells composing your own brain and body. The ocean is reflected in a drop of water, the universe in an atom. Begin then to study self, to know actions and reactions, to apply philosophy to a better understanding of the invisible causes back of the visible effects of life. 2. Wisdom grows by studying others. We live in a world composed of people. We share a universal experience, a consciousness that reflects the divine, unless we know people, their requirements, their limitations, their dreams and aspirations, we cannot hope to fulfill our obligation to them, nor can we hope to attract the best from them. A study of philosophy, psychology, biology, physiology, evolution, economics, history and science is essential to give us a complete picture of the origin and evolvement of the entire human race. 3. Wisdom is acquired by studying laws of nature. There are many invisible laws back of all visible phenomena. The law of gravity, the law of growth, the causative law, and the law of cycles, these are only a few of the immutable and fixed laws which govern man and determine his conduct. Wisdom is a sum total of knowledge, and as knowledge is constantly expanding, we never really attain the ultimate in wisdom. When this human experience and physical body and material realm is ended, the body undergoes a change and is transmuted to another form of energy. The mind and soul too undergo a similar change and prepare for a journey into the beyond. To the accumulation of knowledge then it is desirable that man at his speculative theories as to soul migration, life on the invisible planes, and the possibility of an actual conscious existence beyond this mortal plane. As we speculate more and more, theories multiply, until finally, speculation solidifies into fact and fact bears the name of organized knowledge, then we reach the realm of science, that field in which theories are proved. The fact that man has not attained that realm of intelligence yet, wherein he may scientifically prove soul survival or belief in a god, is no evidence that he cannot so attain it. Mind grows through usage, and we are only now on the threshold of astounding new developments in science which may reveal the very mystery of life itself. The eighth key is faith. Faith sustains man when ail else fails him. It is only through faith that God is revealed. Faith in yourself, your future destiny, your God, these are essential requisites for unlocking the mystical doors to your inner kingdom. There comes a time in life when man can go no further in his physical and material quest for the answer to the mystery of life. Matter is dense and seemingly incapable of interpenetration, but we know that this is only an illusion to the physical eye. With the spiritual eye, man may penetrate to the core of the earth, he may reach out into space and explore the moon, he may divine mysteries beyond this earth, faith is the key that unlocks the door to the eternal miracle power of the living God. As man has more and more faith in this supreme power which penetrates the interstices of the solid universe, he sees therein an ebb and flow of perpetual power and superior intelligence. His faith makes it apparent that this supreme intelligence exists. Visible proof exists in growing things, the change of the seasons, the gravity pull of the planets, the beat of the heart, the circulation of the blood. These are physical and visible evidences of a power, an intelligence beyond anything man can conceive or explain. He does not stop doubting that these miracles exist, merely because he cannot see the agency which produces them. To him who has faith is revealed the invisible mystery beyond the visible domain, the unseen light beyond the known spectrum, the divine melodies unheard by the physical ear, the dazzling sights unseen by human eyes. The world operates under divine law. This divine law is accepted by faith, because to do otherwise would be to violate the intelligence inherent in man and in nature. Dr. Carlos Musser, in Ewer, 
aptly expresses it. Because of the law of gravitation, the apple falls to the ground. Because to the law of the growth, the acorn becomes a mighty oak. Because of the law of causation, a man is as his thinketh in high hearth. Nothing can happen without its adequate cause. The ninth key is courage. It took courage for man to conquer the earth, to rise above the limits of his cave and seek the light of day, to master the forces of the sea and find new lands, to subdue the gravity pull of the earth and fly through space. Courage is the most potent key which man possesses to unlock the invisible doors to his inner kingdom. Courage can be created first by having confidence in yourself, by believing and knowing that you are a child of God and that nothing can harm you. Second, by doing those things which you are confident you can do well and then graduating to more difficult tasks until your ability is assured. You must develop courage to meet life with its ever-changing experiences and scenes. Courage to tackle new ventures. Courage to try new ideas. Courage to get out of the rut that is claiming you. Courage to dare follow your own ideals and dreams. Courage to rise again after you have been beaten down by life. The tenth key is love. And the greatest of these is love. We might easily make love the dominant law of our inner kingdom. Love is the embodiment of all the spiritual virtues. It represents the divine principle in action in the entire visible universe. Love transforms first the inner self and then the outer self. The personality must inevitably reflect the emotion of love. Love implies more than mere physical love. Mental love extends to friends and acquaintances. Spiritual love embraces the entire world. Love of God gives additional power and elevates the consciousness to the highest realm which man is capable of attaining. Love is the divine or creative intelligence released into the world by God. Man operates under this perfect law. When it is violated, all the debasing, animalistic emotions are released, which produce sin and sickness, war and suffering. Love is the perfect healing agent, healing mind and body. When love is suppressed or perverted into mere lustful channels, it often leads to mental and physical breakdowns. The creative expression of love on the highest mental and spiritual planes is essential to happy, balanced living. Love, when it is on the unselfish plane, is the complete purification of the self. It gives strength and courage, ennobles the human heart, and helps elevate the race consciousness. When love radiates in the human heart as a race consciousness principle, it is creative and constructive. When it exists on the self-plane, it is often used for self-aggrandizement and personal power. All forms of creative art thrive under the impetus of this divine afflatus. It stimulates, inspires, elevates, and spiritualizes all creative forms. Music, art, literature, singing, inventing, building, and even business success is given added impetus by this energy-building emotion. Keep the emotion of love on a high plane. Keep it unselfish and universal, rather than strictly personal. Keep it creative and recognize that it is a divine force, which is the life principle personified in man. It can be expressed as physical love or spiritual love. For perfect balance, all three expressions of love are normal and creative. As we grow older, love becomes less limited than it was in early youth and becomes personified in spiritual love rather than in its physical aspects. The eleventh key is prayer. No study of the keys to your inner kingdom would be complete without an analysis of the power of prayer. The power of prayer can literally move mountains. Science now determines that prayer is an actual force as powerful as terrestrial gravity, and that it can heal the sick, give hope to the weary, and furnish mankind with motivation for constructive good. How shall prayer be used? Should we call on God merely for help when we want something? That would indeed be a limited concept of the miracle power put at man's disposal by the generous and loving Creator. Man should call on God every day of his life not just for something, but in an expression of perpetual gratitude for the beneficence granted man through God's mercy. Prayer without faith is dead. If we pray, 
really believing that God is our supply, our health, and that all our needs will be met. We need never fear lack or limitation. Prayer should be invoked not as a corrective medium, but a preventive. All-embracing faith should cause us to know that God provides that which we need. More will be supplied if we prove ourselves worthy of His infinite mercy. If we are in actual need of aid, if we are sick or poor or unfortunate, we should pray for understanding of His fair and just universal laws, which will reveal to us the methods by which we may put ourselves in tune with His infinite intelligence. When we clear our consciousness of our own negative and limited thoughts, His power radiates through us, pervading every atom and cell, and brings health, happiness, and prosperity. Chapter 3 Attract Through Positive Mind Power We all possess mind power. The very fact that we have mental cognition, consciousness, recollection, reason, will, and other attributes of mind is proof that we possess mind power. But this intelligence often expresses itself in a wholly negative manner. Positive mind power is that force of mind which is free of all doubt or hesitation. It implies confidence in self and destiny. It lends a certain definiteness to one's thoughts and words and acts, which does not admit of doubt or denial. As mind power is energy, it may be assumed that mind is actually substance, although different from matter and invisible, it is another kind of matter. It issues from the brain in electrical radiations and is invisible, but nevertheless all-powerful. It is mind that gives shape and form to all things. It is mind that translates the light rays from the external world into forms and patterns, which defines and classifies these objects, and which in itself gives rise to innumerable pictures and creations that exist only in imagination. When man is able to use this mind power to think, to reason, to differentiate between right and wrong, to love and to worship, he is above the animal plane of consciousness. Mind power may be used in a positive or negative way. There is actually no such thing as a victim of circumstances. Man is not a mere puppet, depending on the interchange and play of internal and external emotions and propulsive forces. Man is, rather, a reasoning, thinking, and intelligent being, superior to all other forms of life on this earth. Man is not only above the animal plane, but he may rise even above the human plane and attain divine consciousness if he but chooses the events and emotions and thoughts which reflect divinity. Man may select his ideals, standards, ambitions, the dreams and beauty, the divinity which makes of him something finer and greater than any of the other animal creatures in this world. It might be said of man that he may have any destiny he chooses if he applies positive mind power. This power admits of no doubt, condition, qualification, or direction other than his own mental stimulus. Power used in a positive manner will inevitably attract to you those positive circumstances that are reflected in your mind. The mind may be likened to a magnet. A magnet either naturally or through electrical means may be given a power to attract to itself any object of a similar substance. Its molecules and atoms vibrate at a certain rate and it will attract to itself substances that vibrate at the same speed. So too your brain is like a powerful magnet, and it possesses within itself a subtle essence. This essence is mind power. It is invisible and cannot be imprisoned by the skull. It can and does radiate in space, and being a form of matter, can create its pictures or attract its counterpart in the visible world of matter. If you are using this invisible mind power negatively, you can create sickness, poverty, and general unhappiness. The mind forms a picture or pattern, which must manifest itself in the body. It vibrates the atoms and cells of the body so that the same pattern is produced that exists in the mind. If, however, you cause this mind power to vibrate in a positive manner, you fill your consciousness with thoughts of happiness, success, good health, and prosperity. You attract to yourself then the things that you have pictured in your mind. Like attracts like is a mental as well as a physical law. Invisible vibration determines your attraction power. Form a mental picture of what you wish to attract. Make yourself like a magnet, vibrating to a certain mental pattern. This mental essence then, vibrating out into space, will attract to itself or clothe itself in the very elements it needs to bring about a completion of the mental picture. 
As the vibratory pattern of a rose is different from that of a carrot, so too, the vibratory power of your brain image stamps in your life the picture you project through mind power. It will be success or failure, depending on whether your mind power is positive or negative. Thoughts create a personal thought atmosphere. This thought atmosphere actually makes itself felt in the outer world by others. If you are creating pictures in your mind that are beautiful, simple, and harmonious, clean cut, peaceful, loving, healthful, successful, friendly, and prosperous, the world will read into your face and form, words and acts, the positive mind power you are projecting. You alone determine what this thought atmosphere shall be that surrounds you like a perpetual aura. The person who fills his thought atmosphere with negative thoughts of sickness or failure shows these thoughts in visible physical form. He becomes slouch-shouldered and evasive-eyed. He is obvious by his shambling gait, stumbling words, incoherence, and general lack of order. This bodily attitude signifies the thought atmosphere of negativity. Change that thought atmosphere to a positive one, and there is an instant change. The head goes up, the chin juts out. The eyes sparkle with confidence. The breath is deeply inspired, and the diaphragm becomes tense and active. Every atom and cell of that person's body will vibrate with the thought atmosphere of positive thinking. That is positive mind power in action. Your body, your work, your life, your friends, your income, all signify your thought atmosphere. You become like a magnet, and you draw those forces to you. If you vibrate on a low, common, or vulgar plane, you'll find that everything around you will take on that kind of aura. You must work to create the thought atmosphere you wish to reflect in your life. What then is your thought atmosphere? Is it positive? Is it negative? High or low? If you build positive mind power, you can unlock those mystical doors to the new frontiers of a new life. This is a new age, a new power, a miracle working force which man is experiencing. The world today witnesses miracles that have never been performed in any past age or by any of the sages or prophets of old. Man is able to fly through the air, swim under the seas, heal the sick, save countless millions still unborn from premature death through his wonder-working drugs, and perform feats of greatness that are positive proof of his astounding mind power. Let us now investigate some of the things which man may attain through the projection of this positive mind power. 1. Attainment of Success To bring positive mind power to bear on the attainment of success in life, make it a point to think, talk, write, and dwell constantly on success thoughts. If you wish to color your thought atmosphere with success, it is vital that you spend a good deal of time in thinking and planning success. The person who thinks success and imbues his consciousness with ideas of prosperity generally plans the very things that produce for him the attainment he imagines. If, however, you think, talk, and act with a negative mental atmosphere of failure, you will inevitably color your entire personality and environment with the results of that failure thinking. Rid your consciousness of such negative words, thoughts, and ideas as I cannot succeed. I'm afraid. I will fail. I just know I haven't the ability to do that job. Such negative expressions indelibly stamp themselves upon your face and body, show in your voice and posture, and cause you to develop complexes which inhibit your natural abilities. You have the right to expect the best from life, but you must know what it is you want from life first. You must know, with a positive knowledge, what your real value to the world is. Are you only worth $25 a week to your employer? If you had to hire someone for the services you perform, for the knowledge you possess, would you pay more? If you find upon honest self-analysis that you are not worth more, that your mind holds a negative concept of your value, then do something about it. Positive mind power means taking steps to correct the negativity that has been built into your consciousness. Perhaps you lack education. This is easily remedied if you take steps to enroll in a correspondence course or an evening high school so you may improve your mind and learn some specialized type of work that will make you worth more to the world. 2. Positive Mind Power in Relation to Health What is the mind power you are exerting to keep your body strong and healthy? 
The body reflects the thoughts you think. Modern science now teaches that body is actually dependent on mind for its perfect functioning. A mind that is filled with fear, worry, hate, anxiety, and other negative emotions creates a bodily chemistry which is destructive to good health. On the other hand, a positive mind filled with thoughts of happiness, success, and health creates the power and energy to keep the body healthy. This mind power radiates a neural force which communicates itself to the nerves and muscles, glands and organs. This electrical life force stimulates the gastric juices, helps the glands maintain normalcy, and assists the heart in its vital function. Any sudden shock of fear or a reaction to danger results in a rush of blood from the brain to the internal organs, causing the face to become pale, the breath to be shallow, and many times the pulse beat to double. Often such a sudden mental shock has been the cause of death. If the mind is in a state of self-induced shock constantly, with ever-recurring negative emotions, the body will gradually register such shocks in its organic structure, and finally show the effect in failure of vital organs, disease, or even death itself. When your mind is in its normal, confident, and happy state, radiating a positive mind power, the intelligence within every atom and cell of your body is permitted to express itself. The subconscious mind performs its functions of regulating the blood pressure and heartbeat, digestion, breathing, and circulation. If this force is interfered with by your conscious mind intruding its negative thoughts, fears, worries, jealousies, hates, and petty problems, this is intelligence within is impeded and cannot perform its perfect work. Its job is to keep your body healthy, and it will do so if the mind expresses a confident, positive mind power at all times. In the natural realm, we see this perfect expression of the divine mind power radiating through all living, growing things. The rose bush does not use its conscious power to question its destiny, to fear its future, to worry about where it came from or where it's going. It silently and joyously acquiesces with the divine intelligence which is its life force and radiates its perfume and beauty for the world to share and enjoy. Counter the negative force of your mind with positive mind power. Whenever someone tells you that you will be sick, have an accident, or be in financial difficulties, counter the suggestions instantly by saying or thinking the opposite. Positive Mind Power Suggestions I am healthy and strong. I will remain vital and energetic. Germs have no power over me. I keep my resistance high by being positive in mind power. I am under the loving protection of divine mind. Therefore, I cannot and will not have accidents. My body is insulated spiritually by positive mind power. I am able to overcome all tendencies to disaster. I inherit the bounties of the universe. Divine mind gives me universal abundance. I now claim my heritage. I am rich, and all my needs are met for all time. Those positive suggestions immediately release positive mind power to your body. This energy radiates to the universe and forms a powerful magnet which attracts the qualities and conditions of the things you affirm in mind. 3. Positive mind power applied to happiness. Happiness, too, is a condition of mind. When body is harmoniously tuned to mind and the health is good, happiness should follow as a natural effect. If your mind is busy creating a picture of the happiness you will have in the future, or visualizing the happiness you have had in the past, you are ignoring the infinite possibilities inherent in the present moment for supreme happiness. As happiness is a state of mind and depends on positive thinking, you will never be any happier than you are at this moment in your destiny. If your happiness is the type that depends on a fortune, a person, or a situation, then when you attain that fortune, person, or situation, you will still want other conditions upon which your happiness must depend. Happiness through imaginative power. Imagination is a stimulus to happiness. If we are capable of imagining a situation, we are capable of attaining that situation. The importance of imagination is clearly shown by man's evolutionary progress throughout the ages. As man began to imagine the uses to which he could put lumber and earth, grass and animal skins, the more skill he acquired in their use for shelter, clothing, and his other necessities. As man began to imagine raising structures 50 or 100 stories above the earth, so too his ability to accomplish the miracle developed. 
As imagination is a stimulating factor in the attainment of anything we desire, it can be used to produce human happiness. Spend more time in imagining the situations you desire for happiness and less time in imagining the unhappy and depressing situations. Mentally prepare for happiness and you will set the body and brain reflex mechanism for attaining it. Psychologists now find that the simple act of smiling depends first on the physical act and then the mental feeling or emotion of happiness follows. This process may be reversed so that you find something to be happy about mentally first and then the muscles of the face react in a smile. As your mind is imbued with these imaginary situations and acts, the nervous energy flows to your glands and nerves and muscles, causing an immediate positive reaction of happiness. In your minds I then see that party you are going to attend as being one of the happiest events of your life. Visualize that day at the office as being one that will present innumerable opportunities for happiness. Soon you will be so imbued with this spirit of happiness that you must inevitably radiate optimism and cheer. These qualities are infectious, and in response to your smiles and lightheartedness, others will vibrate with a sympathetic responsiveness, creating the situations that make for pleasantness in this way. You will attract through your positive mind power the happiness you desire. 4. Positive Mind Power Applied to the Attraction of Friends You will find in life that you attract the type of friends who possess qualities that are similar to your own. The old saying, Birds of a feather flock together is a very true one. Gamblers, drunkards, and dope addicts generally associate with others of their ilk. Seldom do you find them seeking out ministers, college professors, or intellectuals. They feel more comfortable with those who speak their language. So too, in attracting friends, one of the first rules should be to check your own mind, your likes and dislikes, good and bad qualities, to determine what your attraction quality will be. Are your standards of life high? If so, you will not be happy with people whose standards are low. You may meet many whose standards are lower than yours, but you would not care to have such persons for intimate friends. If you are not satisfied that you are attracting friends who have high standards, then examine again your own mind and see if you are prepared to attract more superior friends. If you wish to attract those who possess great intellectual capacity or those who are in important positions, you must prepare your own consciousness by acquiring intellectuality and elevating your mind to a comprehension of their place in life. As your standards in life change from low to mediocre or high, so too, you will find your evaluation of your friends changing. Many times the friendships of your early life become bitter disappointments in later years. You have progressed mentally, whereas your old friends may have stagnated mentally. You no longer feel comfortable in each other's presence. Determine the type of friends you wish to attract, and then religiously acquire the qualities, culture, intellect, knowledge, that accurately reflects the quality of their minds. Soon you will inevitably gravitate into their spheres, or they into yours. If you choose musicians as friends, study and know something of music, join musical clubs or choral groups. Seek out the choir members of your local church or any other musical organization. Here you will attract those friends who have interests similar to yours. You possess a common bond. Your chances of making lasting friendships among such people who vibrate in harmony to you and your interests is much greater than if you associate with a club or lodge made up entirely of people whose interests are totally dissimilar. Lodges, service clubs for businessmen, groups of lawyers, doctors, school teachers, writers' clubs and stamp collectors' groups, magicians and hunters, bricklayers and plumbers, organize into social units for the one common purpose of finding those souls who are harmonious to them and who have similar interests. That, then, is one of the first requisites of successful friendship. The second vital point is stated briefly in Emerson's words, LF you want a friend? Be a friend, you can only attract friends if you show friendly qualities. Holding yourself aloof, being cold and indifferent, giving out words of discouragement. These are negative approaches that will rapidly lose friends rather than attract them. A few other valuable points to remember. Flatter when you feel it sincerely. Recognize their weaknesses, but do not throw them up to them. Encourage your friends to develop their own virtues. 
Share their joys, hopes, and dreams. But do not attempt to evade their losses, fears, and perplexities. Friendship consists of giving more than you hope to receive. Examples of positive mind power overcoming obstacles. Woolworth began his chain of five and ten cent stores with a limited capital of only three hundred dollars. His first three stores failed. He applied positive mind power and started to build on the wreckage of his previous failures. About thirty years later, he was able to pay fourteen million dollars cash for the Woolworth building, then the highest in the world. If he had accepted defeat, and permitted negativity to rule his mind, it is doubtful if he could ever have amassed the vast fortune he did or to build a gigantic business organization that still survives. Sir Isaac Newton, who began life as a not overly brilliant student, had no awakening of this positive mind power in those early years. It is said of him that he was so absent-minded that he once boiled his watch for three minutes while watching the egg. He was always late in his classes and considered backward by his teacher. Yet this man, when positive mind power awakened to its fullest expression in early maturity, discovered the great gravitational law and brought further scientific comprehension of the law of action and reaction. Einstein was a backward child in his early years, and his parents had great difficulty in teaching him to speak. When positive mind power awakened, he became Einstein the great mathematician and discoverer of the theory of relativity. A story is told of Einstein in his early days. He gave the conductor on a streetcar a bill, and when the change was given him, Einstein argued that the amount was incorrect. After a lengthy discussion, it was found that the conductor was right and Einstein wrong. The conductor dismissed him with a muttered invective in this famous line, the trouble with you, bud, is that you don't know how to figure. When mind power is positive and radiant, even physical infirmities, sickness, deformity itself cannot keep its possessors down. History is replete with famous men and women who have applied this positive mind power to the overcoming of their physical limitations. Robert Louis Stevenson was confined to bed with an incurable ailment for years, and yet did some of his most magnificent and prolific writing in that period by sheer dominance of mind power. The noted example of Elizabeth Barrett Browning, one of the great writers of all time, and her astounding use of mind power in overcoming her physical limitations is too well known to dwell on lengthily here. To add to her imperishable fame was the crowning achievement of positive mind power in winning the love of Robert Browning, when he might have had his choice of any one of the beauties of that day. Then there is the outstanding example of the physically handicapped Steinmetz, the great inventor, who overcame all limitations of body and rose triumphantly on wings of positive mind power to achieve a most brilliant success. Colton says, Times of great calamity and confusion have ever been productive of the greatest minds. The purest ore is produced from the hottest furnaces, and the brightest thunderbolt is elicited from the darkest storm. So, too, the times of tribulation and discouragement may be the very moments needed to give you that extra soul power, which can stimulate you onto greater achievement. Turn your misfortune to good fortune by applying positive mind power. Never accept any situation as being final or ended. See only beginnings, never endings. The sun sets, but always it can be depended on to rise again. So too, the divine intelligence within you is constantly radiating new power, and this positive mind power can be depended on to carry you to the very pinnacles of success and happiness. Chapter 4. The Universal Law of Abundance There is an astounding opulence and fertility in nature. Man, being a part of the natural scheme of creation, inherits this power of fecundity. It is expressed in the material and physical world through the working of a universal law of abundance on all planes. This universal law is as fixed and definite as the law of gravity. It recognizes no barriers to its operation and pours out its gifts with a prodigality that must constantly amaze and delight us. This divinity manifesting itself through natural laws takes no chance on barrenness in its creation. It gives prolifically of its gifts, but under the law of reciprocity, it demands a free return of those gifts. The maple tree releases not one tiny seed to the fertile earth to assure its perpetuity, but rather hundreds and even thousands. 
This divine intelligence well knowing the natural barriers of rocks, weeds, and shade, which it must overcome to attain its beneficent outpouring of products for God's creatures, decrees that each of these myriad sparks of life shall grow wings and soar with the first wafted breeze to a patch of ground where it may burst forth in productive creativeness. This is intelligence knows that if the seeds fall too close to the mother tree, they are apt to he unborn in the shade of the parent and thus be wasted. So too with the apple seed, the citrus, and all other gifts of nature. They are abundantly created and given such amazing powers of fertility that there is ample assurance of the continuity of their kind. Shall it be said then, that divine mind would so generously endow plants, insects, and animals to assure their abundant living, and ignore man and his needs? Man is the most highly evolved of God's creatures. Ample provision has been made to not only assure man abundant living, but far greater riches are provided for him by this divine agency or intelligence. Man possesses within himself a multiplicity of gifts. This universal law of abundance, when harmoniously applied to his needs, furnishes man with a wide variety of bounties for his comfort and happiness. Mind is imbued with this same fertility that the earth and inanimate seed possesses. Body has its powers and rich variety of ennobling experiences. Soul, too, possesses an astounding array of qualities and tendencies, which, when fully matured, give to life a richness and beauty that dazzles man's comprehension. To operate under law is the opposite to chaos and confusion. Law means that which is laid down, set, or fixed immutably. It applies specifically to the relation of phenomena which is invariable under given conditions. When man operates under these universal laws then, he is certain to achieve the same results under a set of given conditions each time. This universal law of abundance fulfills the law of motion, action and reaction. It is the law of causation, the principle that every change in nature is produced by some cause. This law of causation is a universal principle and applies to man's thinking and living, as well as to the orderly and harmonious control of all created things. In this orderly procession of events and manifestation of natural phenomena, it would appear that man alone starves in the midst of plenty, is sick when health is the natural state, and is unhappy when happiness should be his only state of consciousness. This, in a measure, is due to man's highly evolved mind and body. He is given two minds, conscious and subconscious. He is a creature of choice rather than a victim of nature's cruel inevitability. He may take advantage of nature's generosity or shut himself off completely from this evident opulence. He may, through mental limitations or economic sanctions, greed, selfishness, miserliness, or simple unawareness, so restrict himself that millions starve or sick and go down to disaster and premature death because man has not yet recognized his divine prerogative. How, then, does man violate this universal law of abundance? 1. By ignorance of the laws of nature. When man looks to nature, he finds there crystallized the intelligence of God. He may study, dissect, and divine the intent and purpose of the Creator. He sees in nature a barren wasteland when he fails to prepare the soil, plant the seed, weed and cultivate the land, destroy the insects, and feed and water the plants when droughts occur, or when he has impoverished the soil through carelessness. We have stated that there is a reciprocity which exists in all created things. Man, being given intelligence to regulate and control and subdue this earth, must study and understand these phenomena which expresses itself in nature. If he takes all and gives nothing, the earth fails to yield her treasures. If he is profligate and wasteful during the years of plenty, and fails to recognize that need might arise during the lean years, nature cannot be said to fail in performing her work or fulfilling her share of the bargain. Man is in a divine partnership and is the custodian of the riches of the universe. If man puts a fence around sections of the earth and greedily refuses to let the world share in God's free bounties, nature's gifts will go to waste. Natural resources, crops, the combined productivity of the earth is for all to share and share equally. When man's failure to recognize this universal law expresses itself in greed and selfishness, a few fortunate or strong individuals with more native shrewdness or culpability than their fellow men 
draw lines about these priceless treasures of the universe and claim them for their own. This is ignorance of the laws of nature. Nature's gifts are plentiful, and shortages exist only when man distorts the picture by his selfish actions. Then thousands starve in China and India. Millions are undernourished and sickly, and nature's produce sinks back into the earth for want of intelligence to distribute it wisely. Then, too, man is careless with the gifts he does recognize and share with his fellow men. For profit he will be pressed into giving the world that which rightly belongs to all by universal law. But take away his profit and man's miserliness comes to the fore. The dog in the manger attitude shows itself. If he cannot obtain the prices he thinks he deserves, he will plow under the crops, kill off the animals, and pour milk into the drain rather than feed the hungry, as nature intended. This destructiveness is a violation of the universal law of abundance. Not only does it violate man's innate sense of justice and decency, but it is repellent to the divine intelligence. The gifts are then withheld, and man cries out against heaven because he is poverty-stricken. How may man overcome this ignorance of the laws of nature? In the same manner he would overcome any type of abysmal ignorance. Through planned methods of education. By extending our educational system into adulthood, to give man's brain cells a chance to continue growing and evolving, so he will better understand life and his requirements. Individually, man may overcome this ignorance of nature's laws by overcoming his own innate selfishness and greed, by realizing that what is good for him is good for the world, but that, conversely, that which injures him will injure the world. By knowing that he is only a custodian of this earth's treasures, and that he is doubly blessed if he can share those treasures with the world. By overcoming possessiveness and that desperate feeling that we must accumulate more of this earth's goods than we can use, the man who acquires millions will never rest content with those millions. His money gives him a sense of power, like alcohol, goes to the brain and numbs his comprehension. Nature intended for man to have plenty, and when man strives for attainment of his rightful heritage, there is no violation of this universal law of abundance. There is danger only when ignorance leads one to sacrifice integrity, honor, and justice, to illegally take from the world more than one may intelligently administer in this existence. 2. Lack of Imagination Man limits himself in this world of abundance by failing to be cognizant of his limitless possibilities. There is much that cannot be apprehended through the normal channels of the senses. When man adds the extended function of imagination to his other gifts, he begins to perceive creation still unborn. Imagination adds to the brain a new perspective, a fourth-dimensional power, which man alone possesses. Man may harness this power of imagination for good or for evil. When he produces radio, television, airplanes, and guns, they may be used for destructive purposes or for adding to the more abundant life. The choice is up to man. When, however, man restricts his progress by stifling this power of mind, he may live in the very midst of plenty and still starve. The caveman ate his meat raw because imaginative power had not yet awakened the culinary art in him. He lived in cold, damp caves because he had not perceived his creative ability and imagination. When imagination awakened, he found the skins of those animals he used for food could be converted into clothing and shelter. As man evolved higher and higher, and the imagination was more fully awakened, he could comprehend the mystery of forging tools from the earth's ore, cutting down trees for homes, weaving cloth for warmth, and communicating through the medium of an alphabet and words. Imagination then wrested nature's secret from the lightning bolt and harnessed it for man's use as electric light. It caused man to dream of motors, and the automobile and airplane were born. He visualized or imagined spanning continents with his thoughts, and wireless and radio were created. Indeed, it might be said that as man began to conceive, he could achieve. His spectacular rise to undreamed of heights is visible testimony to the inherent power in creative imagination. If, then, your gifts are few and your needs great, can you not perform this same miracle of transformation through your imagination? You can for power flows when the mind is concentrated on achievement. 
Ideas blossom in mind when they are subjected to the penetrating rays of your creative thought. To visualize is to see the things you actually imagine in your mind's eye. As you use the imagination more and more, you actually train your mind to see the possibilities of the things you conceive. The inner intelligence then begins to shape your destiny in accordance with your mental conception. What is that mental conception? Is it one of limited gifts or talent? You are only as limited as you make yourself by negative thoughts. If you wish to paint that great canvas, you have but to imagine it insistently and strongly. Add action to your daydream, however, for action begins to give shape and form to your imagery. It takes only as much imagination as is needed to get you to the nearest art store to secure the paint and brushes and canvas to start you on the goal to making your daydream come true. You wish to play the piano, and in imagination, you visualize yourself evoking melody and harmony from the instrument. It takes a little imagination to secure a piano. If your finances are limited, it does not take much imagination or figuring to reveal that the extra money spent for entertainment, reading cheap fiction, drinking, smoking, or other indulgences, could be diverted toward the down payment for that piano which you so ardently desire. The successive steps then toward becoming a musician are identical with those given for awakening your artistic talent. You will not play a note until the imagination is fired with purposefulness. Do you wish to become a truly great musician or merely to play for your own amusement and to entertain your friends? This is important for it too, flowers in imagination before it transmits its magic to the physical act of practicing and perfecting your technique. The higher the ambition, goal, or desire, the more active is your imagination. The motivating force which determines whether you shall be rich or poor, talented or ungifted, lies in the capacity of your imagination to soar high or low. Action follows the mental pattern, and soon there is manifested in your environment the persons, tools, and situations with which to forge what you have imagined. If you wish more possessions, material abundance, Increase in salary, a better job. First, stimulate your imagination. As your concentrated power awakens new brain cells and causes new patterns to be formed in your mind, you will inevitably take the necessary steps to produce exactly what you have conceived. 3. In gratitude for nature's free gifts. Man constantly bemoans the fact that the abundance of life is not his. What he really means is that the abundance of nature does not belong wholly to him and his family. He is misinformed if he believes that he actually does not possess the earth and all therein, no matter his personal state of finances or dearth of possessions. What man asks for when he cries out for more and more possessions is a piece of paper which gives him legal title to a piece of earth with a fence around it so none may share it or enjoy its beauty and the products of its creation. He desires a deed that gives him monopoly of some of nature's products. If he is lacking in that legal document, he feels that he is restricted from sharing in and enjoying the productivity of the earth. Is this true or merely a figment of man's imagination? Cannot one enjoy, no matter how lacking in money or legal titles, the beauty and freedom of a city park? It belongs to you and you alone. It is beautifully kept up, and you may browse in its lush verdure, enjoy the budding blooming trees, share it with millions of other souls. And when you are finished enjoying your private estate, you do not even have to turn a key in the lock. A caretaker, indeed many caretakers, keep it meticulously clean, plant and trim the hedges, and water the trees without bothering you for instructions. You could not enjoy a private estate more even if you owned it outright. Indeed, you might even be extremely lonely behind the barbed wire fence and the exclusiveness of personal ownership. Then too, with possessiveness goes the burden of possession. Upkeep, worry, fear of entry and robbery, burdensome taxation, salaries of employees, and eternal vigilance against intruders on your privacy. You wish an estate, a home of your own, the privacy of your own garden. First, have you learned to enjoy the abundance and beauty of the free expanses nature has bequeathed to you and the rest of humanity? If not, then how can you possibly comprehend and imagine ownership? It takes awareness and appreciation to fully enjoy these bounties, whether they are in your name 
or in the name of the universe. Are you aware and observant of the flaming western sky at sunset time? Do you know the thrill of wandering over the moonlit stretches of desert sand, enveloped by the transparent cloak of night, with a million diamonds studding the moon-stained sky? If you have an awareness and comprehension only of smoke-filled clubs and artificial neons and electric lights, what mental gifts do you possess with which to win and woo from nature her priceless natural possessions? You wish more material supply, more money, so you may have priceless art objects. A commendable desire, but a vain and purposeless objective. To imprison the beauty of a priceless Rembrandt behind lock and key for your sole enjoyment, or at most, the sharing with a few close friends, is one of life's selfish oddities. How can your powers of imagination and comprehension win for you such treasures, when you have little understanding or appreciation of art, when you have such magnificent collections in art galleries, which are yours free of charge, you are only asked for a little time, a few moments from your life, to enjoy these artistic treasures. When you gain a comprehension of their beauty, a desire for the world to share them with you, there is a true soul awareness, an unselfishness which supersedes the desire for personal acquisition of these priceless possessions. Your own capacity for ownership rises in proportion to your appreciation of and wise usage of nature's gifts. Use wisely the possessions you now have. Live in that furnished room or small apartment with as much purpose and happiness as though it were the beautiful home you so ardently desire. Beautify your present environment and give of the richness of your mind and soul to the limited, the drab or ugly surroundings which now oppress you. Show yourself a worthy custodian of the little, so you may prove your worthiness to a trusteeship of the bounties you expect from life. The law of reciprocity demands that you give much, if you expect much. If you wish ownership, prove yourself capable of caring for that which you now own. You may wish a fur coat, expensive gowns, a luxurious automobile, jewels and a library of first editions. Do you care for that cloth coat with as much love and tenderness as you would lavish on an exclusive mink? Do you choose with taste and discrimination the reasonable gowns you now wear, or is your choice garish and in bad taste? Do you utilize the fine transit systems furnished by your city or town? The taxis, streetcars, and subways representing millions of dollars and treat these possessions as if they were wholly and exclusively your own? There you know. For that little nickel or dime, you may for the moment boast the most expensive limousine in the history of the world. No millionaire or potentate may have a finer one, a better and more expensive expanse of railroad tracks, upholstered trains, luxurious diners, or asphalt roads over which bus or car may skim. These are nature's abundance, created for you and you alone. The King of England in his luxurious palace of 500 rooms can live in only one room at a time, sleep in only one bed a night, eat but one meal at mealtime, and bask in the love and attention of one wife. You too possess the kingly prerogative, if you can but realize it. Henry Ford, with his millions of cars, can ride in but one at a time. And no matter how many millions a man or woman has, they can only spend a certain amount and utilize a limited supply of food, air, and water. There is an amazing universality which makes it possible for you to share these blessings with the entire universe. And if you are actually limited financially at times, never lose sight of these free gifts in your concern for accumulating more and more money. Your needs are met by this universal law of abundance, and you but need faith to know that they will be met in proportion to your ability to enjoy nature's free gifts and appreciate the abundance which is yours. Chapter 5. The Metaphysical versus the Materialistic Concept of Life The word metaphysics originated first with Andronicus of Rhodes, the editor of Aristotle's works. It was used as a name for that part of his writings, which came after the section dealing with physics. It is derived from the two Greek words metaphysica, which mean literally beyond the physical or material. Stevenson said once, words are the beginning of metaphysics. It is true, words begin to give man that first glimmer of truth of a power beyond the physical or material, for words communicate thoughts, and thoughts are a divine exhalation inspired by a higher intelligence than man's. Metaphysics deals with those things, then, which relate to external nature. 
It is that division of philosophy which includes ontology, or the science of being, and epistemology, or the theory of knowledge. In our exploration of the metaphysical concept of life, we are concerned with the nature of being, the genesis of man, and with the existence of God. These are properly within the realm of metaphysics. We are here concerned also with evidence of other than the limited senses, or the science of the supersensible. In Germany, Christian Wolff divided metaphysics into ontology, cosmology, psychology, and natural or rational theology. In England, Bacon defined metaphysics as the quest or study of formal and final causes, contrasting it with natural philosophy as treating efficient and material causes. Metaphysics deals with causes rather than effects, invisible rather than visible phenomena, states of consciousness rather than externalized motion, qualities and states of being rather than physical attitudes, dreams, ideals and ideas rather than evolved forms, the abstract principle rather than the concrete manifestation. Life is not just a continuous experience of emotional reaction to internal and external stimuli. The life force, the intelligence, is not just a reaction of the organism. It is a highly evolved state of consciousness. It is not pure internal motivation, arising and ending with the propulsive power latent in the brain and body, as the positivists seem to believe. Rather, the life force is a spiritual propulsion which exists in matter, but is no essential part of matter. It is a power beyond the atom, a force external to man, an intelligence superseding man's limited powers. When we see the incredible force inherent in a handful of atoms that can cause an entire city to be blown to bits, we must realize that there are invisible potent forces, which are beyond the limited physical and material realms known to man. Here, indeed, is a supersensible realm, a region where man may not enter with reason and science alone, but one in which the speculative faculties and theories of philosophy and metaphysics must be used if man is to divine the causes back of creation. Our use of metaphysics then is analogous to the applying of a new electronic microscope to the scientific eye and mind. In the invisible realm of life exists proof abundant of worlds within worlds. Atoms are found to be constellations, with their suns and moons and revolving satellites. Invisible microscopic life exists beyond the range of man's vision or comprehension. Sound waves above or below man's limited capacity to hear can be produced which can kill human or animal life at a distance. Rays exist beyond the limited spectrum known to science and which give rise to the infrared light that is invisible to the human eye, but which admits of photography in absolute darkness. These facts prove the reality of invisible forces. We need but explore a step further to realize how very real is the unreal, how very potent is the impotent, and how truly concrete is the abstract. Electricity radium rays, the force of gravity, the growing power in vegetable and animal life, the life-giving rays of the sun, these are all evidences of an astounding force which issues from some unknown source, and which sustains man and gives him his life spark and intelligence. When we see this indisputable evidence of an invisible creative intelligence, and explore these realms beyond our limited physical vision, we must know that life really exists on other planes, and that there is another dimension, nay, many dimensions, beyond this third-dimensional realm. To investigate these invisible realms and man's relationship to them, and to better understand the visible existence and its causative factors, is the purpose of this metaphysical study. Let us first explore, then, the materialistic concept and contrast it with the metaphysical. Materialists say that man is a physical being, subject to deterioration and death. They say that when the body dies, mind, which is the byproduct of a physical brain, dies also. That death ends the entire consciousness of man, and that all motivation, impetus, and intelligence cease with the last breath. The metaphysical concept is that man, as a physical organic structure, represents a spiritualized idea. That matter, which is represented by his body, is subject to decay, and death is admitted, but the soul or intelligence which animates man, and which existed before it clothed itself in body, is eternal. As the soul is an invisible essence or life force, it is not subject to the same laws as those which rule matter. 
like other invisible substances which we have spoken of, this soul consciousness of man is subject to higher laws, and being itself invisible, is not apparent to any of the physical senses. The metaphysical concept, then, is that the grave only ends one form of matter, the body, but that the more highly evolved form of matter, which is mind or spirit, is subject to a law not comprehensible to man and is capable of perpetuity or immortality. The materialists say, but there is no scientific proof for your speculative theory of continuity of life after death. To which the metaphysical student might answer, but you have no scientific proof that the soul does not exist, or that intelligence ceases with the grave. As metaphysics deals with that which is beyond matter, it is perfectly logical to carry out this line of reasoning. As there is no actual concrete proof of the existence of the soul, or of a life beyond, man must turn to an inner consciousness for his answer to this baffling problem. On faith alone, then, must he rely for his answer or belief? What value is inherent in this positive belief in a hereafter? If one believes that there is perpetuity in a hereafter, the very fact that belief exists makes of it a living reality while this state of consciousness exists. If there is such continuity of existence and the soul survives, the ego while in this transitory earthly existence is given an added stimulus or incentive for living. Modern psychology shows in the laboratory that energy is produced by positive lines of thought, whereas states of exhaustion are induced through negative thinking or depressing suggestions. There is a very vital and real effect produced upon the entire organism by this positive metaphysical belief of survival. For that reason alone, it is imperative that man believe in a hereafter. It gives purpose and meaning to life. It gives an explanation to the unexplainable physical phenomena of living. It gives added zest and joy to life. It extends the consciousness to new and more infinite possibilities, stimulates the imagination, and gives hope to the sorrowful of reunion with loved ones. Its therapeutic value then cannot be doubted. For that reason alone, and to bolster man's own weaknesses and excuse his dereliction to duty to explain away his failures and the corroding influences of an unhappy physical existence, man must believe in his immortality. These are all positive reasons for an argument in behalf of the metaphysical concept of man's ultimate destiny. The reward in the hereafter makes bearable the suffering on this mortal plane. The peace and tranquility held out as a hope on another sphere makes it possible to stand the tragedies of this existence. If there is something of fanciful daydreaming or even delusion in this metaphysical concept, let the materialist show himself more fortunate in his approach to life, let him reveal a technique by which his materialistic and realistic theories add as much to or take away so little from physical living. What has the materialist to offer as proof of the correctness of his way of thinking? The materialistic concept says that man is a victim of his own stupidity, that his entire existence is one of disease, war, suffering, economic chaos, and death. It offers as a compensation for living the few physical pleasures that are to be derived from eating, drinking, sleeping, and breeding. It admits of rewards in mental and physical reaction to external stimuli, but as these must evolve and die in the organism in which they spontaneously originate, they are doomed to a brief existence in the organ conceiving them. This makes a physical living little more than a barren animal-like existence, short-lived, complete and finished in the brief span of a few years. Where in such a materialistic concept is the explanation for those glorious flights of fancy in which man indulges? Where the overpowering surge of emotion which causes one to sacrifice for love of a person or country? How explain away those infinite pangs of longing for worship of a power beyond the self? How logically explain the tenderness and devotion inherent in the raising of a family? How explain faculties of inspiration, imagination, memory, and the thousands of reactions to not only external situations, but internal emotions? Can the animal be said to possess such evidences of divine promptings? He may breed, eat, sleep, and drink, may know limited emotions, and is a complete organism with a brain, nervous system, heart action, digestion and circulation, with slight modifications even as man, why then, has animal not evolved to this consciousness of divinity or divine origin? If physical organisms are subject only to the evolutionary law, and are all imbued with the same identical abilities and potentialities, 
Why cannot members of the animal kingdom perform the functions of man? The materialist has no answer to these vital questions. The metaphysician has but one answer, based on faith in a deep intuition, that he is divinely created and inspired, that his comprehension issues not only from his physical brain, but that it radiates in a great universal intelligence, which fills all space and which reflects some part of its divinity in man. The materialist makes much of the reality of sickness, poverty, and war, and gives them meaning out of proportion to their true worth. The metaphysical attitude toward these realistic forces is that even though they seem real and ever-present, they represent only a state of delusion of mortal mind. They see the real or permanent as a state of health, as universal abundance, peace, and tranquility. To escape the inevitability of the physical and material negative forces, the materialist argues that man must use physical and material means, force and aggressiveness, cunning and skill. The metaphysician believes, on the other hand, that the means for escaping the negative forces of physical existence lie within the province of man's mind and soul. That is, he can change the pattern within his own consciousness to one of eternal peace, prosperity, happiness and health. He attains those desirable positive attributes. He believes that as darkness is the absence of light, so too, these physical and material products of negativity are due to the absence of intelligence. By turning on the light of knowledge, man may dissolve this state of darkness and flood the consciousness with radiant intelligence. The materialist believes that physical love is for the purpose of procreation and sees man's propagation as an animal function only. Metaphysically, Love is represented as being a divine attribute, not capable of being felt by animals. Love is held to be the creative function of God, and in it is inherent the love, tenderness, and beauty of spirit, rather than mere sensuality and gratification. Metaphysics adds to man's mind another dimension. It admits that man is physical, but that the physical self is only an effect. The fundamental difference between the materialistic concept and the metaphysical concept lies in the fact that the materialist admits of an effect without a primary cause. The metaphysically minded cannot conceive an effect such as a body, without a cause, such as a creator. So too, metaphysics teaches that man is body, but also mind and soul, and that mind is the cause which impels body to cooperate perfectly. When conflict exists within the mind, it is believed that it communicates itself to the body, furnishing a cause which evidences itself in the effect of physical disease. So too, metaphysics traces this obscure relationship between cause and effect, a subtle working which begins in the invisible realm of mind or spirit, and which sets up a causative chain which communicates itself to body, and thence to the external world. Metaphysics teaches that words are the emanations of brain, and as such are links in the causative chain, producing effects. When negative words are spoken, it is because a negative cause has been advanced by the brain. When negative consequences ensue, it is said that mind produced the negative effect of unhappiness, war, or poverty. It teaches further that positive thoughts lead to positive emotions and actions, and that negative thoughts lead to negative feelings and reactions. The materialist ascribes power only to physical effects, without taking into consideration causes. He sees bodily reactions, without a predisposing action. He sees the ebb and flow of the tides, without ascribing to it a cause external to matter, he witnesses the orderly procession of the seasons, planting, growth and harvest, without seeing back of these material evidences aught of invisible causes. He witnesses the sun, but ignores the rays which give him life, sees the physical manifestations of existence, but divorces them from a spiritual cause which he cannot see or imagine. Metaphysics admits of the power of invisible agencies, states of consciousness, whether self-induced or produced by an external intelligence operative in man. It ascribes to these invisible emanations powers more forcible than physical and material agencies. The dynamic power released through the purely metaphysical function of love is proof that an invisible emotion is more powerful than visible substance. What glorious heights has humanity achieved through the ennobling emotion of unselfish love? Its function, when elevated above the limited sensual plane into the spiritual realm of motherhood, love of country and worship of a creator, inspires in man a greatness 
and inspiration which is equaled by no material force. The materialist sees in life physical and material substance, self-motivated, self-propelled, and self-destroyed. How limited this concept! If, as the behaviorists or positivists believe, everything must issue from the reaction of a physical agent to external stimuli, the entire human experience becomes a matter of eating, drinking, sleeping, working, and breeding. The metaphysical concept admits of the reality of the physical functions, but it adds another dimension, that of soul wedded to mind and body. It sees back of all life order, rhythm, and harmony. It observes in nature an amazing intelligence which operates under the working of a dynamic universal law. It sees man as related to this universe inevitably by some invisible cord which binds the part to the whole. With Descartes, metaphysics admits that there is a homogeneous substance inherent in matter and which also underlies mind, and that these two, mind and matter, are one, that mind is also in matter and matter in mind. Mind becomes a substance, but of a different kind and quality than matter. Metaphysics admits that this homogeneous substance is motivated and propelled by a divine mind, which is a supreme causative factor in the universe. Man with his intelligence is an effect of this divine mind, and in man's use of his consciousness, there is again a primary cause, which leads to other effects, thus forming a never-ending chain. The metaphysical qualities, as expressed in manner, love, faith, beauty, charity, peace, joy, positive thinking. These give to mind a radiance and power which transcends the limited physical self. These are divine attributes, and when added to meditation and prayer, they become invincible forces for good. The metaphysical concept opens new and invisible doors within the mind. Imagination becomes one of these potent newly awakened forces. When man discovers imagination, he forges nature's gifts into weapons with which to hunt and build, in which to span continents by plane and ship. He harnesses the lightning bolt and bends it to his will. He explores the invisible world, first with his inner eye, and then with his microscope, and discovers worlds within worlds. He creates a telescope and peers at the hidden secrets of the stars spinning in space. He harnesses the atom and makes of it a destructive agency, or one that can be used for man's good. Man becomes superman when he unlocks these stupendous forces within himself. As these powers are beyond the material or physical, do they not then fall under the definition of metaphysics? Man has now reached out into space to the very moon itself with radar pulsations. Again, evidence that when man applies the metaphysical concept to life, he may wrest from nature the very mystery of life itself. How then may man unlock the invisible doors to a new inner world? By retiring into those inner regions of mind, in the deep silence of the soul. There, through meditation, man may tune the very fiber of his being to the divine harmonies of the universe. He may withdraw from the chaos of the outer world and find this new kingdom revealed within self. When man thus escapes from the materialism which threatens to engulf him, he discovers new values. He finds, then, the radiant realities of life. He can put himself in touch with the divine intelligence which pulsates throughout the universe and discover in that silent region that he is a perfect being, guided by an invisible cord which transmits the divine pulsations of God through man's own mind. Music, art, literature, poetry, color, and beauty of all kinds, these two are inspirational forces which help man unlock the doors to this invisible realm. When man escapes into these silent spheres with such spiritual inspiration, he finds revealed the true purpose and meaning of life. Such men as Pythagoras, Plato, Confucius, Copernicus, Galileo, Newton, Mozart, Beethoven, Michelangelo, Shakespeare, Rembrandt, and thousands of others, discovered this inner, metaphysical realm, far removed from the conflicting forces of the material world, and there, in that inner citadel of the soul, they created their great masterpieces and revealed their wondrous discoveries for the world to use and enjoy. When you find this metaphysical concept of living, you will not retire entirely from life, but rather will mix with the active, pulsating stream of humanity, drawing from the material and physical, stimuli for more extensive adventure. You will retire into that mystic realm of the inner self when you need guidance and commune with your soul. 
Then there will be revealed the beauty and joy that is reserved for the soul alone. Chapter 6 Secrets of Mind Substance for Shaping Your Destiny Destiny is not something that just happens. It is something that is created, molded, or shaped. We have it within our own power to choose the events, people, and conditions which go to make up our lives. We may think the thoughts we wish, imagine the pictures we desire, feel the emotions we select, and perform the actions we choose. These thoughts, feelings, and actions form a pattern. That pattern is your destiny. If life were perfect, there would be no need of shaping your destiny. But life is not perfect. It's imperfect. People make it imperfect. They are unhappy, poor, sick, and filled with negativity. They may exist in a world that has all the elements for happiness, success, and health. But if they do not shape these elements into constructive forces for their use, they will continue to attract poverty-stricken, unhappy, and sickly destinies. There is a great universal substance in the world. It is an intelligence which is in matter, flows through it, but is not imprisoned by it. It exists in all animate and inanimate things. It causes plants to grow, animals to function, and man to be motivated in his life purpose. This life force is a gravity-like power. It has the ability to shape and create new forms. It attracts to all created things the elements they require for their continued existence. Man has this intelligence within himself. The intelligence does not die with man, for other forms of life continue to express it after he ceases to exist. The intelligence, then, is a thing apart from man or his brain. It is separate from matter. It is a pulsating force in which all things are immersed and upon which all creation depends for its continued existence. Newton once said of his law of gravity or the power of attracting or repelling, you sometimes speak of gravity as essential and inherent in matter. Pray do not ascribe that notion to me for the cause of gravity is what I do not pretend to know. Although Newton did not know what gravity was, he knew that it existed. When the planets rotate in their spheres with no visible agency holding them in their places, when man is able to stand on a globe spinning at a thousand miles per hour, without flying off into space, when millions of tons of water are propelled by a mysterious invisible substance emanating from a planet more than 200,000 miles distant from this Earth, when sap rises from the ground to a distance of a hundred or more feet in the air, with no visible agency to propel it, man must admit that some great external intelligence exists, which is the propulsive force of life. As it expresses itself in matter, we see visibly its power. If it exists, then, man may harness it to shape his destiny. When we see evidence contrary to this invisible mind substance shaping our destinies, it is because our consciousness is limited and does not perceive the action of the invisible on the visible. The action is there, even though we do not see it. The evidence of the outgoing tide must await the complete ebb tide before we believe an invisible action exists. When we see the flowering tree, we have visible evidence of an invisible function. So man knows that this action, this shaping principle of an invisible intelligence, is constantly at work, seen or unseen by his visible senses. So too, what you see as real may actually be unreal, and what is unreal to you may be the most real and potent force in the universe. The dream is often reality, and real life the dream. The mental action is often shaping the destiny, even though the visible action is unapparent. The invisible or secret force of life, then, may be said to be the guiding mind of the universe. We follow its dictates and wishes, and transmute its subtle promptings into visible phenomena and material substance. This intelligence which shapes man's destiny is so amazingly accurate that when it is unimpeded by conscious malpractice by man, it works out his destiny unerringly and with unmistakable accuracy, giving him the rewards, the punishments, the pain, the pleasure, the riches or poverty, health or sickness, that is motivated by the action of his mind. In nature, there is no conscious mind to motivate or distort this superintelligence. There is an example of this in the history of a certain eel, which feels this life impulse or intelligence shaping its destiny so strongly that it swims 3,000 miles to get back to its spawning place, to lay its eggs, and fulfill its life function. 
it is guided unerringly back to the place of its origin by some amazing universal intelligence. This intelligence does not originate in the eel, but is an external force and affects all eels alike. If it were the product of one single eel's intelligence, without an external motivation, it is obvious that there would be infinite variations and procedures in the conduct of the millions of eels who feel this invisible force. Their conduct is identical, showing that they all possess a similar awareness which makes them conscious of this external intelligence. It is evident too in the conduct of the male polar bear and all male polar bears. The male digs a hole in the northern ice for the female and the embryonic cub, the female accumulates fat upon which her body may feed during the long winter and enters into a state of hibernation. The male bear stands guard over the entrance to the nest, hunts and lives as usual during the winter. In the spring, the female awakens, bears her cub and returns to the normal routine of her existence with her family. This intelligence is in the egg before it becomes a chick. It knows whether it is to be hen or rooster. Man, being a more highly evolved form of life than the animal, with a more evolved mental function, is also traveling toward a certain destiny. He is guided by an invisible power or intelligence. This is intelligence existed before man came onto the earth scene and will continue to exist when man leaves it. This intelligence knows the purpose of life, knows too, how it should be lived. This is intelligence which ties man to it, might be likened to a puppet on a string. When the string is taut and man is positive and in tune with this divine intelligence, man is propelled toward his goal of happiness, success, health and spiritual attainment when the thoughts are negative, filled with ideas of sickness, failure, poverty, hate and misery. The string is slackened and the mind and body slump into a condition of inertia and the power is cut off at its source. This motivating intelligence of the universal mind operates through man's mind. Mind is a conscious reflection of this universal force when it operates intelligently. All the great teachers and philosophers have said, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he, and as you have thought, so you are. As you shall think, so you shall be. The first was said by Christ, the second by Buddha, nearly six hundred years before Christ was born. Now, in modern scientific thought, one of our scientists, Dr. Franz Hartmann, said, Man is materialized thought. Man can change his environment, his body, his work, through his thinking. His thoughts have the power of attracting the elements, people, and situations he needs to shape his destiny. Dr. Clauston, in an inaugural address before the Royal Medical Society in London, said, I could relate remarkable cases to you from my own experience and out of books of functional disease being brought on and being cured by mental impressions only, of functions being suspended and altered from the same causes, of actual organic lesions being directly caused and cured by mental impressions. Dr. Frederick Peterson, professor of psychiatry, Columbia University, and ex-president of the New York State Commission in Lunacy, and ex-president of the New York Neurological Society, once said in an article printed in a book on psychotherapy, through acting upon the mind, upon the emotions, we may not only influence the mind, but also the body. To physicians, this has been an accepted tenet or an unconscious practice in all ages. A great part of their therapy has been founded upon it. This has been the basis of all miracle cures, faith cures, exorcisms, Christian science cures, and the like. Not only is disease frequently thus cured, but it may be thus produced. Modern psychiatry recognizes this astounding truth today and works to cure the mind first when organic or functional disturbances appear. The mind is actually the instrument which shapes the body and many times accounts for bodily manifestations that cannot be traced to physical or material causes. The famous experiment conducted by Professor Kraft Ebing illustrates how the mind shapes the body. A postage stamp was placed on the skin of a young woman. He told her that it was a fly blister and that in a short time it would produce a blister on her skin. The spot where the stamp was placed was carefully bandaged and sealed so that no one could in any way tamper with it. In a few hours' time, the blister appeared. This again is proof that mind influences the body profoundly for good or bad, depending on the suggestions given to the mind. 
Another instance where suggestion works to create physical and material manifestations was that of Professor Janet, who had a patient under the effects of religious ecstasy. She believed that she was to receive the stigmata of Christ. In a short time a blebs began to appear on each foot. A piece of mica and a seal were put over the foot with a bandage, and the appearance of an ulcer on each foot was observed to develop. Under the influence of the religious ecstasy, the ulcers were exactly like those seen in the pictures of Christ. There are instruments which measure the slightest changes in breathing, heartbeat, blood flow, and other physical effects of the body under the impetus of mental stimulus. These instruments show definitely that the body reacts almost instantly to mind's subtle promptings. With the method discovered by Jung for arousing the emotions through word association, scientists may now measure the subtle reactions of the body to mind impulses, and definite hidden conflicts and complexes may be uncovered through the reaction to the word stimulus. There are many instances where doctors prescribe for their patients nothing more powerful than bread pills, or placebos as they are called, to influence the patient's mind, and to release the mental power to perform the cure in the patient's body. Such positive results are obtained by the use of these suggestive methods that there is no doubt but what the mind can and does influence the body for good or bad, sickness or health. If mind can thus be motivated to affect the body, why should it not be similarly stimulated to produce changes in man's external environment? It can be so used and it is constantly shaping and molding man's external events and his environment. The external world is made apparent to man through his five senses. There is another sense in man, a sixth sense, that spiritual side of man which discerns without any organs of discernment. It is through this higher sense that man may rise superior to limitations and create the world he envisions. As time and space, and third-dimensional objects appear to us only through the interpretation we give them with our brain. It is obvious that man may give any coloration to external events and situations that he mentally chooses. To a blind person the world is totally different from what it is to sighted people. They give their own interpretation as to how it appears. If, then, the outer world shapes itself according to the form or pattern we carry in our own consciousness, it is obvious that we can stamp upon this universal mind any picture or shape we have in our own mind, and that it will be produced in matter. We might liken this process to a stamping machine in the mint. Upon a die in the machine is the pattern of the type of coin it is to cut from the metal fed into the machine. It may be a die for a penny or for a twenty-dollar gold piece. As the metal is fed into the machine, the die stamps out of the metal the exact image and picture that is in the machine. We might liken our conscious mind to the die stamping machine. The thoughts flowing through the brain form the picture or die. The metal passing through the machine is the universal mind substance upon which we wish to stamp our pictures. As the pictures stamped out of the universal substance depend on the imprint in the conscious mind, it is vital that we have the right picture formed in our minds. If you have the brain filled with pictures that are negative, the value to be stamped upon the universal mind substance must obviously be negative. If you have imprinted upon your mental die thoughts of sickness, poverty, unhappiness, temper and irritability, ugliness and confusion, you cannot hope to stamp upon the universal substance the opposite values of health, riches, peace and calm. The mind creates the exact condition that exists within its confines. You alone can choose the picture or pattern you wish to be imprinted upon your mind. How do we go about changing the negative pictures that have been stamped upon the sensitized surface of the brain? There are several methods. The most important one is through suggestion by your conscious mind of the things you want this universal mind substance to produce. Suggestion means to imprint by constant repetition upon your brain the thoughts you wish your brain to incorporate. This may be done through thinking or through speaking and writing. What are some of the suggestions which should be stamped upon the brain? Following is a list of some of the most desirable conditions which most people seek to attain. 1. Your right work. Universal mind is trying to lead you to your right work. If you were an insect, bird or animal, it is more than likely that you would follow your deep instincts to fulfill your right work. A beaver continues to build dams even if taken out of water. His instinct tells him he must create, 
and he continues creating the picture that has been stamped upon his consciousness. He fulfills the task he was created for. If one of these busy creatures is taken from a stream and locked up in a corner of the living room and left alone, he will soon take all the furniture and cut and drag it to one section of the room. There he will construct as perfect a dam as possible with the materials he has at hand. To him that is his life work, and to carry out that work is his sole excuse for living. So too your right work will be realized only when you stamp upon your subconscious mind the nature of the work you wish to do. If you compromise or take any work that offers itself because it is convenient, you are taking the lazy man's attitude toward life and drifting with the tide. To know your right work, ask your inner self what it is you are best suited to. If there is no answer and you doubt your own mind, do whatever work you can for the present, but endeavor to perfect your mind so that you will gradually be guided more and more in the right direction. Have a definite course plan for your future. Write it down and make a blueprint out of it. This gives the master builder of the universe a definite picture to build on. Know whether you want to be a designer or a ballet dancer. Different tools, different techniques and mental and physical conditioning are required for these two different tasks. Know if you wish to be a plumber or a composer. Universal mind can shape either one or the other for you, if you know definitely which you choose. If there is confusion or vacillation, then the universal mind becomes confused. When there is confusion, neither of the two pictures you have imprinted upon your mind can be clearly stamped upon this stream of universal mind substance. Repeat over at night the following suggestion for finding your right work or place in life. I will be guided to my right work in life. I wish to do work that will prove helpful to humanity. My inner consciousness is now ordered to appraise my talents, mentality, background, and experience. The right conditions and persons will be attracted into my life to help me fulfill my ambitions. I seek that work which will be for my good as well as the good of the world. I am calm, poised, and spiritually aware. My intellect is fully awakened. I respond to the highest and most noble inspirations. I confidently await the fulfillment of my destiny. 2. Perfect Health It is vitally important that you imprint upon this universal intelligence the condition of health that you desire. As it is the life force, it will either flow through you unobstructed, producing perfect health, or, if imprinted by your conscious mind with negative thoughts of sickness and bodily imperfections, that is the condition it will manifest within your body. Think health all the time. Do not give sickness a foothold in your body. If you are so busy imprinting upon your mind thoughts of health, the cells of your body cannot possibly be stamped with a negative suggestion of sickness. If you have been sick for some time, or if you believe in hereditary disease, work to suggest to your subconscious and to the universal consciousness the opposite thoughts. Think good health, talk good health, write good health. When friends ask you how you feel, always reply in the positive. Never say, I don't feel so well today, or I'm afraid I'm coming down with a cold, or I have a headache, I'm afraid I'm going to be sick. The body cells instantly telegraph this mental message to each other, and the condition is stamped upon the entire stream of consciousness within your body. Suggest to this inner and outer intelligence through the spoken word, through thoughts, and by writing them down, the following positive thoughts. My body is under protection of divine mind. It reflects only those positive states of consciousness which exist within my own mind. I now reflect thoughts of health, vitality and vigor. I command my subconscious mind to think only those thoughts which are constructive and positive. I am filled with peace, love, joy, and tranquility. My body now reflects these states of mind. I am calm, controlled, poised, and perfectly balanced in every way. I instruct my inner consciousness to maintain perfect balance in my body's functions. My organs now receive their proper nourishment and perform their tasks perfectly. My heartbeat is rhythmical, strong, and steady. My digestion is perfect, doing its work without interruption of disturbing or negative thoughts. I feel radiant, happy, strong, and healthy. I reflect this state of mind in every atom and cell, every nerve and organ, every bit of tissue, flesh, blood, and bone of my entire physical and mental organism. 
3. Financial Security Stamp upon this universal mind, and upon your own mind, the financial security which you desire. As you need money to live in this economic system, it is vital that you imbue your consciousness with the proper respect and value of money. You cannot attract money by hating it, for the mind and body will not attract that which it spurns. It would be like trying to woo a friend or sweetheart by screaming vile imprecations against them. It would cause them to desert you. So too with money. It has a certain value and must be treated with respect. It is not wrong to possess material supply and abundance. As all things were created for your good, it is right that you should have the things which money represents or even the money itself with which to buy that which you need. The Bible says in Genesis 2.12, And God looked upon the gold of the land, and it was good. That which is good cannot be bad. Believe and know then that gold is merely substance which universal mind is trying to produce for your own good. Affirm and suggest to your inner intelligence and to universal mind the truth about money. I desire that which is for my good. As I need financial security to bring me peace of mind and the attainment of my physical and material needs, I now petition the universal intelligence for that share of worldly goods which is for my best interests. I do not require that which is for selfish good alone, but that which will give me strength and ability to help the world, to help my family, to obtain food, clothing, shelter, and those cultural pursuits which are for the good of mankind. I ask of universal intelligence such sums of money, or other worldly goods as I can intelligently use and profitably distribute to others for the good of the world. I petition universal intelligence for supply to meet my daily needs, to keep me in security for the present, and for sufficient to meet my needs as the years unfold. I use wisely that which I now possess. I do not permit myself to indulge in waste or extravagance. I respect that supply which universal mind has seen fit to give me, and I consent to enter into a custodianship agreement only wherein temporarily administer these possessions, and safely keep them to give over to the world when I no longer require them. I now give thanks for these possessions, for the few gifts I now have, for those riches to be bountifully supplied by a provident creator. If you have money now that you use unintelligently, it is more than likely that you will have it taken from you. If you drink, dissipate it on good times, gamble, speculate, risk it on unintelligent investments, it is more than likely that universal mind will be cognizant of this abuse of its great generosity, and the source will suddenly be closed to your future demands. You supply intelligently, generously, without being wasteful. Help those who are more unfortunate than yourself. Do not be miserly and greedy. Give thanks daily for the substance created for your use that day, and the universal intelligence will continue to pour into your life the abundance you require for your present and future existence. 4. Love Happiness Happiness is compounded of three elements, mind, body, and soul nourishment. If you have only one without the other two, there is stagnation or starvation. As we are physical, the physical needs must be met. As we are mental, so too, man must meet the mental needs. Love is food for body, mind, and soul. On the purely physical plane, love is pro-creatively useful, but also for exalting the physical emotions to a higher plane where man may comprehend the creative power of God. Love has a most useful function. When love is merely sensual, it can degenerate to the animal plane. When it becomes spiritual love, it is more powerful and radiant than when used only in a limited personal capacity. One must not assume that it is wrong to express love mentally, physically, or spiritually. All three planes of expression were intended by the Creator. Love wisely expressed is the most creative power in the universe. The creative affirmation or suggestion for the fuller expression and attainment of love happiness is as follows. I reflect that divine love which flows through all creation. My mind imbued with the consciousness of impersonal love. I radiate this transforming power to all I meet. My thoughts are shaped by this magical spiritual force. My body is motivated by its transcending quality. My soul is uplifted by its rapturous harmony. I impress now upon my inner consciousness only those positive thoughts of love-happiness which I hope to attract, 
as I know that the laws of the universe are mathematically just, I aware that if my consciousness is filled with love, I must inevitably attract love. I use this force intelligently. I now place this creative love force on a high plane where it enriches the consciousness and blesses all with whom I come in contact. As I reflect divine love, it must transform and elevate all that is lowly, common, gross or animalistic and make of me a radiant, positive, creative force. 5. Dynamic Personality The type of personality you have depends on the thoughts you most habitually think. These thoughts are constantly shown by your expressions, words and bodily postures and actions. If you display irritability and temper, if you are critical and sarcastic, you will naturally drive people away from you. Personality can be repellent or attractive. To impress upon your consciousness, the positive, attractive personality requires positive suggestion. I impress upon my inner consciousness these positive thoughts. As I think, so I am. My mind is now impressed with thoughts of gentility, consideration, courtesy, beauty, peace, and harmony. I look upon all people as being one in divine mind. They are deserving of my utmost consideration. I now send out positive, happy thoughts to all I meet. My mind is imbued with an unselfish desire to please others. I instruct my inner consciousness to incorporate into my words, feelings, and actions those qualities which are positive and attractive. I recognize the law of reciprocity. I release to all I meet qualities of charm and radiance. I expect from others the same reaction. My personality is now poised and powerful. I am still and my inner qualities may radiate to the outside world in a dynamic and harmonious flow. I reflect happiness and make others happy. I reflect peace and make others peaceful. I reflect love and others react with love. As we begin more and more to shape our own inner consciousness with the pictures we wish to stamp upon universal mind, we will find more and more that the external world, people and situations, will conform to this inner picture. Whether this is real or only apparent, it is difficult to say. It is not important. If the appearance is there, then to all intents and purposes, it is real. We usually find that external situations reflect what we most habitually dwell on in thought. If one were to be created with a pair of green goggles and looked at the world with nothing but those colored glasses, the entire world would take on that particular coloration. If someone else were to look at the same scene with rose-colored glasses, the scene would take on rose tints. The two minds would be looking at the same scene, but the consciousness of each would be totally different, and they would see a different external picture. A story illustrates this point. A traveler came to the well in a strange city and stopped one of the men drawing water at the well. Tell me, the stranger said, how are the people of this city? The citizen who was drawing water said, and how did you find the people in the city you just came from? The stranger replied, they were cruel to the extreme, greedy, selfish, and inconsiderate. The citizen answered, then you will find the people of this city are also cruel, greedy, and selfish. The way in which we habitually think and feel and act is the way the world will shape itself for us. We form these pictures and emotional reactions through repetition of the thoughts we wish to habitually entertain. These finally become deeply ingrained habits, which color our lives and motivate every thought, word, and act. When habit is finally impressed upon the consciousness, either negatively or positively, it is impossible for the body to react differently from its accustomed habits. The external world conforms to our mental picture and people habitually express themselves toward us, as our actions inspire them to certain modes of conduct. An ancient story well exemplifies the vital influence that habit has over shaping our conduct. When the great library at Alexandria was burned several thousand years ago, one book only was left intact. It contained the secret of transmutation of base metal to gold. The book fell into the hands of a poor man who read in it this statement. The touchstone needed to turn base metals to gold lies on the shores of the Aegean Sea. The account gave the approximate location of the spot with this warning. When the stone would be found, the person finding it would feel its pulsating warmth and would know instantly that it was the magic touchstone. 
The man sold his possessions and deserted friends and family to travel to this remote spot on the seashore. When he reached it he was dismayed, for there, lying in the bright sun, were millions and millions of stones. He set to work with a vengeance, picking up one stone after the other, feeling it, and then tossing it into the sea. He spent one year picking up thousands upon thousands of smooth pebbles, but each one was as cold as the other, so off into the sea he tossed them. Finally, after three years, during which time he had tossed hundreds of thousands of pebbles into the sea, he came across one that was so hot that it nearly burned his hand. He screamed, Eureka, and with a wild gesture formed by three years of habit, he tossed the touchstone into the sea. Habit is too powerful a chain to be broken overnight. Negative habits are more strongly embedded than positive ones. It will take time, patience, and hard work to eradicate the habit structures of thinking failure, sickness, unhappiness, tragedy, hate, jealousy, worry, fear, and other destructive thoughts. It will take as long to impress upon the consciousness the opposite positive thoughts of success, health, happiness, good fortune, love, confidence, and trust. It may be some time before the body can heal itself of sickness, because the thoughts of disease have been so persistently pounded into its structure. But with patience the mind can shape and mold, not only the body, but the entire external world, so that it conforms perfectly with the ideal mental picture that has been created by constant positive suggestion. Chapter 7. Magic Formula for Personal Power the word power means something different to every person. To one, power may mean money. To another, success in his work. And to still another, it may mean physical power or vitality, which comes from buoyant good health. Power, in the sense in which it is used here, designates all the inherent forces that lie within man. Very often he is not aware of the tremendous power he possesses. Most people live in the physical and material senses alone and to such persons power means the ability to overcome the obstacles of life by sheer physical force and dominance. They believe in the literal meaning of the Nietzsche idea of the will to power. When this physical meaning of the word is carried to unnatural extremes, it leads to the rise of tyrants and power-mad dictators. Seldom does one find progress, profit, or peace under the indiscriminate use of such physical force. There are three types of power. Each must be considered as necessary, and each will be studied separately. 1. Mental power. There should be a constant desire to increase our mental power. When we stagnate mentally, the body cells begin to die. We then become old and useless. To imbue the consciousness with a keen desire for mental power is to live fully and to seek out every form of teaching that adds to the acquisition of knowledge. For power to be useful, there must be an intake and an outflow. The mind is able to absorb so much more than it is ever called upon to do. There are millions of brain cells, and when these are developed fully, the flow of power is tremendous. It is estimated that the most brilliant man or woman living will never fully develop the complete number of brain cells to their ultimate possibility in one lifetime. The brain may be likened to a flower garden. There may be beautifully tended patches of flowers scattered here and there, but if there are ugly barren areas or weed-strewn sections in that garden, the general effect is one of untidiness or even of ugliness. So too with the human brain. If there are areas in the brain which are allowed to stagnate and which are not cultivated, they will detract from the effectiveness of the entire personality, they will impede the flow of energy and the ultimate development of personal power. How, then, is mental power acquired? Through the five senses first, for the sights, sounds, feelings, and sensations give their constant impulses to the brain. These radiate in nerve currents to the entire body, and when vitally alive and highly stimulated by the nature of the thoughts, it is logical to suppose that the radiations from the brain to the body and thence to the outer world will naturally be stimulating and powerful. Well-read minds are always more potent than minds that never accumulate knowledge from the printed page. Those who live fully and have varied experiences are always more forceful personalities than those who do not enjoy life's full, rich experiences. 
The reading habits of a man or woman definitely affect the brain cells for good or bad. Accumulation of mental power must come first from the cumulative brain power of those who have lived in the past and who have written of their experiences. Good books, magazines, and newspapers may add much to the richness of the mental experience. We can never find the time to personally explore all of life's numerous possibilities. We can, in a measure, vicariously share these keen emotional experiences through reading of the eventful lives of others. Never should we entirely substitute others' experiences for our own, however. Reading must merely be an extension to our own living, sharing and experiencing the various emotional stimuli of life. The mind registers the outer changing seen through the eyes and ears. These external impulses must be rigidly censored by the conscious mind. There is much of ugliness, sickness, misery and general chaos of which we are conscious. This type of negativity tends to decrease the personal power and increase the tendency to nervousness, vacillation, and personality weakness. Everything that enters the consciousness then must be labeled good or bad. We must decide if it is negative or positive, if it can add to our sum total of power, or if it will vitiate the mental and physical energy we now possess. When you are thus alert, you can read of tragedies, murders, wars, depressions, and other negative conditions without letting them vitally affect you. When you read such accounts in the daily papers or witness scenes of suffering, sickness, poverty, and limitation, you can view them objectively, not letting them register deeply upon your subjective consciousness. This is not adopting a hard-hearted or cold-blooded attitude toward the world's tragedies, but it is limiting their power over your consciousness. You have it within your power to choose the thoughts, emotions, and experiences which you shall register upon your brain. If those mental impulses are negative, they instantly register, not only upon your brain, but upon every atom and cell of your body. They can radically affect your health, your actions, and your personality. The more mental power you possess, the more personal power you will radiate to the external world. The more highly developed the brain cells, the more radiant and vital will be the power you express in your personality. The more positive and progressive your thinking, the more will the cells of your body reflect that positiveness in good health and more perfect functioning. 2. Physical Power Body is subservient to mind, it is true, but if the body power is permitted to decrease owing to mental negligence, the bodily resistance becomes lowered and the possibility of disease is increased. Physical stamina is built first through mind, second, through concentrating on maintaining body power. How then is personal body power increased? Diet is undoubtedly the most important adjunct to building bodily vigor and good health. There have been many books written on diet with lists of food that are good and bad. Science has exploded many of the theories which have been a fad for some years regarding the eating of starch and protein at the same meal, acid and starch, or two starches or proteins. A generally safe and sane rule to follow for the building of body vitality is to eat a well-balanced diet, which includes proteins, starches, fruits, and vegetables. As to whether to eat more protein or starch, much depends on the inner craving or desire. Whether one shall eat meat or vegetables alone is again a matter of personal preference. Some, like George Bernard Shaw and Gandhi, who are professed vegetarians, maintain a high level of energy on a purely vegetable diet, whereas others feel they must have the meat proteins. A fairly good dietary rule to follow in food intake for increasing bodily energy and power is to eat both acid and alkaline foods with a balance of 80% alkaline foods to 10% acid foods. Again, no hard and fixed rule can be given, as individual cases are different and require different dietary habits. If the mind is positive, happy, optimistic, it is now conceded by modern science that the body can handle almost any food intake, regardless of the mixture. If the mind is upset, suffering from conflict and unhappiness, then even the most judiciously balanced diet will prove indigestible. More definite rules can be laid down regarding fresh air and the value of mild exercise. Air is power, both mental and physical. We can live for days without food or water, but only a few moments without air. 
Deep breathing is something that should be studied scientifically. It depends on complete control of the diaphragm and intelligent use of the breathing apparatus. The air within the home should be constantly in circulation, either by lowering a window from the top and bottom or by a mechanical system for refreshing the air in a room. Long walks out of doors should be encouraged. Mild exercise, rather than strenuous forms, is advocated for those who are past 35 years of age. Walking, swimming, and golfing are considered beneficial forms of exercise. Those who live in a climate where sunshine is lacking, owing to bad weather, or the limitations of city buildings which shut out the sun's rays, should either have a sun lamp or spend as much time outdoors as possible. Body power depends on these primal necessities. Health cannot be maintained by mind alone. These physical adjuncts are vital, and although the brevity with which they are discussed in this chapter might give a false impression as to their importance, it should be understood that no such suggestion is intended. The acquisition of the knowledge pertaining to diet and bodily exercise and health should be diligently pursued in books and institutions where such information is a specialty. 3. Spiritual Power Spiritual power is undoubtedly the greatest single factor in the developing of personal power. No formula for better or happier living would be complete without considering the important functioning of the spiritual nature in the acquisition of personal power. When man admits that there are powers beyond the self, he attains a state of expanded consciousness or awareness that admits of many possibilities. The spiritual attributes give man a sense of purposefulness in life. To his desire for self-preservation is added the additional perspective of race preservation. To his aggressive animal traits is added the gentility and kindness which is spiritual. When man rises to the greatest heights of true personal power, he unlocks within himself the qualities of compassion and forgiveness, beauty and love, joy and tranquility, hope and charity, faith and devotion. He becomes for the first time a creative being, divinely endowed and divinely inspired. Then flower the great gifts of creation. Language and its amazing shades and varieties of interpretation, the sciences blossom with their infinite capacity for proving and demonstrating further the spiritual reality. Art is born with its appreciation of form, color, and line. Music comes to life with its appeal to the soul and its universal rhythm. All these are the creative propensities of man, which awaken under the impetus of the spiritual urge or drive. Not only do these spiritual forces add power to the personality, to expression, to living, but a new inner richness, a new dimension is added to life, wherein man may commune with nature and God, and he may experience that divine exaltation which comes from the highest and most noble inspiration. Man, under the impetus of this spiritual power, becomes a humanitarian, living to help the world. Socially, ethically, morally, mentally, and physically, there is new power. The master motive of life becomes high and purposeful, and when this occurs, the human ego is enthroned for the first time in its lofty spiritual abode. Soul power is then awakened and adds its luster and beauty to all of life's expression. Love blossoms in the human heart and embraces all humanity. Under its emotional impetus there come to full fruition the grandeur and magnificence of the human entity, mind, body, and soul, working in harmony with the highest vibrations man is capable of experiencing. Why then is man so often limited in the expression of his personal power? What curtails this divine emanation which normally is trying to express itself in man creatively? There are many reasons why man fails to tune himself to this divine flow of energy and inspiration. When he learns to so tune himself, he finds that his life expression is channeled, his energies are increased, and his personal power is so intensified that he is able to direct himself into any experience that is for his good. There are certain fundamentals for creating this personal power. It is a mental technique which may be acquired by any alert person. Essentials for Creating Personal Power 1. Cultivate the habit of knowing exactly what you want in life. Power flows more freely along direct lines. If you are confused and do not know what it is you want, the universal intelligence which gives you power is deflected from its goal. 
Choose then the environment you desire, mentally first, and do not worry about how you will attract it. Hold it in mind, concentrate on it, and see it clearly. Soon, you will inevitably be directed to creating the environment or finding the exact duplicate that you imaged. 2. Do not permit yourself to vacillate or jump from one goal to another. When you confuse the picture of what you want, there is a fogged image in your brain. The universal intelligence is not able to cultivate the situation you desire if you change the picture daily. Choose the one big goal and hold it steadfast. Have small goals as contributing to the attainment of the big one, but do not change your all-inclusive goal every day, month, or year. 3. Create inspiration in your life to carry you to your goal. Inspiring forces are unselfish desires. If you have a desire to elevate your family, it is unselfish and will furnish you with mental and physical power to attain that ambition. If you can raise even that inspiration to higher levels, you increase your personal power and are able to attain a higher goal. A desire to help your community, the nation, the world, these are of higher inspirational value than a limited desire to help yourself or your family. The Pasteurs, the Edisons, the Lincolns, the Curies, Mozarts and Newtons of life drew higher inspiration for their great achievements when they had a desire to help humanity. So too, your inspirational power, your personal power, is developed in proportion to your desire to give of your gifts and time to the greatest number of people. 4. Develop your willpower. Personal power increases in proportion to your ability to push or drive yourself. This is commonly known as willpower. The will is merely that propulsive power of life which keeps us going until our lifespan is finished. If this willpower is increased, you will possess sufficient stamina to attain any goal in life that you can intelligently conceive. How can willpower be developed? A. By doing the simple little things first that you can easily accomplish, and then gradually increasing your tasks until they are more difficult or complex. B. By forcing yourself to do unpleasant things that you constantly put off doing. C. By mastering the mind so that it can be held on one thought or subject steadily instead of wavering. D. By having a purpose back of everything you do. E. By forcing yourself to concentrate upon a set task for continuously increasing periods of time. 5. Do not be discouraged by negative remarks of others. Discouragement kills personal power. If there are people in your environment who constantly discourage you, Learn to immunize yourself to their remarks. Counter them with positive suggestions of your own. Censor their remarks at the threshold of your mind by not giving them reality or emotional value. 6. Build strongly within yourself the will to live. There is a will to live and a will to die in the human consciousness. To desire life is to have a high purpose in life. Subconsciously, if you are frustrated, suppressed, unhappy, discouraged, and negative, the will to die may supersede the will to live. This often gives a negative personality and creates a condition of lassitude and indifference. Personal power is not possible under the impetus of this negative drive. Find purpose if there is none. Create interest if interest has waned. No matter how young or how old, how rich or how poor, there must be a keen desire to live, to attain some new objective in life. Look about you and see what you can do to create good for the world. You will find new power added to your life in proportion to your desire to assist others. 7. Plant mental seeds and give them time to germinate. We have said the mind is like a garden. Seeds must be planted constantly. Make your plans, plant the seeds, Desire, daydream, wish, pray, hope, or imagine. Use any of these means for planting the new seeds, but do not allow these seeds to starve for want of nourishment in the garden of your mind. Do not dig them up to see if they are sprouting. Many people do this before an idea has become rooted in the consciousness. They become doubtful, fearful, discouraged, and dig it up, and plant another seed or idea in its place. 
This leads to sterility. Plant the seed, then water it with inspiration and fertilize it with more and more mental food. Knowledge. It will be found that all the seeds planted in the mind will thrive and grow if constant new information and knowledge is absorbed by the mind. 8. Use the powers you now possess. No matter how seemingly limited your mental and physical attributes, begin with what you now possess. What hast thou in thine house is the Bible injunction. You have some gift, some knowledge, and some capabilities. Find out what these qualities are, and then get to work to increase them. Remember that everything grows by usage, whether it be a muscle or a brain. You to gain in personal power if you begin today to use the limited faculties you have. As you use them, new powers will develop, and finally you will be amazed at the ability you possess to perform the tasks you choose. 9. Bring the power of love to all acts of life. Love and you shall be loved. All love is mathematically just, as much as the two sides of an algebraic equation. Emerson spoke a truth when he said the above. Love causes power to blossom in the most starved and barren mind and heart. If you can adopt the impersonal attitude toward the world, of loving all creatures alike, it is more powerful than even the limited concept of personal love. Never stop loving as long as you live, for to stop is to stagnate. To love is to live, and to live is to love. It is the creative force of the universe and can be constructively used to increase the personal power of anyone who sincerely and unselfishly applies it. Love of family, country, the world. Love of beauty, love of virtues, love of happiness, love of God. These and all their many ramifications all contribute to the elevation of the human consciousness to new and divine realms and help increase your personal power. They elevate the mind to exhilarating heights and give to life new meaning and vitality. Luther Burbank, who was able to turn nature's products into hundreds of new varieties, well knew the value of this impersonal love. He once said, as you hold loving thoughts toward every person and animal, and even toward plants, stars, oceans, rivers, and hills, and as you are helpful and of service to the world, so you will find yourself growing more happy each day, and with that happiness comes health and everything you want. Chapter 8 Open New Portals to Prosperity Prosperity means the state of being prosperous, to be successful, fortunate, to succeed, thrive, or turn out well. It also means to advance or gain in anything good or desirable, to progress in life, or to attain some object desired. In its broadest sense, we mean prosperity to include all that is good for the individual's growth and happiness. There are certain elements which go to create a prosperous condition. These same conditions apply to the prosperous individual, community, state, nation, or world. When these requisites are supplied, there is a perfect expression of the powers inherent in man to create for the good of self, and more important, for the good of the world. We will study the principles embodied in the attainment of any type of prosperity. There are certain keys which open the inner portals to attainment, and by knowing these keys, we may instantly use them to motivate the conditions necessary to prosperous and happy living. First key, knowledge. Knowledge means literally to know, to be acquainted with fact or a state of being aware of something. It means also to possess information about one or many things. Accumulated knowledge leads to wisdom, and wisdom is the sum total of knowledge derived from a study of life, nature, people, and books. How shall man gather knowledge? What purpose is it? Must knowledge be merely academic or book knowledge? There are as many different methods of acquiring knowledge as there are individuals. The most commonly accepted methods of learning are admitted to be through the five senses. We see and are aware with the brain, not the eyes. What we see depends entirely on the brain for interpretation. After we see and are cognizant, the knowledge we thus acquire does no good unless it is stored, cross-indexed, and ready for instant use. A process of reasoning, then, must be applied to all learning. Each new fact acquired through sight, sound, smell, touch, and hearing must be analyzed and the trivial discarded, 
whereas the important must be stored. To store a fact and make it peculiarly one's own, it is necessary that it have a related value to the individual's life. It must admit of arousing an emotional response. The brain must be put into a state of receptivity. We might look at the Grand Canyon of Colorado for days without gaining any comprehensive knowledge about it. If, however, it hits one with an emotional impact of its majesty, beauty, mystery or origin, it becomes the first key to the opening of many doors to new knowledge. The history and background might be adduced, books studied on the geographical location and geological structure of the canyon. By a process of reasoning, thinking, reading and studying, much new knowledge may be gathered which is important, not only in relation to the particular subject being studied, but about many related subjects, which add to the sum total of knowledge accumulated by an individual. This acquisitive faculty of mind is then applied to other spheres of life, with the final result being measured in greater capacity, more concentration, definiteness of purpose, expanded consciousness, elevated mentality, and more alert senses. These are a few of the additional benefits that may be garnered in the deliberate accumulation of all forms of knowledge. Second key, self-evaluation. To know also implies that the beginning point is to know self. Know thyself is the injunction of all great teachers and philosophers. To know self then is in itself a lifetime job, as self is constantly undergoing changes, reactions to internal and external stimuli, facing new hazards and experiences, which necessitate a state of eternal vigilance being maintained by the individual. Self-evaluation means not only to know yourself, but to know your limitations as well as your possibilities. Perhaps you are setting too low a value on yourself. This is as destructive as placing too high a value on your personality, talents, and worth. If we have an exalted opinion of self with nothing to back it up, we are apt to fail. If, on the other hand, we have talent, knowledge, personality, and qualities that we underestimate, we can do irreparable harm to ourselves. Self-evaluation means then adding first to your sum total of knowledge so that the self may truly possess value. The self is the combined mental, physical, and spiritual experience of the individual. When you have worked to elevate self in these three separate realms, you may truly set a high value on your gifts and demand from the world the recognition and rewards you deserve. Third key, service. Man is not created for self-enjoyment alone. There are two purposes in living, one for self-preservation, the other for race preservation. Unless both functions are fulfilled, man fails in his duty to the Creator. How then may man add his constructive gifts to the cosmic plan? by being of service to the world. This form of creative expression begins first within man's own family and gradually extends to the entire range of his acquaintances, social and business, and to the world. When man is imbued with this high creative purpose, he releases a tremendous creative force which rapidly extends to those in his environment it creates, first for him and then for others, the positive conditions for happier, fuller living. All great men and women are filled with this creative impulse to be of service to mankind. If it was not a conscious motivating force, it was an underlying and subconscious one. If it clothed itself in the seemingly selfish desire to make a great fortune, even that ambition must of necessity by reflection assist the world. Who shall say that the great fortunes of an Andrew Carnegie, Rockefeller, and Ford have not directly contributed to the happiness and well-being of the world? Service, then, wherein time and energy is given to elevating the human race, becomes one of the great keys to the portals of prosperity. Fourth key, honesty. Honesty is one of the greatest of all keys to prosperity. If you are honest with yourself, honest in your dealings with others, it is amazing how responsive the world is to that one single trait of character. We may not think ourselves dishonest, we would not deliberately cheat a man out of money, we would not intentionally steal, and yet we are dishonest in many little ways. The effect is just the same in creating a reaction which inevitably acts against our state of prosperity. How many times we give less than we take, of time, energy, effort, and goods? We often take our employer's money at the end of the week, 
But during the working hours, we shirk our tasks, find excuses to slow down, expend as little effort as possible. We wonder then why we do not progress. There is a universal intelligence, and it is one of the best bookkeepers and accountants in the world. When you punch the time clock, this intelligence does not stop observing what you do. It follows you about your tasks, is aware of the things you think and the things you do. The intelligence is within you. It is external also, but the two work hand in hand. Within you, this force is conscience. When you accumulate a group of dishonest acts or thoughts, they notify the sensor of your brain and body. This sensor instantly gets to work and notifies your nerves, brain, blood, organs, and cells. The glands react, the circulation becomes impeded, the organs slow down their work, and we are punished with either temporary indisposition or over a period of years with a complete mental or physical breakdown. We cannot cheat the world. We cannot think dishonesty without this toll being taken from brain and body. Police cases exist by the thousands as mute testimony to this retaliatory force within the criminal's own mind and body. Finally, under the driving impetus of conscience's whiplash, the guilty culprit is either led to perform some stupid act, which leads to his arrest and conviction, or to a confession of his crime. It then becomes easier for him to accept imprisonment or even death itself than the relentless fury of an awakened and rebellious conscience. Many cases of murder, violence, and theft have thus been revealed. There is a saying that the man who commits a crime might as well live in a universe made of glass. He may never be discovered by society, but his destruction is completed by the intelligence he has violated, which exists within himself. Fifth key, vision. Vision is here intended for that state of consciousness that admits of extended vision beyond the limitations of the organ of sight. Most people are of a limited capacity. They are not able to see the broader vision, the bigger job, the happier environment. They are so blinded by the so-called reality of matter and the limitations set by the five senses that they are wholly incapable of creating a picture of unlimited scope within their minds. Vision is of two types, the personal and the impersonal. When it is limited to the personal type, everything must have personal reference. We see only those persons, scenes, and situations directly related to our physical selves. We are then unable to adopt the broader view of the impersonal, where we see ourselves related to the entire universe. When this type of vision is cultivated, man becomes an instrument for creating infinite riches for the good of the world, not for limited self. When this type of vision is unlocked, the spiritual forces within man and the universal intelligence, external to man, as well as within him, begin to work to create the finished picture that is embodied in the vision. To be visionary implies that man exercise the mental faculty of imagination. But vision is more than mere imagination. It is the actual creation of an entire life experience. To imagine is to limit the experience to a situation or a person, to some unevolved idea, or to calling up a picture that does not exist in reality. Vision is more concrete. It embodies the creative principle of casting into a mold or pattern an entire set of experiences, emotions, and concepts, and creating them in reality. Develop broad vision, then. See your life as being a complete and perfect one. See your talents as being highly developed, your life as being constructive and creative. As you are able to envision, so you are given the power to create in the image and likeness of your vision. Sixth key, desire. No list of keys to open the portals of prosperity could be complete without studying the most miraculous key of all, desire. Desire is an actual emotion, for desire means to wish for ardently, to long for, to actively wish to possess. When the desires are kindled to a high pitch, the body's energies rise in proportion. Desire expresses itself on many planes, as love, wish fulfillment, or ambition for the attainment of a goal. Whatever manner it expresses itself, it is certain to create mind and body energy. If the desire is high or noble, it creates correspondingly greater energy or power. Desires that are merely sensual may have creative power too, and potent power at that. 
but such desire leads to a limited type of attainment which depends solely on the physical or material type of prosperity. To desire success is natural and good. To desire happiness is instinctive. To desire health and vitality, love, happiness, friends, social prominence and financial security, these are all inherent desires in man. To add to these physical and material desires the additional spiritual impetus of desiring wisdom, good, truth, justice, charity, beauty and faith, is to add another octave to the keyboard of life, and to create more melodious harmonies than when desire is limited in range and scope. Seventh Key Dream or Ideal of Life The function of dreaming with the eyes wide open is called daydreaming. To daydream or create an ideal state of consciousness, to imbue reality with a spiritual aura of beauty and dreamlike passivity, is at times desirable. Only when the dream is used as an excuse to hide from reality, to escape moral, social, or physical obligation, is it possibly dangerous to live in the idealized state of consciousness known as the dream. It is obvious that constructive dreams are merely basic mental patterns, which man uses for the purpose of evolving higher and higher in the scale of life. Man must have dreamed of living in houses above the earth when he was still living in damp caves back in prehistoric times. Man learned to fly by first dreaming of flying, and to swim beneath the surface of the ocean, before he perfected the submarine. Dreams have built financial and industrial empires, created works of art, literary masterpieces, built bridges and skyscrapers, discovered drugs and chemicals, mined gold and iron, and manifested from the invisible state of nothingness, the myriad forms of creation which crown the earth. To dream then, especially if that dream is clothed in idealism, is to create a picture. When that picture is fully formed, the visible and invisible agencies of the universe rush to make the dream a living reality. Dream then of the ideal, the perfect, the healthy and happy, the created thing you desire, the state of financial security you wish, for these dreams will inevitably clothe themselves in the garments of reality and become the living forces you have envisioned. Eighth Key Diligence Diligence is a key that can often open the portals to prosperity when many other keys are lacking. Lucky is he who possesses one or more of these keys in addition to diligence. To be diligent means to pursue tirelessly an ideal or dream. Not only pursue, but to pursue to a successful conclusion. The diligent man or woman with little talent may have a greater success than the talented person without diligence. To be diligent implies application to the task at hand. Never give up the ideal you set. Apply yourself constantly to its fulfillment. Think of the diligence it took to build the Great Pyramid at Giza, the diligence that must have gone into the creation of Boulder Dam, the Empire State Building, the Golden Gate Bridge, all notable examples of the creations which man can attribute to this positive key to the portals of prosperity. When others play, diligent study assures you of future progress. While others laugh at your ambition, your diligent application gives you added power to pursue your dream. When relatives discourage you, your diligent pursuit of the difficult task will cause it to yield its rich reward. Diligence is the mother of good fortune, Cervantes said. And Samuel Johnson said almost the same thing when he wrote, Few things are impossible to diligence and skill. Ninth Key Self-control this last key to the portals to prosperity might well be first on our list, so vitally important is it to the creation of happiness and well-being. Self-control implies first control of mind, second, control of body. It must follow that body will be controlled if mind is controlled. As body depends on mind for its successful function, it is obvious that for a state of good health, for following a pattern of success, for attaining a condition of mind and body known as happiness, the mind must yield to control. What then, or who shall control the mind? It must fall within the scope of the self. This implies two minds, one that makes the decision to control, the other subjecting itself to this superior authority. Much space in this book is devoted to this type of self-control, for upon it depends the successful performance of the entire brain and body mechanism. 
To attain perfect self-control, it is vital that we learn to escape from the maddening throng on occasion and seek the deeper meaning of life within ourselves. In a solitary quiet room, where we may meditate alone, the mind may be brought to a condition of dead still calm, and the spiritual voice within may be heard more distinctly. Control of the self implies, too, control of others. The world cannot affect one with its constant wars, depressions, and frightening changes of scene. We find that inner tranquility of which Whittier spoke. And so I find it well to come for deeper rest to this still room, for here the habit of the soul feels less the outer world's control. Self-control then leads to further conquests in life. We fail to be disturbed by trivia and distraction of everyday occurrences. We fail to be dislodged from our spiritual contemplation of the everlasting grandeur of the human soul by the petty mouthings of malicious men. We find the solitude desirable, and the oncoming years hold no terror. For mind becomes the sacred sanctuary of the hidden self, and solace lies in memory, imagination, and reverie. Self-reverence, self-knowledge, self-control, these three alone lead to life, to sovereign power. Tennyson Chapter 9 The Art of Successful Creative Assertion The ego is the balance wheel of man's brain. The ego is the identity of the soul, the creative principle within man. In it is embodied the intelligence, race memory, instinctual functions, and regulatory mechanism of the brain and body. The ego is the I am principle in action. It is imbued with power of divine authority and may assert any state or condition of identity which it may conceive. When this ego is trained to creatively assert the conditions of its being, the individual rises to new heights of power. Let us explore this creative power then and study how we may use it for creative assertions that are beneficial to self and the world. It must be strictly understood that the ego of which we speak is the spiritual identity in man. There is a duality which constantly expresses itself in the unevolved being. The ego becomes animal consciousness when it is allowed to disintegrate under the impetus of sensuality, emotionalism, or licentious living. As the sole purpose of life is the evolvement from the so-called natural state to one of spiritual consciousness, the ego, too, must pass through this transformation from the natural to the more highly evolved consciousness. As this ego within takes on the suggestions of the conscious mind, it remains with man then, as to what quality, condition, or situation he shall suggest to the ego. The creative principles which possess positive power for constructive good will be given in detail. They must be applied daily to the overcoming of whatever negative situation exists or for the attainment of whatever quality or gift is desired. The ego clothes itself in these creative assertions and manifests them in the voice, posture, personality, and general conduct of the individual. First creative assertion. I can do anything that any man has done. Repeat this over and over until it becomes so deeply ingrained in your consciousness that the ego is indelibly stamped with the rhythm and reality of the assertion. It is true that you are as unlimited as time and space itself. When you gain this knowledge, you will instantly have supremacy over all of life's negative forces. The great men and women of all time have only been human beings, but instead of an ordinary human ego, they possess the unlimited consciousness of the spiritual ego. This spiritual ego is the divine creative intelligence. If it flows through you, it must give you its unlimited creative power. For good. The great discoveries of electricity, radium, gravity, motor power, radio, television, and the harnessing of these forces by man was possible only because men creatively asserted that they could conquer the forces of nature. When the ego is inspired or elevated through creative suggestion, it is able to attract to itself the necessary power to attain the fulfillment of any dream or ambition. Many negative suggestions will occur to you when you begin this positive regime of creative assertion. Your ego will answer that you are limited by lack of education, by poverty, by age or youth. Some excuse will present itself readily, for the negative is always trying to negate the positive. That is the time for you to firmly assert that you can do anything that any other person can. 
There is no age limit to genius, talent, or power. You must truly believe this, otherwise you will not impress it forcibly upon your ego. Second creative assertion. I respect myself and know that I am worthy of high attainment. Man often possesses a guilt complex, which keeps him from freely expressing his natural powers. These guilt complexes may arise from past states of consciousness, mistakes, moral infractions, dishonesty, or other weaknesses of the past. As long as these stand in the way and the self feels itself not worthy of the rewards life can bestow, the ego must be restricted and limited by these feelings. The world will not give you great gifts or high achievement unless it can respect you. To have the respect of the world, you must have self-respect first. To attain this self-respect, you must put your mental and spiritual house in order. You must overcome your past indiscretions and weaknesses, atone for the moral and spiritual blights on your mind or soul, find some worthy goal which makes it possible for you to help the world. These things help you win respect for self and help elevate the ego in the eyes of the world. What your ego thinks of you is clearly shown in your expression, your eyes, voice, and gestures. The person who has no self-respect has shifting eyes, lowered head, and nervous gait. When the ego is creatively elevated to its rightful recognition of its inherent divinity, there is poise and confidence, a deep sense of inner tranquility and outer calm. Third creative assertion. I can do anything that I wish to do. It is one thing to believe that you can do anything any man can do, but still another to assert that you can do anything that you wish to do. To really wish to do a thing is to desire, to create ambition to accomplish the thing you would like to attain. When this creative assertion is made over and over, it becomes deeply embedded in the subconscious mind. Finally, it begins to work through the active will and motivates the actions in such a way that the deed is accomplished. Let your desire lead you step by step, from the little things to the big attainment. Power is built by doing those things we can do easily first, then gradually attempting the more difficult task, until finally we have reached the peak of attainment. Fourth, creative assertion. I have faith in myself and my destiny. When the ego is built to a position of power, it must have faith in itself and its destiny. Constant reiteration of that faith is essential, for discouragement creeps in unawares and stifles the natural flow of power through the mind. Faith implies confidence. Without confidence in self, there is no faith. It is essential then that confidence be built in everything that you do. Because you are divinely created, you can be divinely inspired. And if you are divinely inspired, you need not fear failure. Having faith in yourself means that your power will be intensified and that you will reflect divinity in your thoughts and acts. No matter how the world may attack and shatter your high principles, your ideas and dreams, no matter how you may be persecuted and reviled, no matter how your friends or relatives may turn against you, if you have faith in yourself, in the world, and in your God, you are sure to triumph in the end. Faith gives radiance to the personality. It is a transcendent joy that enlivens the flesh and gives new meaning to life. When you lose faith, you die mentally and physically. When you have faith in people, they will have faith in you. If you have faith in your work and are faithful to your cause, you may be sure it will repay you richly. Faith is contagious and spreads to those in your environment. It imbues them with a desire to live up to your faith. Thus faith is reciprocal and like a boomerang, returns to you the quality you send forth. Fifth, creative assertion. I trust the guidance of my inner voice. There is no external voice can guide you as intelligently as your own inner voice. This is a spiritual voice which comes to some as a keen intuition, to others as conscience, and still to others as a small voice speaking deep within the self. No one can tell you what is good or bad for you, that choice remains entirely up to you. No matter how much your relatives, husband or wife, friends or acquaintances would like to tell you what is good or bad for you, they are not properly equipped to so advise you. To each person is given this inner voice. It speaks when the conscious voice is stilled and when the outer clamor has abated. 
we find it by retiring within the self to the sanctuary of the soul. There we may commune with the guiding intelligence of the universe. If we really ask for guidance and listen intently to the still small voice, we will unerringly be guided correctly. It is essential, however, that we first clear the human and animal ego from its confusing discord, that we find the principles of honesty, justice, fairness, and the other spiritual qualities. The spiritual voice departs when the human or animal ego dominates. We cannot hear God speak when the physical voice raises its incessant cry. Some of the greatest minds in the world have listened to this inner voice of intuition. Edison consulted it when his inventions did not work out satisfactorily. Mozart gave it credit for many of his great compositions, saying they simply came to him out of thin air. Galileo listened to it for his discovery of the telescope. Columbus believed in it and let it guide him across the Atlantic to discover new lands. Joan of Arc was lead to conquest by this insistent voice within. Buddha testifies to this inner voice, as does Confucius and Muhammad. It is a well-known fact that Christ often alluded to this father within the voice that guided him and which gave him his power. Sixth Creative Assertion I alone know what is best for me. When you have found this spiritual inner voice and know how to listen to its guiding message, assert then to your ego that you alone know what is best for you. That career you have chosen, those steps you have taken, that goal you have set if you believe in them, it does not matter how the world discourages you, your ego will assist you carry through all obstacles to the full attainment of your goal. Many events exist in the outer world. You alone can choose those events which fit into the mosaic of your life. Let that choice then be with the creative assertion that you know what it is that you need to complete this life plan. And when you have once selected these events, do not deviate from your guiding star. Seventh, creative assertion. I do not accept failure or discouragement. To inculcate success thoughts in your ego, it is vital that you creatively assert your ability to rise over all discouragement and failure. There may be times when you are seemingly failing, and that is the decisive moment to make your positive creative assertion. A failure establishes only this, that our determination to succeed was not strong enough, Bouvy said. And this is true. A little more determination will overcome this tendency to discouragement and will give you new courage to try again and again. When seeming failure comes, remember it is only delayed success. There are up and down cycles in all life. Every inhalation has its exhalation, the incoming tide has its outgoing ebb, every civilization has its succession and regression. This pattern of cyclical recurrence exists in seasons, biological cycles, tree growth, harvests, and geological patterns. Man, too, is subject to this law of cyclical regularity. In that downbeat of the life pulsation, when the mental and physical forces are low, prepare the mind and body for the positive upbeat so soon to come. That is the period to study and grow, to develop spiritual resources, so that when the cycle completes itself, you will be ready to take advantage of the new opportunity for growth and expansion. Remember in nature how many maple seeds fall from the mother tree before one finds fertile soil, how many acorns are wasted before one anchors and grows to maturity. Many pearls are created never to adorn a crown, and thousands of nature's most worthwhile products bloom unseen. So too, every idea man has cannot come to full fruition. There must be a veritable prodigality of thoughts, dreams, and ambitions. Nature gives generously of her goods. So, too, man must give liberally of his talents, time, energies, and thoughts before even one comes to full fruition and brings its rich rewards. You possess within yourself a million universes still unborn, a multitude of ideas still untried, thousands of inspirations struggling to burst forth into flaming incandescence. Creatively assert then to this indwelling ego the power you possess and it will crown your efforts with success. Chapter 10. Dream, Dare, and Do Action is the first law of the universe. Without action, there is no life. The verbs dream, dare, and do designate action and imply that one must put into motion the principles studied in this book. To know or possess knowledge is one thing, 
but to do nothing about it is another. Until that knowledge is applied intelligently to life's problems, there is no involvement on the mental, physical, or spiritual planes. What is your dream in life? Everything created was once someone's dream. Without dreams, there could be no creation. The dream is the ideal that man possesses. Everyone knows what it is to daydream, for as children we lived in a world of fantasy or daydreams. There are two types of daydreams. 1. The active daydream. 2. The passive daydream. There is value in both. For many times the passive daydream becomes caught up in the fiber of our being and is translated into future action. Generally speaking, passive daydreaming is apt to prove harmful rather than constructive, for it leads to an escapism from life which is often deleterious in its effects. It was idle speculation or daydreaming which first caused Newton to ponder over the reason for an apple falling to earth. If this had remained in the realm of the passive dream, it is doubtful if he would have done anything to evolve the great universal law of gravity. Columbus dreamed of a world beyond the limited horizon of his age, and he no doubt indulged in that fantasy until the time was ripe for him to carry his so-called ridiculous plan into action. That action resulted in the voyages which lead to the discovery of new worlds. An example of daydreaming which failed to materialize centuries earlier is that of the airplane. Leonardo da Vinci dreamed of a device that would overcome gravity and went so far as to create a clumsy instrument that failed to fly. This was partial fulfillment of his daydream through action, but when it injured one of his housemen who prematurely flew it, the instrument was branded by the townspeople as evil and demolished. The Wright brothers translated that dream and other men's dreams of a flying machine into action, persistent action, not spasmodic, and the daydream became a living reality. Daydreaming is another form of imagining. It carries the imagination a step further into the actual conception of the thing imagined when the dream is harnessed into action. It is vital, then, that you possess a daydream. Ask yourself these questions about that dream. 1. Is your dream something high and noble? 2. Will it elevate the consciousness of the world? Three. Do you give that dream reality by attempting to live it? 4. Are you indulging in passive dreams without action? 5. Do you hide behind your daydream and escape from reality? 6. Do you keep your dream secret from the world? 1. The High and Noble Dream When you hold your dream aloof from commonness, vulgarity and cheapness, you will be given new power to attain it fully. If you constantly visualize yourself as being more and more perfect, more happy, healthy, successful and spiritual, you are bound to translate those qualities into the living reality of your activated dream. If you dream of attaining fame and fortune to help the world, there is no harm in such a picture. You may put that daydream into an active state and realize its fulfillment. If, on the other hand, there is a desire for fame and fortune for reasons of self-aggrandizement, overindulgence in food and drink, and sensual living, for boastfulness and egoistic satisfaction, there is apt to be less propulsive power to carry the daydream into the realm of reality. 2. Elevating the Consciousness of the World Ambition for power to help the world is commendable. Such dreams have inspired great men and women, like Florence Nightingale. Jane Addams of Hull House in Chicago, Booker T. Washington, the only Negro to date, admitted to the exclusive Hall of Fame, and other men and women whose dreams have helped improve the world. When we contribute one iota of information, happiness, help, or encouragement to the world, we are elevating and ennobling the human race. To daydream of power for the purpose of conquering a nation, such as a Napoleon, is less commendable than to dream of and institute an educational system for the underprivileged children of the world. To dream of glory and success so that one may win high social laurels is less valuable for the world than using such success for the purpose of bringing about social equality and justice among the peoples of the earth. The more cosmic our dreams, 
the more power for good they possess. To attain this high estate of dreaming, it is vitally important that we work to fully develop all the potentials within self first. The mental quality thus engendered must of necessity color our dreams and actions. 3. Give your dream reality. We have said it is one thing to dream passively without translating that dream into action, and another to imbue that dream with vital action. Many an artist lies starving in a garret, not because artists must starve, but because they do not possess the intelligence to convert their dreams into positive action. An artist who has the big dream of painting a startling canvas, but who puts off the reality of beginning that canvas, might as well put away his brushes and forget his dream. The artist who has his dream and is inspired by its beauty and inspirational value to the world is more apt to begin his task of making that dream into a living reality. Begin, then, to make that dream live today. Do not put off any longer the beginning of activating that dream. Take the first step. Buy the brushes and canvas, go to the art school and enroll. And if you lack the finances, attend some free course in some convenient evening school. If you wish to play the piano, save the first dollar toward buying a piano. Take the lessons, practice daily. Begin to study that course in business of which you dream. You cannot hope to become the executive or own your own business until you take that first active step, which can bridge the gap between the dream and reality. No doctor ever practices medicine until he has first prepared for his work. No lawyer ever won a case until he first studied legal procedure. Bridges are not built, buildings erected, nor concertos written in the mind alone. They are first formulated, created, dreamed of, step by step within the brain, and then, when the pattern is perfectly evolved, the necessary physical steps are taken almost automatically. It is said of the man who built the Brooklyn Bridge that he dreamed of it in such detail before a single plan was drawn, that he knew every aspect of that vast structure in his mind before the workmen assembled to begin building. 4. Daydreaming Without Action if you are merely indulging in passive daydreaming without action, it is doubtful if you will ever see your dream fulfilled. It is not always possible to leap to the top of the ladder overnight. It is one thing to dream of singing at the Metropolitan Opera or appearing in concert with the Philharmonic Symphony in Carnegie Hall and another thing to actually attain that ambition. The steps between the dream and its fulfillment are numerous and often precarious. Everyone who holds such a big dream does not have the full power to attain it. This is due to many factors. First, be sure that your dream is a practical one. This takes great self-knowledge. Is your voice really the operatic caliber that you think it is, or are you only indulging in wishful thinking? If you do possess the necessary talent and can bridge the gap between the dream and actually fulfilling it, there are grave doubts that this can be accomplished overnight. Try your hand at small things first. Little dreams are easier to live up to than big ones. They are practice for the final attempt at attaining the ultimate goal. These small attainments really give you confidence and build your resourcefulness. Back of all great careers, there are often from five to 10 years of painstaking planning, studying and dreaming. The overnight success is a misnomer. In exceptional cases, recognition appears to come quickly but they are the exception rather than the general rule. Then, as you set these small goals and attain them, the big dream comes into closer perspective and seems less formidable and more possible of attainment. What if you fail in attaining this dream? Does it mean that you have irretrievably failed? No, it means rather that you have merely put off the final big goal to a more convenient time when you shall be more prepared to make another attempt. 5. Hiding Behind Your Daydream Many failures, so-called, are merely hiding behind their daydream. They have tried to aim too high. They have often been unprepared, misguided and mistaken in their original estimate. To compensate for this so-called failure, they hide behind a veil of excuses. They are the people who are always saying, you have to know a producer to get into radio, stage or pictures. 
It's impossible to have a book published for the editors and publishers have their pets. You must know someone to get you into an executive position. The capitalists are keeping me down because they resent seeing workers get power. The system of government is against me, as it favors only big business. My relatives keep me back. I had a sick mother or father, and that burdened me financially. I didn't have the money to take the course. I didn't have the time to complete my education. I didn't have the health or strength to go through with it. My work was so good that the big shots were all jealous of it and deliberately suppressed it. These are the excuses of the escapists who have failed. If they are examined minutely, it will be seen that they are sheer fabrications without truth or foundation. They are escape techniques to keep from admitting that the dream did not materialize. Many times, this escapism leads one to assume sickness in order to have a logical excuse for failure. This is a dangerous practice and should be exposed ruthlessly. When once discovered, the individual may overcome the tendency and once again hold his daydream high as a guiding beacon to lead him to his goal. 6. Valve of Secrecy It is important that you have sufficient power to create the necessary action for fulfilling your dream. Power comes through secrecy. When you have a dream and it is in the first stages of being formulated, be certain that it is kept a secret from the entire world. The oyster proceeds in secret to build its pearl. The acorn bursts from its confining shell in the secret places of the earth. The child is conceived in the safety and secrecy of the mother's womb. All nature contrives to create in secret. You too must recognize this universal law. Tell others of your dream and you dissipate the energy needed to carry out its conception. The very fact that others discourage you tends to decrease your mental and physical energy and weakens your resolve to carry your plans through to completion. The jealousy or envy of even well-meaning friends may cause them to depreciate your plans or abilities and cause you to become discouraged. Practice secrecy in the initial stages of your dream and reveal it only when it is on the verge of completion. When the dream is firmly embedded in the consciousness, it is time to apply the other two stages to its fulfillment. You must dare, and you must do something about it. 1. Dare to claim your inheritance from life. You have long dreamed of financial security, a home of your own, a better job, a raise in salary. But have you dared to claim these gifts from life? You may fear that these gifts do not exist, but that is an erroneous impression. The universal intelligence that rules the earth has created more than man can ever use. There is so much supply that man can never begin to exhaust the earth's productivity. You must have the courage to attempt to file your claim for the divine heritage that has been bestowed upon you. Rid your consciousness of the limited concept that there is not sufficient of this world's goods to go around. There is enough, but you must be so filled with your dream that you take the active steps of daring to do something about your dream. Create something new. Inspire yourself with such high ideals that you will be guided to your success. It takes only a little faith in your dream to cause you to have such determination that you will make that dream come true. It only took a little faith in oil to cause Rockefeller to make his dream come true. Andrew Carnegie had faith in steel. Ford believed in cars. Burbank had faith in plants. Liggett claimed his inheritance in drugs. And Kellogg found his in foods. There must be something in which you have faith, and when you have found it, you can lay claim to your inheritance. Many men have had nothing but a small patch of ground, and by having faith in it, and claiming it as their inheritance, they have attained lifelong security. 2. Dare to approach others with your proposition. There is someone in the world who needs the idea or dream you have, who has the money to help you launch a new project or who will be grateful to you for the genuinely progressive idea you present. But you must have the daring to approach the person first. They will not hide from you. They are as anxious to find you as you are to find them. Capital needs labor as much as labor needs capital. Money needs new ideas as much as they need money. 
Men need dreams and visions to create new projects, and who knows, yours may be the revolutionary one that the world is waiting for. Recognize it first, and then dare to let others know about it. 3. Dare to believe that there are still unexplored fields for your talents. There are any new opportunities awaiting man's discovery. It is said that since the discovery of atomic disintegration, over 20,000 new inventions will now be patented. There are limitless horizons for the person who believes there are. It takes daring to set out onto uncharted seas. It takes courage to blaze new trails, but the rewards are commensurate with the effort expended. 4. Dare to take action toward your objective. We cannot arrive at a goal if we do not begin. If we are paralyzed with fear or lack of confidence, we are certain to fail in our purpose in life. The best intentions are of no avail unless we add to them action, so dare to begin a course of action today to liberate yourself from the restrictions that are strangling your dream. A. Seek within yourself for the clue to action. Make the first move and the second will be easier. B. Desire so intently that your actions must follow. C. Dominate life. Do not let life dominate you. D. Break the effect of the law of gravity which causes you to be a satellite revolving in a limited orbit. E. Talk back to relatives that are dominating you. E. See the boss for the raise you know you deserve. G. Move out of the environment which is intolerable. H. Take the singing, art, music, dancing, writing lessons you have been putting off so long. I. Buy the house or rent the apartment you desire. These are active steps which require courage. When you take one or more of them, you will grow in daring and strength. As you fulfill the law of action more and more, you will find that life moves to meet you halfway, and the attainment of your dream becomes actually easier than you had hoped. Chapter 11 Power of Constructive Thinking What is constructive thinking? It is the ability to think in a pattern that leads to positive conclusions. It is also affirmative or positive thinking. When our thoughts are patterned along negative lines, they tend to destroy. If your mind is filled with thoughts of failure, you set the entire pattern of your brain and body for the actual physical act of failing. If your thoughts are constantly on sickness, the pattern of your brain is flashed to every atom and cell of your physical body and the message is imprinted on the cells. Those cells soon change their life-giving, healthful contents to death-dealing, poisonous elements which set to work to complete the destructive job started by your mind. Negative thinking destroys. Positive thinking constructs. Your thinking is stimulated by two different agencies. 1. External events or outer stimuli. 2. Internal conscious or subconscious mentation or self-induced stimuli. It is vitally important that you select only those external events which are constructive and positive. There are many external scenes or events which are destructive in their effect. There are wars, depressions, ugly surroundings, sickness, poverty, and unhappiness. Shall your consciousness select these negative conditions and incorporate them into the structure of your thinking? Not if you are trying to build your thoughts and life into constructive, positive patterns. You can consciously choose the people, events, reading matter, sights and sounds, which you wish your conscious and subconscious minds to feed upon. Let them be positive in nature, and you need not fear the destructive elements of life. You need not fear failure, sickness and unhappiness. What are the internal conscious states which are self-induced? They can be positive or negative constructive or destructive also. These thoughts which build themselves into the very fiber of your being can be constructive ones, or they can be so colored with destructiveness that they infest your consciousness with their malignant properties. Such thoughts emanate from the imagination, through your emotional states, from memory, intuition, and even inspiration. If these thought emanations are positive in nature, they must inevitably reflect in your character and as character forms destiny, they must unerringly mold your destiny. 
Thinking leads to action. If your thoughts are of a negative nature, they must lead to negative action. If your thoughts are unhappy, then it follows that unhappy action ensues. If your thoughts are destructive of crime, murder, war, and bloodshed, it is only natural that the actions will be patterned after these thoughts. If the thoughts are of sickness and personal tragedy, they will eventually lead to illness and unhappiness. Constructive thinking must be positive thinking. Think of success, and you will do the things that lead you to success. Think of making friends, and you will automatically do the friendly things and say the positive words that form a magnetic attraction between you and others. Think of making more money or of finding another job, and as your thoughts become more and more positive or constructive, you will unerringly be led to taking the steps which bring the event into existence. Thinking becomes habit, for good or bad. The thoughts you most habitually think become the conditioned reflexes of your brain and body. You withdraw your hand from fire because you have learned that fire burns. So too, habit causes you to automatically perform certain acts which are for your eventual good or which are negative. Form the habit of thinking honest thoughts and you will automatically act under honest compulsions. Form the habit of thinking love thoughts and you will act with love toward others. If, on the other hand, you have trained your mind to think thoughts of evil, dishonesty, lying, cheating, hating, you will naturally embody those destructive thoughts in your words and acts. Others are quick to perceive these negative emotional states and will instantly distrust you. Thus, through your negative habits of thinking, you destroy yourself and your chances for finding happiness and success. Constructive thinking diminishes fatigue. In his book on psychology, William James of Harvard University actually found that those who formed habits of positive and constructive thinking possessed more mental and physical energy and were able to accomplish more than persons who labored under conflicting negative emotional states and destructive thoughts. Make it a point to believe in yourself, for such faith engenders energy and diminishes fatigue. Have an unselfish and constructive life plan, for this also gives added impetus and builds energy. Further psychological tests show that when a man is told to jump over an imaginary hurdle, he falls short of clearing it by several inches, but when the actual hurdle is put into position, he has the additional spurt of energy which causes him to clear it by several inches. What is the difference in energy? It is simply that the thoughts are concentrated on a definite goal, and purposefulness expresses itself in constructive thinking, which leads to an excess of energy in mind and body. It is found, too, that hope and optimism help build energy. These constructive thoughts overcome the tendency of the human mind to look on the dark side of life. Three main ingredients for building constructive thoughts. Someone has said, sympathy, wisdom, and poise seem to be the three ingredients that are most needed in forming the master man. No man is great who does not possess sympathy. Sympathy, wisdom, and poise are constructive mind forces. When we are sympathetic to others, we are led to a course of conduct which causes us to express that sympathy and to win the admiration and constructive help of others. Wisdom is in itself constructive, for it is the accumulated knowledge of a lifetime of investigation of the universal phenomena. Poise is a constructive force, for it causes us to conserve energy, which is often wasted in aimless and nervous pursuits. Constructive thinking possible only with highly evolved intellect. The more highly evolved your intellect, the greater your power to build positive mind forces. To evolve the intellect, one need but study, investigate, constantly grow in the use of past knowledge and the acquisition of new material to feed the mind. The human intellect thrives on additional information. Never stop learning. Never stop questioning, probing for the secrets of life. Some philosopher has written, Cultivate the intellect, and you shall have a mind that produces beautiful thoughts, worthy images, helpful ideas, that will serve as a solace in times of stress and be to you a refuge against all the storms that blow. Positive words build constructive mind power. Words can destroy or create, depending on whether they are positive or negative. Certain physicians have discovered that words are so powerful in their effect on the human consciousness 
that they carefully avoid using names of certain diseases. In actual cases of aged persons, it was discovered that a definite condition of shock was produced by the physician's use of such words as ulcer, cancer, apoplexy, hardening of the arteries, and heart disease. Avoid all words that give a negative or depressing effect, and generously use words that are positive and constructive in nature. List of negative words, the death dealing principles. Discourage dope. Disease destroy. Delusion debase. Death disgust. Degrading dissolute. Despair disparage. Dark disloyalty. Dismal delay. Desolate defective. Depressing discard. Deterring defeat. Discontent defile. Disaster denounce. Destructive deprave. Decay degenerate. Drunkard deteriorate. Dangerous deprive. Dregs devil. It will be observed that the above list all begin with the letter D. There are many other negative words which should be carefully avoided, such as cannot, fear, failure, sick, worry, hate, poor, unhappy, lonely, etc. List of positive words. The life giving principles. Beginning with G for God consciousness. Good goal. Great gentle. Glory graciousness. Gratitude grand. Generosity gain. Glee gallant. Guidance genial. Giving genuine. Growth glad. Gifts grace. Make up a vocabulary of such words as success, radiance, opulence, prosperity, magnificence, happiness, beauty, idealized, love, vision, charity, optimism, healthy, vital, attainment, confidence, poise, tranquility, power, youthful, spiritual, and use them, think them, write them as often as possible. Soon, as you begin to supplant the negative and destructive thoughts that occupy your consciousness, with new and positive thoughts, you will begin to change the power of your mind from a destructive force to a positive, constructive one. Chapter 12 Secret Inner Chambers of Your Mind Man's entire being is suspended or immersed in an etheric substance, which is intelligent and yet invisible. No one can doubt that forces exist in the invisible realm beyond man's physical senses, which operate under fixed and immutable mathematical laws. We have but to know of the gravitational pull of the sun to the other planets in our solar system, the effect of the moon on the tides, the ever-recurring flow of power which motivates the seasons and which brings fertility to the Earth, the electromagnetic fields in the Earth's atmosphere through which flow cosmic and other rays. These alpha, gamma, and ultraviolet rays, though invisible, have a profound effect on man and his destiny. So too, man possesses within himself a great driving intelligence, which is synchronized to this external intelligence or universal power. Mind is a term which is synonymous with universal intelligence. Man reflects only a microscopically small portion of that universal intelligence. The organ which reflects this intelligence is his brain. Mind can be defined for our purposes then as an abstract collective term to include all forms of conscious intelligence, especially the activity or faculty of knowing. The mind is also the intellect or reason, the power of cognition or thought. It may also be said to include the conscious element or factor in the universe defined as spirit or intelligence as contrasted with matter. Mind also includes disposition and states of consciousness or the tendency towards action. Because of mind power, man is a more highly evolved and complicated creation than animal. If he were not so highly organized, he would never have risen higher than the animal propensities of eating, sleeping, drinking, breeding, and living entirely in the realm of the senses. As man is more evolved, he possesses powers of cognition which make him deeply aware of, not only external stimuli, but internal sensations and emotions as well. 
It is this dual nature of man which we shall study, this deeper side of his nature which we wish to explore, the secret inner chambers of his mind. Man possesses these three states of consciousness. 1. Objective mind. 2. Subjective mind. 3. Universal mind. These three mental states exist separately and yet collectively within your own brain. Thoughts may be controlled and directed consciously, or they may direct us subconsciously. The objective state of consciousness is that act of consciously directing your mind toward external things without reference to personal sensations or emotions. Your objective attitude toward life, then, must not be permitted to color your inner self unless you so desire. This is vital, for the external scene is always changing. It is often confusing and chaotic, war-torn, poverty-stricken, and filled with mortal suffering. As these are external conditions, they must be observed as being apart from the real. The permanent, spiritual you, the objective forces of life are transitory and must be given no more importance than any passing scene. Look at people objectively if you wish to truly understand them and get along with them. If you direct your mind toward people without reference to personal sensation, they have little effect on you or your emotions and in the final analysis on your destiny. If, however, you let every person come into your life and change your inner self, affect your emotions, make your decisions, and influence your every act, you will soon let them affect you so radically that they might destroy your plan and purpose in life. Does this mean then merely to view all people with this limited objective mind? No, rather, judgment must be exercised to know and be aware of those evil forces, often expressing themselves through people who might attempt to influence you negatively or who might attempt to steer you on the wrong course in life. If this objective mind power is brought to bear in your relations to people, you do not give them personal power over you and your emotions. You will thus become the master of your temper and of irritability brought about through the actions of others. You will avoid it involvements that threaten your privacy or which infringe upon your destiny. People viewed objectively take on the third dimensional perspective of trees, houses, and other stationary objects. They are robbed of their power to affect or injure you. If people affect your life, if they motivate you, disturb you, make you unhappy, disrupt your consciousness, then you are permitting your objective mind to lose its efficacy. You are allowing personal emotion to color your relationship to these external forces and are giving them power over you. Your work, too, must be viewed with this objective attitude. The mind is able to appraise situations and weigh them. It can sort and choose the events it wishes to harbor. Your work can be a very real and deep part of you. But if you are doing work that is not to your liking, if your environment is unpleasant or the tasks onerous, you have it within your power to negatively adapt yourself to the work by relegating it to your objective mind and not letting it touch the subjective real you. Then, your tasks take on a dreamlike aspect, and your subconscious or automatic mind takes over the duty and relieves you of the necessity of being conscious of the restrictions or painful associations. So, too, business success, popularity, making friends, and even the attainment of bodily health may be functions of this objective mind, giving them an automatic or habit structure. Then they do not truly affect you, disappointments are less keen, and defeats are resolved into mathematical problems which admit of an objective solution. Our next classification is the subjective mind. The subjective mind is the real or permanent you. It is the thinking, feeling part of you. It registers your emotional reactions and determines how you shall respond to internal and external stimuli. We might define subjective mind then as the mental state or ego, that which takes place within the thinking subject, that quality which is imparted by individual mind. Mind is aware, it thinks, I am, and it is subjective, for awareness of ego is a mental state. If it thinks I exist in a state of poverty, it is objective in its appraisal of an outer condition. If this state of poverty causes the ego to react, to be repelled, inhibited, in conflict with its environment, then we may say the purely objective fact of existing in a state of poverty has affected the subjective mind and imbued it with a deep sense of reality. To stimulate your mind then and attain this state of subjective awareness, 
it is essential that you apply a certain method of thinking to all your life experiences. We will now study this subjective approach to life and its various problems. How to put yourself in tune with subjective mind. 1. By studying external experiences in relation to the self. The subjective mind registers impressions, it is aware of people, and it determines what shall affect it emotionally. If the outer experiences are unpleasant, repellent, or disturbing, the subjective is apt to register these facts upon its sensitive consciousness. If, however, these outer forces are seen as external and not permitted to affect the emotions, then the problem is handled by the subjective in an unemotional, cold, and impersonal manner. It then loses its power over you. 2. By studying the inner self in relation to the external conditions of life. A keener sense of perception is developed if the subjective mind explores every subtle emotion and nuance of soul that exists in the consciousness. Then subjective mind makes its adjustment to external conditions, to people, to work, to play, to the entire universe. This becomes a cosmic adjustment. The subjective mind then resolves all personality problems, conflicts, and maladjusted states due to environment, frustration, or heredity. It studies and analyzes the emotions and fortifies itself against the onslaughts of unbalanced emotional forces. It protects the ego and adorns it with dignity, but avoids negative states of fear, self-consciousness, inferiority, and a lack of confidence. 3. By reading and absorbing knowledge, we add impetus and power to this subjective mind. It becomes enriched as we add to our sum total of knowledge. As the subjective mind registers external stimuli through the five senses, and then acts upon the facts it so gathers, it arrives automatically at certain conclusions, and releases this knowledge through the normal avenues of brain and nerves and muscles, in thought, speech and action. If this subjective mind is filled with positive thoughts, noble and lofty expressions, idealistic concepts, the real you becomes imbued with more and more power and acts in accordance with these positive states of consciousness. On the other hand, if the knowledge absorbed is of a low standard, common, vulgar and cheap, it must of necessity color the real you, the subjective mind, with a similar quality. 4. By listening to the intuitive voice as it speaks through your consciousness. This inner voice is called by many names, intuition, hunch, psychic phenomena, and extrasensory perception. In reality, it is an awareness through the normal powers of comprehension. It is stronger and more highly developed in those who dwell a great deal in the subjective side of life. This power of intuition, then, may be said to be the working of your subjective mind. It knows more about you and the secret workings of your brain and body than can ever be discovered by other means. It is a type of spontaneous knowledge. It is the power within you that never stops even when asleep. It works through your subconscious mind, digests your food, causes your heart to beat, the blood to circulate, the lungs to expand. It is the life force expressing itself within man. 5. The subjective mind is reached through meditation. The subjective mind is highly stimulated by meditation. In meditation, Man is able to attain his most sublime and majestic powers of thinking. He then concentrates all the fire of his consciousness on the purpose and meaning of life he studies and explores through imagination, those realms hidden from the physical senses, and is aware of a deeper meaning to life than the physical and material. Universal mind power is the third subdivision of our subject. It encompasses the other two and embraces all consciousness, all intelligence, all objects. Universal mind power is a term used to express the subjective soul of the universe. It is the power or intelligence that is superior to man's limited consciousness. It expresses itself in the minerals, budding flowers, trees, plants, and animals, as well as human beings. This theory of a universal or cosmic mind power comes from a study of the word cosmos, which derives from the Greek word cosmos, meaning order and harmony, or universal harmony relation of universal objects one to the other, as differentiated from chaos or lack of harmony. This word cosmos embraces then, not merely the human objective and subjective experience, 
but the entire subjective soul of the universe. It is a superior intelligence that transcends the limited consciousness of man. It is only when man has found this cosmic force or universal intelligence and submerges his other two selves in it that he really unlocks the greatest power in the universe. Some discover this universal power through turning to the inner self and seeking refuge from the outer world. There they explore the hidden mysteries of life and evolve knowledge that becomes practical and workable in the third dimensional experience of life. This cosmic consciousness or intelligence, because it supersedes man's intelligence and evinces itself in the natural forces of the universe, becomes a great impersonal intelligence. It operates through gravity, affects the tides, the budding and blooming of flowers and trees, gives instinct to animals and birds and insects, causes the sun to radiate, and in the limited microcosm, man automatically performs his functions of breathing, digestion, circulation, and heart heat. When we think of this universal intelligence as a God-man force, it is rather unfortunate. For the moment we think of God as limited to the personal factor, we are in the objective realm again, making God physical and material rather than omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent. This universal intelligence, emanating from some great force, is unlimited, and when we see God as a personal God or as man, the power is no longer cosmic or universal, but limited to man's puny strength. If we wish to truly grasp a consciousness of what this universal intelligence or God-mind really is, we must do so in a purely subjective manner. Recognition should be in your inner self, through your own I am principle or consciousness. Then you fulfill the complete trinity of life, objective man-self, subjective mind-self, and universal or cosmic God-self. You then awaken to this astounding truth, God is something within you, and you are something within him, and the two are intermingled as one atoms of the same body, planets of the one universe, cells of the one brain, intelligence of the one mind. Chapter 13 Essentials of a Well-Balanced Personality Personality is a much abused word. We hear the terms dynamic personality, magnetic personality, weak and inadequate personality, maladjusted personality, etc., with very little understanding of the true components of the normal or balanced personality. There are several factors which determine what your personality shall be. No personality that is lacking in any of these several component parts may be said to be a normally adjusted, happy or efficient personality. These six essentials are 1. The physical self, the physique and its normalcy. Two. The mental or intellectual side of the personality. 3. The character, sum total of personal qualities. 4. General temperament, the action of the emotions and their normal control. 5. The ethical tendencies, methods of conduct moral or immoral, etc. 6. The spiritual factor the sensitivity and beauty of the personality when fully matured and balanced. If your personality is weak, inferior, inadequate, or maladjusted, it is because all these six elements are not functioning fully and harmoniously. To possess a well-balanced and integrated personality, it is essential that you fulfill certain inherent requirements of the nature. When certain types of personality maladjustment exist, it is because there is conflict within the ego. To discover if you have the essentials of a well-balanced, which means a happy personality, it might be interesting to answer the following questions and rate your personality scientifically. Personality Rating 1. Do you feel that you are normally happy with a full enjoyment of life? 2. Are you physically healthy? Is your body functioning normally? Three. Do you consider yourself efficient compared to other people? 4. Is your outlook on life bright and cheerful? 5. Do you enjoy your work or life activity? 6. Do you have a master motive in life? Are you concentrating on the attainment of some desirable life goal? 7. Do you feel perfectly at ease in the presence of others? 
8. Do you get along with other people? This includes relatives as well as friends or strangers. 9. Do you have a well-defined sense of humor? 10. Is your life philosophy an adequate one? For your personality rating, score yourself 10% for each question answered yes. The perfect score means that all 10 questions should be answered in the affirmative. If you answered 9 questions yes, you may consider your personality adjusted and normal in every way. If you answered 7 questions yes, your personality is average. If you answered only six or less than six questions in the affirmative, there is some maladjustment in your personality, and your personality is weak or inefficient. Types of Personality Maladjustment There are certain types of personality maladjustment. To know them is to know yourself as well as others. There are many other types perhaps than the following, but these are the general types of maladjustment that we meet in everyday life. One. The physically maladjusted, due to some physical defect, such as blindness, deafness, crippled, strange personal appearance, deformity, or disease. 2. The intellectually morbid, those who suffer from an inferiority complex, inadequacy socially, or self-consciousness. This type often have morbid fears, complexes, stage fright, and strange compulsions. 3. Social maladjustment. This group is timid, easily embarrassed, bashful, and generally unable to get along with other people. They are often called eccentric. 4. Emotional conflicts. Those who have been suppressed, who indulge in hysterics and outbursts with little provocation. This type suffer anxiety and worry about everything. 5. Moral maladjustment. Guilt feelings over some past indiscretion conscience-stricken over mistakes of the early youth, generally some sexual indiscretion, theft, or other infraction of the spiritual or moral codes. This type often is in conflict between the animal propensities and the higher spiritual nature. 6. The cosmically maladjusted, those persons who are in conflict with their ideals, who have serious religious doubts, and who feel that they are unable to make any definite decision between religious feelings and science. Obviously, when a condition of maladjustment exists, the only logical thing to do is to set to work to straighten it out. There are many different techniques for attaining this personality adjustment, which must be individually worked out. A brief description of the method for handling each type of maladjustment will now be given, with the warning that perfect personality adjustment often depends on further and more elaborate study with a specialist in that field, such as a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Maladjustment Corrections 1. The physically maladjusted probably suffer more than any other single group, for they often feel that their disappointments and failures in life are due to their physical lack. There must be logical and rational explanations to the mind for the existence of these physical disturbances. The individual must next realize that no physical disturbance has ever been a real deterrent to the great men and women of history who suffered physical maladjustment. Robert Louis Stevenson was sick for many years with an incurable disorder, and yet attained fame. Alphonse Daudet did his greatest work, even though incapacitated by an illness which kept him bedridden. Napoleon attained his many conquests, even though he was physically short compared to other men. Steinmetz was a hunchback, and yet this did not inhibit him, nor keep him from attaining outstanding fame as an inventor. Edison's deafness is too well known to require elaboration. Beethoven too suffered from this affliction. Physical and organic disturbances are a challenge to any man or woman. To overcome them requires real courage and fortitude, but they can be overcome and a normal, happy, useful life can still be lived despite physical maladjustments. 2. The intellectually morbid represents that group who are oversensitive and keenly aware of their limitations. Morbid fears grow on more fear to overcome this type of personality defect. It is necessary to make positive suggestions to the subconscious mind and to attain some degree of proficiency in work that is thoroughly enjoyed.
Immersion in useful activity is one sure method for forgetting fears, worries, and morbidity. 3. The socially maladjusted are generally extremely timid and bashful. They often suffer real or imaginary inferiority feelings. This often causes them try and cover up by being hostile, sarcastic, and superior in attitude. There are many causes for this type of many maladjustment, but of them originate in the early years of life, owing to insecurity in the home, poverty, lack of education, or other so called inferior conditions. The only way to overcome this condition is to know that you are equal to any person, for all are born in the divine image and likeness. Then, too, if one works to overcome real inferiority through intelligent effort by acquiring knowledge, the causes of the inferiority can be overcome. 4. The cases of emotional conflict are the most difficult to handle, for they are often due to years of suppression. Those who are tied to the mother's apron strings, as the saying goes, are apt to suffer this type of inadequacy. The only cure is to break the bonds of the particular thing that is causing the mental or physical suppression. This must often be done by sheer force. There is often a weakness in the personality of a suppressed person, for a sense of dependency on someone stronger than themselves leads them to believe they must continue this leaning on the shoulders of the strong. Moral maladjustment must be overcome by a process of rationalizing. Every person commits infractions against the moral and spiritual laws of life. This is often due to ignorance. God holds man accountable for those sins which are deliberately committed, and has ready forgiveness for those who are ignorant of their sinning children, are especially exempt from these moral and spiritual laws, as they are not spiritually evolved in the early years. Know then that any such moral indiscretions are in no way permanent blots on the mind, body, or soul, but capable of being forgiven. 6. Those who are cosmically maladjusted are merely seeking a method by which they may reconcile their conflict between materiality and spirituality. To accept some spiritual premise, even against the negative concepts of science, is to assure the individual of harmony and balance in the ego. The conception of spirituality taught by any religion is good therapeutically, for the qualities of faith, hope, and tranquility are transmitted to the troubled mind, and the belief in immortality and soul survival work a very real miracle in the mind and body of the cosmically maladjusted. There are certain mental attitudes which all balanced and adjusted personalities must attain. When these attitudes are incorporated into the mental structure, there is more stability and happiness. Chapter 14 Positive Affirmations for Meditation Every day should be started with a positive affirmation and every evening, just before retiring, the mind should be readied for sleep with another positive statement. The affirmations given here may be used as given or varied to suit individual needs. They may be said aloud, whispered to yourself, or written. Many people have a special time of the day or evening set aside for meditation purposes. This is a practice that is highly commendable. During such meditation periods, it is best to retire into a quiet, dimly lighted room where you will be undisturbed. If you wish candle light, it often adds a soft glow and gives a more church-like atmosphere to your meditation. Many prefer to create a special little niche like an altar, before which the meditation period may be consummated. Any method which gives you peace and comfort is advocated. When starting positive affirmations, be certain to say them with feeling and deep conviction even if they are only whispered to yourself. When sleeping, these affirmations become so ingrained in your subconscious mind that they work on the body and consciousness to create the conditions which you have positively affirmed. The Purpose of Affirmations and Meditation As the conscious and subconscious minds rule the body, you literally become what you think and affirm. If you think thoughts of poverty, sickness, unhappiness, worry, fear, hate, lack and limitation, you are filling your brain with the destructive thoughts, which in turn communicate their deadly poisons to the atoms and cells of your body. The purpose of meditation and positive affirmations, then, is to clear the conscious and subconscious minds of these deadly negative thoughts, which fester within the consciousness. When the mind has once been thoroughly cleaned of these negative thoughts, a process which takes a year or more, you must begin to carefully guard your mind against the continued intrusion of negative thoughts. 
You must consciously stand like a policeman at the entrance to your mind, checking the incoming and outgoing thoughts. It will be futile to give positive affirmations for attracting success if the very next day you think of how you are a failure, or how financially limited you are. To affirm these conditions positively, you must believe them implicitly. Faith is the force which generates the power to perform the miracles which can happen in your life through the power of positive affirmations. 1. Affirmation to clear your mind of all negative thoughts. I now affirm the reality of my being. I function on three planes of consciousness, physical, mental, and spiritual. I am created in the image and likeness of the living God. I am therefore master of my destiny. I now command all negative forces within my conscious and subconscious minds to instantly quit their place of abode. My body is a golden chalice for the spirit of the living God. There is no room in my consciousness for fear, worry, hate, lack, limitation, sickness, poverty, loneliness, old age, accident, or failure thoughts. I now affirm that these conditions from the past negative thinking be here and now and forever completely eradicated from my consciousness. I now supplant in their place these positive, dynamic, life-giving, God-conscious thoughts. I'm a radiant reflection of divine mind. I embody all the positive principles of joy, beauty, happiness, peace, health and prosperity within every atom and cell of my brain and body. I am radiantly happy, youthfully alive, and perfectly poised. 2. Affirmation for Overcoming Fatigue I now affirm the law of my being. I am a perfect expression of divine intelligence. This divine force works within me in balance, rhythm, harmony, and poise. There can be no condition of unbalance, chaos, or fatigue within this divine abode. The radiant life force flows through me, energizing, revitalizing, and replenishing the power currents of my body. All fatigue poisons are now commanded to leave my body through their natural avenues of escape, now assert the life rhythm of the universal soul. This vibration flows through me, uplifting, composing, relaxing, and chemicalizing every atom and cell with new, life-giving energy. The vibrations of my positive thoughts now radiate throughout my body, bringing me perfect equilibrium. 3. Affirmation for Maintaining Good Health I clear my consciousness of all negative, sickly, depressing, and discouraging thoughts. I banish from the threshold of my consciousness every thought and negative suggestion of mortal mind regarding the state of health of my perfect body. There is no reality to sickness, germs, colds, drafts, or physical afflictions of any kind. I affirm the spiritual reality back of all living cells. Vibration exists in all things, permeating with the Spirit of God, the cells of my brain and body. I affirm that I am the perfect self, reflecting the perfection of God. I operate under the law of spiritual balance. I am strong, vital, healthy, youthful, radiant, and perfect in every organ and cell of my being. 4. Affirmation for Overcoming Sickness This affirmation may be used repeatedly when some negative condition has fastened itself on the body. Remember, thoughts are sick first, and these negative thoughts reflecting in the body produce the negative condition known as sickness. This affirmation will help strengthen the body's natural powers of resistance and implement nature's curative agencies. I hear and now affirm the truth about the condition which has fastened itself upon my brain and body. It is a negative cause which has produced a negative effect. To banish the effect of sickness, I hear and now investigate the negative cause which produced this effect. As body reflects the state of consciousness in which mind resides, I recognize the fact that negative thinking has produced this seeming manifestation of sickness. I now banish from my conscious and subconscious minds all negative thoughts of all kinds. All resentment, envy, hate, fear, worry, jealousy or other negative states of consciousness that exist are here and now commanded to leave my consciousness. I supplant all such negative thoughts with the positive, radiant, life-giving vibrations of health, joy, radiance, peace and spiritual awareness. I now become a channel through which the healing power of God may radiate. I am an unobstructed trunk line leading direct from God to this body. All the spiritual forces of the universe now rush directly to me, comforting me, soothing me, 
bringing me peace and perfect healing. 5. Affirmation for Overcoming Insomnia It is useless to fight insomnia, for the more you write it, the worse it gets. It is best to make positive affirmations that bring the system of autosuggestion into practice, causing the imagination to take over where the conscious will has failed to bring relaxation and rest. I now affirm the conditions which I wish to prevail in my consciousness. I am conscious of my mental faculties. I think the thoughts I now wish to think. I direct and control my thoughts to those incidents in my life which are pleasant and restful. I recognize that no harm can come to me because of my wakefulness. I desire relaxation, calm and peace. I direct my imagination to pursue those pictures of pleasure and happiness which have brought me joy in the past. I now affirm that my conscious will is no longer obstructing the natural desire of my body and brain for obtaining needed rest. My conscious will is now held in abeyance, and my powers of constructive and positive thinking now hold sway. I am conscious of the divine power flowing through me, bringing me peace and calm. As my thoughts are held on the vibrant spiritual ideals of truth, peace, beauty, happiness, joy and gentility, I recognize that these qualities radiate throughout my body and brain. I desire rest and relaxation. I am in tune with the infinite. I wander in the purple realms of the cosmos. I visualize the splendor of the rising moon, casting its mellow glow over the sleeping world. I witness the spectacle of the illumined skies proclaiming their divinity. I stand beside a moon-bathed pool in the purple shadows of a deep forest, seeing the reflection of the clouds overhead, mirrored in the calm and tranquil depths of the stream. The pool is now quiet and restful, deep and still, as deep and still and calm and tranquil as my own soul. I am now more and more calm and still. The stillness creeps into my mind, it permeates every cell of my being, bringing deep, deep relaxation, deep, deep restful sleep. 6. Affirmation for Increased Supply I affirm the reality of universal abundance. There is no lack or limitation in divine mind. Poverty is man-made and therefore unreal. I now remove all restrictions from my consciousness of poverty, lack and limitation. I am now an unobstructed channel through which the divine intelligence within me may manifest the supply I require to meet my needs. I recognize that supply must be used intelligently, wisely, and without greed. I therefore become the custodian of the property of God. I share with the world these worldly goods, knowing they belong to all equally to be used for good. I now ask divine guidance as to the methods my own supply shall come to me. I see the full outpouring of riches and opulence of the universe, and here and now claim my inheritance. File the divine will bestowing this legacy on me in the court of the universe, and accept my heritage with humility and gratitude. 7. Affirmation for Overcoming Fear To be used in conjunction with the 23rd Psalm, I recognize the divine principle which is inherent in my being. I am created in the image and likeness of God. He is my shepherd, and I know that I shall not want as all is provided for those who trust and believe in His infinite mercy and wisdom. I now lie down in the cool green pastures of life, beside the tranquil still waters. I become one with the infinite calm and tranquility of the stream of life floating onto the cosmic sea, and verily my soul is restored. I walk in the paths of righteousness, for divine intelligence is my omnipresent, omniscient, and omnipotent guide. His name is on my lips, casting out all negativity, fear, and worry. His consciousness is my consciousness. I fear no person, situation, or thing, and even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, death being a natural phenomena and as universal as birth and life. I know that He is with me always. I lean upon the sacred promises of His words. They become my rod and my staff, and truly they comfort me. I fear no enemies or mortal mind threats, for I feast at the abundant table which Thou hast set for me in the presence of those enemies of good witcher. Fear, worry, hate, lack, sickness, death, accident, old age, and poverty. Thy presence banishes these mortal enemies, and my consciousness anointed by the oil of Thine infinite mercy truly rests secure in Thee. The bounty given me causes my cup of life to run over with goodness, beauty, love, joy, and riches. I accept these gifts of goodness and mercy, 
knowing that as I am in tune with divine mind, they shall follow me all the days of my life, and that I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. 8. Affirmation for Dynamic Personality I now become aware of my true identity. I am no longer limited, fearful, and self-conscious. I am created in the image and likeness of God. My body is a temple in which resides the eternal life principle. It is illumined and radiates beauty, joy, and usefulness. I am now an unified personality, in which mind, body, and soul function perfectly. I am poised. I am confident. I am radiant. I am happy. I am rich. I am healthy. I am tranquil and calm. I am a radiant, dynamic center in which all the harmonies of universal mind reflect themselves. There is no room in my consciousness for discord, chaos, and confusion. I now state the law of my being. Peace. Be still and know that I am God. I now reflect in my every attribute of personality godliness, beauty, charm, courtesy, consideration, generosity, and happiness. 9. Affirmation for loss of loved ones. I now approach the inner shrine of my being, and there, before the sacred presence which is the eternal life force, affirm the divine law of immortality. Knowing that there is no beginning and no ending to the eternal divine principle of intelligence and life, I now affirm that the beloved presence exists in reality and for all time in some other invisible dimension. And knowing that intelligence inherent in matter depends not on time, space, or substance, I am conscious that my beloved one hovers protectingly over me, guiding me, comforting me, helping me understand the laws governing the invisible domain. I am now released of worry and fear. I now know that the soul is once again cradled in the arms of the God who gave it the breath of life. There is no ending to life, only constant beginning. Therefore, I now consign the soul of my beloved to the source of its creation, confident that the life cycle must perpetuate itself, even as the rose contains within itself the seed of its immortality. 10. Affirmation for Overcoming Worry My consciousness is now free of all conditions that produce worry. Knowing that all life is transitory and that sentient being is subject to the laws governing matter, I recognize the limitations imposed on physical objects. All things pass and only that which is spirit remains. My present problem, which confuses my senses and obstructs my spiritual vision, is now vanishing under the concentrated ray of mind's spiritual illumination. I consign all worries, fears, obstacles, and obstructions to the ever-flowing stream of time. They are now borne upon the crest of the wave into the oblivion of the past. I exist only in the now and cannot be conscious of worries, fears, delusions, or conditions of the past or the future. My mind is instantly cleared of all troublesome matters. I invoke divine intelligence to help me re-establish contact with that stream of infinite wisdom which is capable of resolving all problems into the native nothingness which they truly are. 11. Affirmation for Love Happiness I now affirm the creative law governing all life. I am created in the divine mold of perfect love. Love permeates every atom and cell of the entire universe and reflects in all growing things. I am a part of the eternal reality of life. Therefore, love motivates everything I think and do. This radiant life force flows through my consciousness. It is recognized by everyone I meet. It transforms me and changes my environment. As I express the law of creative love, I'm stimulated, energized, and beautified. As I speak the language of love, it becomes a universal symphony of beauty and joy, uniting all, transfiguring all, illuminating all with its effulgence and radiance. As love is the law of my being, it causes me to reside in peace and harmony with my loved ones. All misunderstandings, friction, and discord must disappear under the divine impetus of spiritual love. My love now radiates not only to family and friends, but cosmically to the entire world, uniting all in sacred bonds of divinity. I now feel the one pulse beat, the one compelling emotion, the one propulsive life force, which motivates all animate and inanimate things. I am united by holy bonds of love to the Godhead of the universe. Atoms of the one cell. Cells of the one body. Body of the one God. God of the one universe. 12. Affirmation to help others overcome negative conditions. Knowing that intelligence is an invisible power capable of permeating all solids, 
and being transmitted by the invisible waves in the atmosphere. I here and now direct my conscious thoughts to use name of person you are trying to help I affirm that you are created in the image and likeness of God, that your destiny is directly under his control. I now send you positive, constructive thoughts. I now direct the negative condition that is imprisoning you to leave your consciousness. I now project you into time and space as perfect in mind, body, and soul. I assert that you have now found your divinity, that you have overcome all habits and conditions which have obstructed you in the past. I now radiate spiritual love to you, knowing that you will be completely restored mentally and physically. Any and all conditions of sickness of mind or body that have in the past held you imprisoned are now directed to completely dissolve into their native nothingness. I see you perfect, happy, radiant, joyously acquiescent, youthful, rich, and residing in the God consciousness which now floods your entire being. 13. Affirmation for Finding Your Right Work I am now a receiving station for the divine promptings which are radiating throughout space as universal intelligence. I now restore my soul to the pristine splendor of its original birth from the womb of the universe. The divine voice now speaks to me in the inner stillness of my cathedral of the soul. I am still, tranquil and calm. I listen to the directing intelligence within my being. I desire guidance to the finding of my right place in the universe. I now place my humble gifts of mind and body upon the altar of universal service. I wish to be engaged in work that will be of good to humanity. No matter the place or condition, I offer that priceless gift bestowed upon me by divine decree to the world for constructive good. Guide me, O radiant light, to my rightful destiny. 14. Affirmation for Overcoming Age and Attaining Youthful Radiance I now assert the law of the universe. There is no time or space in spirit. Matter and the physical forms of life are only third-dimensional and subject to the laws of spirit. My physical form is subject to the laws of matter, but my soul is subject only to the invisible laws controlling spiritual forms. I now affirm the reality of my mind and body. I am eternally young and radiant, as time and space do not exist. I am then a personified thought form of God, and possess his indestructible qualities, his eternal beauty of spirit, his ageless qualities. I now call upon the ever-present radiant youth consciousness within me to express itself in beauty of mind and body. As matter is non-existent, soul must then shine forth with all its beauty and effulgence, causing my body to become translucent and a reflector of divinity. I now embody in consciousness all the rejuvenating, youthful thoughts and emotions. I reflect hope and optimism. I am calm and poised. I embody the principles of godliness, which externalize themselves as charity and forgiveness. I am considerate and courteous to all. I possess deep, health-restoring faith. I now summon all my will and inner power to concentrate on the mental image of the perfect mind, the perfect body, the perfect personality. I see myself as young, radiant, beautiful, vibrant, dynamic, and scintillating. 15. Affirmation for Overcoming Bad Habits These affirmations for overcoming bad habits may be used for any negative condition, either for yourself or for others. As thought has the power to transmit itself to others, it often helps another to work mentally to correct habits that are destroying them. Some of the most common bad habits which are mentally or physically destructive are 1. Worrying 2. Fearing 3. Thinking poverty 4. Thinking sickness 5. Mental laziness and physical laziness 6. Procrastination 7. Dishonesty, cheating, lying, distorting. 8. Gossiping and scandal monging. 9. Smoking. 10. Drinking alcoholic beverages. 11. Slovenly personality. 12. Discourteous action. 13. Sarcasm and nagging. 14. Fault finding. 15. Nervousness. 16. Irritability and bad temper. 17. Moodiness and depression. 18. Envy. Hate, jealousy. 19. Immoderate habits. Overeating, 
drinking, dissipation of every form. 20. Weak willpower. 21. Ignorance. 22. Suspicion of others. 23. Living in the past. 24. Discouraging others. 25. Lack of tolerance. 26. Suppression. This imposing list of negative habits represents only a partial listing. They are the most common forms of destructive habits, which are built into the average human consciousness. To eradicate the baleful influences engendered by these vicious entities, it is vital that you give yourself constant suggestive treatment to mentally overcome them. It is a good policy to briefly go over them each evening before retiring, giving the short affirmations one after the other. Then, gradually, as you memorize the affirmations, apply them to specific instances where you fall into the old, negative habits of thought. You might, for instance, indulge in irritability and bad temper, and instantly correct the negative condition by giving affirmation number 16 on this list. This reads, I now instantly exercise control of my tongue and temper. My destructive emotions poison my mind and body. I am now calm, poised, peaceful when you have a tendency to indulge in irritability or temper. Stop and say the affirmation. Repeat it over and over if necessary until it is impossible for you to be angry. So too, with the other negative habits on the list, repeat the corrective affirmation over and over for the ones you particularly need until the habit has been constructively eliminated from your consciousness. Corrective Affirmations for Bad Habits 1. Worrying I now cast my worries on the stream of time, knowing that they will be dissolved by infinite spirit and intelligence which rules the universe. 2. Fearing I banish fear from my consciousness. I form the habit of perfect confidence. I have faith in myself, my destiny, my country, my job, my future, and my God. 3. Thinking poverty. There is no poverty in the universe. There is only opulence and abundance. I now draw on universal supply for all my needs. 4. Thinking sickness. I now assert the life-giving principle of perfect health. My organs function perfectly. I am healthy, strong, vital. 5. Mental laziness and physical laziness. I am now motivated by the ever-present creative spirit which rules the universe. I am energy and action. I now have new joy in my tasks and perform them joyously. 6. Procrastination. I recognize only the law of the eternal now. I therefore do that which needs being done here and now and complete all tasks today. 7. Dishonesty. The law of attraction works in my life. I attract that which I give out. Honesty is the law of my life in all dealings with others. 8. Gossiping. When I mentally destroy others, I am a murderer. I now create life instead of taking it. I now spread joy and happiness rather than tales of disaster and filth. 9. Smoking. I recognize the destructive nature of my bad habit. I defile the temple of the living God. I now change my desire for smoking to a creative will for doing that, which will build constructively my brain and body. This habit is noxious, subhuman, degrading. I rid my consciousness of all desire for this filthy poison that pollutes my body. 10. Drinking alcohol, I know the truth about my habit. It is for the purpose of evading life and escaping boredom or an intolerable condition. I am weakened and grow weaker still through continuance of this habit. I now direct my conscious intelligence and subconscious power to a complete removal from my body cells of a desire for the destructive poison I now drink. I reflect divinity, therefore I keep the temple of the living God clean and wholesome. 11. Slovenliness, my personality, externally and internally, reflects my thoughts. I now restore order, harmony, cleanliness and beauty to my thoughts. 12. Discourteous action. I now reflect courtesy in my thoughts and acts. As nature reflects me in my thoughts, 
others will react in like kind. 13. Sarcasm and nagging. I now realize the harmful effects of criticism, sarcasm and nagging. I substitute kindness, consideration and encouragement for these negative traits. 14. Fault finding. I now see the good, the beautiful and the perfect. Any conditions of negativity now manifested will instantly pass away. 15. Nervousness. My being is the core of the universe. Through me flows the power to overcome all negative conditions. I am calm, tranquil and poised. 16. Irritability and bad temper. I now instantly exercise control of my tongue and temper. My destructive emotions poison my mind and body. I am now calm, poised, peaceful. 17. Moodiness and depression. I am now a creative, active, useful being. I think only thoughts that are positive, happy, and radiant. I now share my joys with those less fortunate than myself. 18. Envy. Hate, jealousy. I am now free of all forms of envy, hate, and jealousy. I recognize only the divine principles of love, trust, and confidence. 20. Weak will power. The divine will flows through my brain and body, instantly galvanizing me to positive action for attaining all good. 21. Ignorance. As intelligence is the law of the universe, I now banish all forms of superstition, ignorance, and mental limitation. I reflect and radiate intelligence in thought, word, and act. 22. Suspicion of others. I have only implicit trust in others. Knowing they reflect my thoughts, they react in accordance with my thoughts of them. 23. Living in the past. I affirm the law of the eternal now. There is no past, no future, only this moment. I make it radiant, beautiful, and happy. 24. Discouraging others. I recognize and appreciate the good in everyone I contact. I encourage and elevate all persons I live with and work with. 25. Lack of tolerance. I now exercise understanding of others. I am peaceful in intentions and know that problems can be resolved through mutual understanding. 26. Suppression. I now release myself from the suppression of mind and body from all restricting emotions. Chapter 15. The Power of Concentrated Thought The most powerful forces in the world are those which are concentrated. Concentration means the directing of all one's energies or thoughts to a definite focal point. When energies are scattered to many points, they are not as effective as when directed by the mind to a focalized center. Examples of the power of concentrated forces are Sun's rays concentrated on the karth furnish man with life. When directed through a magnifying glass, the sun can ignite a fire. Radium, when concentrated on diseased tissue, heals it. Electricity, when conducted through wires to a focal point, gives a lamination, heals, cooks, drives motors. Water, when concentrated behind a dam, is capable of turning turbines and creating power. Steam, when channeled and concentrated in a boiler, furnishes power for many purposes. The lightning bolt concentrated on the vast tree trunk has the power of tearing it to slivers. The concentrated spark on a fuse can send a ton of dynamite into a violent explosion. And last of all, when atoms are split and their concentrated energy is confined into a cube three inches square, it is capable of destroying an entire city and thousands of human lives. Power or energy flows in and through everything in the universe. Your brain and body are receptacles for this tremendous cosmic power, which flows in waves throughout space. When you consciously direct or concentrate this power to a specific task, energy is created to meet your needs. When you scatter this energy and fritter it away in aimless pursuits and it lacks direction, the concentrated power of brain and body is scarcely sufficient to keep you going with the normal energy you require for daily needs. To create a superabundance of power, 
there must be a definite and conscious control of the faculties of mind and body. There must be a knowledge of concentration, for only through directing and focalizing the life energy can man harness the forces of nature and subjugate the world to his requirements. To understand more about the power of concentrated thought, it is essential that we understand the two dominant forces existent in the universe embodied by matter. 1. The Law of Inertia That property of matter which causes it to remain at rest, and when in motion to continue in motion, and in the same straight line or direction, unless acted on by some external force. Obviously, when matter remains inert, it is destitute of power of moving itself. Your body, unless motivated by some inner propulsive force, might be said to remain in a state of inertia. It is only galvanized into action when some dynamic impulse motivates it. The next force, then, which affects matter is 2. The Law of Action When matter lacks a propulsive power, it remains in an inert state. When applied to the mind and body, the law of action is that power which sets into motion the mental and physical forces of the body. To break the law of inertia, which tries to draw everything down into the earth by its gravitational pull, it is essential that the law of action be invoked. To discover and use this force is the purpose of this discussion. Concentration can be of two types. 1. Negative concentration. 2. Positive concentration. Negative concentration includes those thoughts of fear, sickness, poverty, worry, hate, failure, and all other negative emotions or thoughts. Such negative concentration disrupts the constructive forces of mind and body and effectively limits the inspirational forces of the mind. Positive concentration sets into motion the mental and physical faculties, stimulates the body's organs and glands, elevates the energies, and brings all the positive powers of the mind into focus on the desired objective. Concentrated power for good or positive results, then, means the constant application of mind power to what you wish to attain. Professor William James of Harvard University, one of the great psychologists of all time, said of concentration, If you only care enough for a result, you will almost certainly attain it. If you wish to be rich, you will be rich. If you wish to be learned, you will be learned. If you wish to be good, you will be good. Only you must then really wish these things and wish them exclusively and not wish at the same time a hundred other incompatible things just as strongly. Wishing then means concentrated thought on one thing at a time and wish them exclusively without scattering this wishing force or desire on a hundred other incompatible things. This does not mean that you may not desire money, love happiness, a home of your own, and even an automobile at the same time, but that concentrated energy must be applied to the materialization of each of the things desired. A general overall picture or goal may be focused in the mind, and then the smaller goals may be gradually fixed in the consciousness, until they grow and evolve into the bigger, more complete pattern. The next principle of concentrated thought is The Law of Periodicity Concentration cannot be continuous on any one thing. There is an ebb and flow of cosmic energy which follows the universal law of periodicity. Make it a point to voluntarily concentrate on the state of consciousness you wish to attain for certain periods of time. Then drop that particular thought and concentrate on something else. It is worse to forcibly hold the mind to one line of thought for hours at a time than to let the mind idle or ramble from one subject to another. To be successful, concentration should be held steadily for anywhere from 15 minutes to an hour and then it should be instantly directed to another thought or activity. As the subconscious mind works over your ideas when you are least aware of it, so too, concentration has the advantage of fixing in the subconscious mind a certain habit or pattern of thinking. The subconscious mind then takes over when you have consciously stopped concentrating and completes the task, giving new facts, indexing the information, and sorting out what can be used for the future, and organizing your thoughts into new patterns by using the old material stored in the depths of the unconscious mind. Oliver Wendell Holmes once said of this force, Our different ideas are stepping stones, 
How we get from one to another we do not know. Something carries us. We, our conscious selves, do not take the step. The creating and informing spirit which is within us and not of us is recognized everywhere in real life. It comes to us as a voice that will be heard. It tells us what we must believe. It frames our sentences and we wonder at this visitor who chooses our brain as his dwelling place. Concentrated thought helps fix the ideas more firmly in the subconscious mind and gives this inner self something with which it may create new forms and evolve new ideas. Ribot, the famous French scientist, said, The mind receives from experience certain data and elaborates them unconsciously by laws peculiar to itself, and the result merges into our consciousness. The more intently, then, we hold the thought which we wish to concentrate on, the more firmly does it become lodged in the subconscious mind and become incorporated into the fabric of our character and destiny. Very often it is true that meta-empirical knowledge, that is, knowledge that lies beyond the realm of experience or the limited physical senses, seems to evolve in the consciousness, due, no doubt, to the ability of the mind to assort the many thousands of facts that have been brought into its mysterious depths from the outside world. Forcing the mind to absorb that which is difficult is not constructive concentration. Absorbing under the stimulus of pleasant emotions or experiences is the best way to fix thoughts in the consciousness. Enjoy doing your work and you will grow much more powerful than if you hate it. Delight in the mental or physical task and concentration becomes a simple act. So too, in concentrating on success, the building of a strong, healthy body, even the attainment of happiness in love or marriage, it is not the hard, driving, concentrated power over long periods of time that counts. It is the easy, gradual building of concentrated power. Do not force or aggressively attack a problem, but gradually bring to bear the power of mind on its solution, and it will much more readily yield. The work will be done when you sleep by your subconscious mind. It is vitally important, however, that when you do concentrate over a period of months or years, in brief periods of mental effort, that you do not have opposite thoughts to those you are trying to impress upon your consciousness. Let us say you are concentrating on the winning of success in your chosen work. You may concentrate on success spasmodically, but what else are you concentrating on in the deep recesses of your subconscious mind? 1. That you might fail. 2. That you are not worthy of success. 3. That you are inferior, lack education or social advantages. 4. That you don't know at what you wish to be a success. 5. That you might lose your job. 6. That you are envious of others who make more than you do. It is possible that for brief periods of time, you concentrate on one or more of the above negative conditions. This has the effect of nullifying all the positive moments you have assiduously concentrated on winning success. The conscious mind has the power to concentrate all its force on the negative or the positive side of life. If you indulge in equal amounts of concentrated effort in building a failure and poverty-stricken consciousness, it is obvious that you are destroying the constructive work you have been doing in desiring success. It is good then to desire success, health, money, love happiness, a dynamic personality, more friends, a better job, a home of your own. But it is vital that you concentrate on the positive attainment of those desires when you do concentrate, rather than on the negative aspects of failure. Dr. Terry Walter says of these thoughts which register on the sensitive subconscious mind, the impressions that enter the subconscious form indelible pictures which are never forgotten and whose power can change the body, mind, manner, and morals. In fact, revolutionize a personality. All during our waking hours, the conscious mind, through the five senses, acts as constant feeder to the subconscious every. And we think a thought or feel an emotion, we are adding to the content of this powerful mind good or bad, as the case may be. Life will be richer or poorer for the thoughts and deeds of today. It is vital then that the positive type of concentration be indulged in over a period of time in brief moments, rather than the spasmodic type of concentration which vacillates from positive to negative from day to day. Hold one idea at a time in consciousness. To really become effective in power of concentration, become a single-track mind. 
Hold only one idea at a time in your consciousness. By that is meant the act of allowing only one single thought at a time to enter your mind. Ruthlessly suppress other thoughts until you are ready to allow them access to the threshold of your consciousness. This will bring order, harmony, rhythm and balance to your thought processes. An orderly mind can bring its concentrated power of thought to bear on a problem more than a chaotic, disorderly mind that jumps from thought to thought like monkeys in a tree. The Orientals have a splendid exercise for training the mind to correct these mischievous and unruly thoughts. As the mind is allowed to jump from thought to thought, they urge that you visualize the thoughts as monkeys. You allow them perfect freedom for a while, and they leap about frenziedly. Finally, you concentrate your full power of mind on them, and reach out mentally, and pluck each unruly member from the limb of the tree of your mind and discard it. As this process continues, each of the thought forces instantly falls into line, and you finally are capable of holding only the one thought in the foreground of your consciousness for as long a period as you wish. This ability to hold one predominant thought at a time is important in mental training. It is the surest road to personal power and attainment. An historical event proves the efficacy of this method of concentrated mind power. Two thousand years ago, Porcius Marcus Cato became convinced from a visit to the rich and flourishing city of Carthage that here was a rival that threatened Rome's supremacy. He vowed that Carthage must be utterly destroyed. No one else shared his fanatical belief, but he made it a point to concentrate all his power of mind on the one obsessing thought. When he spoke before vast audiences in the amphitheater in Rome, he ended his speeches with a single concentrated sentence, Carthage must be destroyed. And because of the dynamic power of that one man's concentrated thought, Carthage was destroyed. Another interesting example of the dynamic power that the brain pours forth under the impetus of holding one concentrated thought at a time was carried by a Los Angeles paper which told of a girl weighing only 100 pounds who was in an automobile accident with her brother. The car pinned her brother underneath, and this frail girl lifted the car single-handed and saved her brother's life. The car weighed over 900 pounds, and under normal circumstances, no man could have moved it. Power of Destructive Negative Thoughts As negative thoughts have just as much power for bad, when concentrated on for any length of time, it is vital that the mind not be permitted to dwell on such negative thoughts at any time. Even short periods of concentration on negative conditions can have deleterious effects on the body and destiny. Dr. Daniel Davis and Dr. A. T. Macbeth Wilson of London found among 50 different patients suffering from ulcers that worry had worn the holes in their stomachs. It was discovered by these doctors that 47 out of 58 attacks among these patients of hemorrhage occurred after prolonged periods of worry or emotional stress. The power of concentrated thought on bodily negative states is scientifically proved by the statement of Dr. Loring Swain, director of a clinic, that 270 cases of arthritis were cured when the patients were freed of worry, fear, and resentment. Dr. Edward E. Stricker said, Fully 50% of the problems of the acute stages of an illness and 75% of the difficulties of convalescence have their primary origin, not in the body, but in the mind of the patient. Here again is scientific proof that holding a negative thought persistently in the mind can directly influence the body and create sickness. It is obvious, then, that negative concentration is as effective for producing sickness, poverty, unhappiness, and moodiness as positive concentration is for producing success, health, happiness, and confidence. Method of Effective Positive Concentration When concentration is to be intense and directed to a specific problem or situation, it is best to choose a room where you will be quite alone. There, in a comfortable chair, relax the body and close the eyes. As your thoughts are apt to ramble, like most persons do, it will be necessary to restrain them. Hold the thought in your consciousness that you wish to bring concentrated power to. Let us say it is a problem of income, that you wish to increase income and wish to direct the full power of mind on finding a solution to the problem. Let your mind dwell first on the benefits to be derived from the increased income. Think of what you need the extra money for, how you would spend it if you had it. Then, 
Let the imagination go over every detail of the method by which you might increase your earning power. Thoughts will begin to appear on the threshold of your consciousness, out of nowhere they will come. And as you concentrate the full power of mind more and more on the problem, a sudden illuminating ray of light will dawn, which will furnish the answer to the perplexing problem. Some such scattered thoughts as these might come through. I need the extra income to buy my own home. The benefits to be derived would be great, for it would help me to elevate the living standards of my family. The children would have a yard in which to play safely. There would be a garden in which we could work extra room for developing my wood carving hobby. Possibly I could convert my hobby into extra cash and advertisement in last night's paper, told of a course in woodwork and cabinet making at the evening high school that might be converted into extra part-time work after hours and bring in enough extra money to save the down payment for the house in a year. This is only an example of what might come through when the concentrated power of mind is brought to bear on some specific problem. Then, too, other thoughts may be added in the period of concentration so that several things are handled in one sitting. Make it a point, however, to take up only one thing at a time and finish with that before you go on to other business. This assures you of the undivided attention of your conscious and subconscious minds. Very often the answer will not come through in that particular session of concentration, but might come to you the next day while engaged in other thoughts or work, or even at night when you are sleeping. It is said that Edison used this method of working out his inventions. He gave them to what he called his helpers, and the complete problem would be worked out by his subconscious mind and given to him at the most unexpected times. Points to bear in mind about concentration. 1. Know what you want. To analyze the things you must do to attain what you want. 3. Plan your work and life ahead so you will make concentrated effort during your working hours. 4. Do only one thing at a time. Think only one thing at a time. 5. When you once start on the path of progress, let nothing stop you. Keep going until you reach the goal upon which you are concentrating. Chapter 16. Man's Mind Can Heal His Body. In other parts of this book we have discussed how man's mind rules his destiny, and how man is able to make himself sick through this same power of mind. As sickness is an effect, it must have a cause. Mind is the determining cause of most sickness. The latest scientific proofs on this subject definitely show that mind is responsible for the greatest share of sickness and even accidents. In the so-called faith cures, the miracles of Lord, and the numerous authenticated cases of instantaneous healings of progressed stages of diseases, it has been observed that the phenomena of healing actually takes place in the mind of the patient. By intense concentration, by the application of faith, by galvanizing the energies of the mind and body into one single, potent agency of healing, open sores, cancerous tissue, tumorous growths, and even numerous cases of paralysis have been healed. The cure in many cases is temporary. In others it is permanent, depending on the religious zeal of the person or the intensity of the belief in the power to heal. As the intelligence for healing is within the mind and body, it is only essential that the sick person be given the assurance that he can heal himself to attain the miracle of healing. In some cases where no results are observable, it is often because the right conditions do not exist. Proofs that mind controls body Dr. Harry Lipton, psychiatrist in the U.S. Public Health Service, has demonstrated that ideas can bring about organic changes in tissue. His method is to use suggestive treatments, where the patient is told in a confident and reassuring voice that the condition with which he is afflicted is being dissolved. Through this method of mental suggestion, shrunken limbs have been completely rebuilt. One patient who had been shot through the thigh could not use his leg for it had drawn upward until the foot was almost up to his hip. After a series of suggestive treatments by Dr. Lipton, within six months' time, the man's leg had straightened out almost entirely, and the muscles had regained some of their former flexibility. Under the power of suggestion, it has been discovered that the sugar content of the bloodstream can be increased or decreased, and has proved extremely valuable in the treatment of diabetes. Dr. Cleckley, at the University Hospital, Augusta, Georgia, 
has removed many benign growths and warts entirely through suggestive therapy. In this study of this new branch of medicine, psychosomatic medicine, it has been discovered that functional and organic disturbances can be produced by the action of the mind and also cured by the same means. Psycho means soul, somatic, body. Many times accidents such as broken limbs, etc., can be directly traced to the person's desire to have an accident. This seems strange, but is due to the suppressed desire of the person for attention or some other hidden mental causes. Dr. Leyland E. Hinsey, Professor of Psychiatry, College of Physicians and Surgeons, Columbia University, and Assistant Director of the New York State Psychiatric Institute and Hospital, in his book, The Person in the Body Says. Within recent years, it has generally been recognized that a very fair proportion of bodily disturbances is due to the moods, the emotions of the individual, to the ideas he builds up about himself regarding his body. In some persons, the fear of disease is often the only damaging evidence of disease, yet it can be so strong as to disable the person in all his daily activities. He says further, physical incapacity, it was learned, could come about as a consequence of the way a person felt in spirit, of the way he regarded himself, whether as a success or as a failure. Living is a series of trial and error, trial and success when we find ourselves in an impossible situation in life. Our predicament is often reflected in physical as well as in mental complaints. Unhappiness of mind is every bit as real in its effects as are the well-established organic diseases. This new branch of medicine gives thousands of cases of diseases produced by power of the mind and also healed by man's mind. The Subconscious Mind in Relation to Health It is a well-known fact that there are two active minds within man's body, the conscious mind, which rules all the conscious faculties and controls his acts and thinking, and the subconscious mind, which rules the automatic functions of the body such as circulation, digestion, breathing, and heart action. The subconscious, because of its important role in regulating the body's functions, is the more important of the two minds. It implicitly obeys the commands given to it through the conscious faculties, reading, thinking, seeing, feeling, and other internal or external conscious stimuli. When the conscious mind tells the subconscious mind by constant repetition that the body is sick, that it is apt to catch cold, that it cannot digest food, that it will inherit some hereditary disease or have an accident, the subconscious mind, which operates under automatic control, begins to set the stage for the suggested negative condition to manifest itself in or out of the body. As the cells of the body reflect the intelligence of the conscious and subconscious minds, they can only perform their delicately balanced tasks under the motor power furnished by the mind. When they are uninhibited by counter-suggestions of negativity, they can but perform their normal tasks in a normal manner. If their current intelligence or power is in any manner short-circuited by the conscious or subconscious mind, they instantly lose their ability to perform their work, become confused, go mad, or in any other way become inactive, and the section of the body which they rule becomes sick. It is vitally important, then, that the conscious mind be controlled in its thought processes so that the suggestions it conveys to the subconscious and thence to the body cells are positive and healthy. Thoughts that produce disease In actual scientific experimentation, it has been found that certain thoughts when dwelt upon over a period of months or years are sufficient to produce disease. The most common of these negative thoughts are 1. Worry produces heart trouble, indigestion, ulcers, tuberculosis, and diabetes. Also found a contributing cause to the condition known as cerebral hemorrhage. 2. Fear weakens the body and makes it prey to all types of infectious disorders. Has been known to kill from shock. Diabetes often produced by prolonged fear attacks or sudden shock. Weakens the heart, interferes with circulation, disrupts the glands, produces ulcers and other deadly conditions. 3. Hate produces virulent poisons in the body and pollutes the bloodstream. Causes complete cessation of many of the body's vital functions if persisted in for any length of time. 4. Selfishness. 
This is a negative condition that inhibits the natural secretions of the glands and produces conditions such as colitis, bowel obstructions, arthritis, rheumatism, and other disturbances, particularly of the heart and circulatory system. 5. Jealousy, suspicion, greed, miserliness cause the same symptoms as hate, envy, resentment, congests and inflames the body, inhibits action of the diaphragm and constricts the lungs, producing pulmonary conditions, bronchitis, asthma, sinusitis, and tuberculosis. The Curative Program An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. This saying is especially apt regarding the condition of bodily health. It is better to maintain a healthy mental and physical regime and avoid sickness entirely. But if the negative condition attaches itself to the body, it is intelligent to see the doctor and obtain an accurate appraisal of the true condition and to use whatever therapeutic means science has at its command to alleviate the negative condition. In addition, you can help yourself immeasurably by adopting a certain mental curative program, which will help put the body into a positive state so it will be able to fight the condition that has fastened upon it. There is a natural curative force within the body of every person, and this intelligent action can be assisted by a certain regime of thinking. 1. Try to restore a state of tranquility and calm to the mind. 2. Go over your thoughts and eradicate all hate, resentment, jealousy, worry, fear, confusion, and other negative thoughts that you have been indulging in for years. 3. Try to create an optimistic attitude toward life. 4. Think happy thoughts. To create a happy state of mind, do some useful activity. 5. Use suggestive therapy to re-establish the condition of good health in the cells of your body. Affirmations for this purpose will be found in Chapter 14 of this book. 6. Avoid talking about sickness or thinking about it. 7. Concentrate at least half an hour a day on seeing the body as perfectly healed. 8. Every night upon retiring, repeat over and over. I'm healthy and strong. Every atom and cell of my body is now working to create perfect health. I'm now healed of every type of affliction. 9. Do not let anything you read or hear that is negative affect you emotionally. Clear your mind instantly by making some positive affirmation regarding it. 10. Dwell only on thoughts of peace, beauty, love, and happiness. For the thoughts you most persistently dwell on become embedded in your conscious and subconscious minds and reflect in your bodily condition. Remember, too, that love is a valuable healing agency. 11. There is therapeutic value in music and color. One lave your environment as beautiful as possible, with the walls of your room a soft sunlight yellow, light Nile or apple green, or a very light shade of sky blue. Have music in your environment if possible, soothing, restful music, not jive or jazz. 12. Use prayer and faith as healing mediums. Read the Bible, particularly the miracles found in the New Testament, and read from the Gist and 23rd Psalms. Science now admits that prayer and spiritual therapy are vital adjuncts in performing the natural miracles of healing. Chapter 17. Finding the Inspiring Forces of Life There is an amazing law in the universe. It is the law of universal increase. All nature is constantly creating supply for the good of man. The more man uses, the more nature produces. The law of increase works alike for rich and poor. It gives its abundance to man when he makes his demands upon nature. This law of universal increase works in man's mind also. As he uses his gifts and evolves mentally, the great universal mind pours through his consciousness with a new floodlight of power and intelligence. The universe is constantly expanding and evolving. There is no static condition anywhere in the world. When man does not follow this great universal pattern of increasing his mental gifts, of elevating his consciousness, expanding his powers, inventing, building, producing his powers atrophy and fall into a state of desuetude. This law of increase is given in Genesis 128, 
And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth and subdue it. Then again we are told in the Bible, For he that hath to him shall be given, and he that hath not from him shall be taken, even that which he hath. In order to continue increasing, expanding, and producing, it is essential that man put himself in tune with some great inspirational force in the universe. Power increases in proportion to the inspirational force back of it. Just as electric power may more readily be produced if there is a great reservoir of water dammed up behind the powerhouse. Where shall man look for this inspirational power with which he may fulfill his universal function of increasing and expanding his gifts? Man must look within himself first, for only in the deep quietude of his inner self may he put himself in tune with the rhythm and harmony of the universe. Man increases his inspiration and his gifts by 1. Unselfish action As the sun does not diminish its power by giving its radiance and power, but rather seems to grow larger, so too, man creates inspiration and power mentally and physically by radiating his force through conscious unselfish action. The selfish nature restricts and inhibits not only the mind, but the body. Thoughts write their message on the face and body indelibly, and others feel selfishness instantly. The great men and women of history have attained greatness by serving humanity, rather than working merely to create a better living for themselves. 2. By removing limitation from the mind and body. That which others have attained, you too may attain. Your inspiration will increase in proportion to your ability to realize that you reflect the divine intelligence existing in the universe, and that you are not limited by time, space, conditions, or persons. 3. By using the law of reciprocity. When you inspire others, you too are given new power. Encourage and praise others every opportunity you get. This furnishes new inspiration to you and creates a feeling of expansiveness and liberality. When you receive something that is beneficial from a person or some situation, make it a point to put some part of that good back into the great universal bank in the form of some creative or constructive act. This may be drawn upon at some later time in your life when you have real need of it. 4. By Absorbing Beauty You cannot be inspired to produce and increase your gifts and give to the world unless you have first created within yourself a crying need for beauty. When you view the great universe, the sunrise and sunset, the swaying trees in the wind, the moon riding high in a calm evening sky, the ebb and flow of the ocean's tides, the beauty of growing flowering plants, these manifestations of the inspiring divine intelligence which flows through all creation can furnish your soul with a new sense of spiritual awareness and an inspirational force which can be harnessed for the good of humanity. It is this type of inspiration that causes artists, writers, musicians, singers, poets, and others to create beauty, harmony, and rhythm. 5. By using your present gift constructively. What hast thou in thine house? We might well ask that pertinent question of our consciousness when we are seeking a method for increasing our gifts or arousing inspiration to carry us onto our life goal. Everyone cannot attain the same destiny. Some do not possess the inspirational power to carry them any further than doing their ordinary daily tasks in quite an ordinary manner. For these unevolved persons, there is no need of higher inspiration. The word mediocre might be used to designate such accomplishments. Those who do not wish to be in this undistinguished class, those who have an ambition to rise higher, to evolve into a new state of consciousness, it is obvious that a definite procedure must be followed if the inspirational power is to be created for this extended flight to fame and fortune. Utilize whatever gift you now have. Hold the dream bright and clear in your consciousness, and let the present be but a stepping stone to the brilliant attainment of the future. Do not become dissatisfied with the present or your lack of accomplishment. Exercise patience, restraint, and imagination. Know that this is but a foundation upon which you are building a magnificent edifice. If the greatness you are trying to create is to endure, it must have a solid base. A pyramid is solid because it is constructed on a solid wide base. If the pyramid were to be put on its point, it would topple over. So too, your life must be built on a solid base 
and gradually tapered to the pinnacle you wish to attain. Inspiration should be in gradual, graded doses, not in great spurts of energy which quickly die out because of lack of sustaining force. There is an evolutionary progress in all things, and in building your life goal, there should be a steady flow of inspiration to meet the daily requirements, but extra little boosts of inspiration and energy to carry you a little higher each day. It is, then, this creative intelligence within us, which Holmes calls the creative spirit, which we must invoke in order to perform the inspired, the beautiful, the noble deeds of life. How do we hear the voice of this creative spirit within? A. By stilling the turmoil within ourselves. B. By overcoming all negative emotions and thoughts. C. By being alert every moment to the beauty in nature. D. By holding a consciousness of the creative mind which is God, manifesting himself in his creation. E. By entering the silence daily for an hour of meditation in which we put our soul in tune with the soul rhythm of the universe. F. By subduing our own conscious minds in moments of doubt and fear, and letting the creative mind within express itself in words of confidence and courage. G. By elevating the intellect for the brain must be a fit abode for this indwelling creative intelligence. We do this through constant study, with a feeling that we are never through acquiring knowledge. When we attain to that degree of mastership where we are balanced, harmonious evolved, this indwelling intelligence will have rich material with which to spin its wondrous miracles. H. By ignoring the constant pressure of the material, physical, sordid, vulgar, and common incidents of life. Most people live in the gutters of life. To truly attain inspirational heights, we must constantly see the mountain peaks of life with their misty, snow-covered grandeur and the clear, bright atmosphere of their lofty solitude. I, by forming habits of drawing on creative intelligence for power to accomplish small goals and gradually increasing our demands until our capacity for receiving this intelligence is increased and we can aspire to the higher goals of life. So an act, reap a habit. Let the thoughts and acts be persistently beautiful, good, truthful, just, rich, peaceful, unselfish, generous, kindly, healthy, and godly. And the habits must inevitably be of like kind, creating a destiny reflecting those positive factors. When you have applied the principles enunciated in these pages, you will have a lifetime regime of thought and action. It will be impossible for you to revert to the old negative habits of thinking and acting if you seriously apply the philosophy of the magnificent life. Your consciousness should now be fully expanded. Your understanding of life should be more advanced. Your cooperation with the invisible laws ruling the universe should be definitely assured. And you should be on the way to the intelligent solution of your life problems. Let no one deter you from the self-avowed perusal of your magnificent life goal. There will be those who scoff and urge you to quit in your desire to aspire and rise to the lofty mountaintops of life. All along your path of pilgrimage to the magnificent Empyrean Heights, you will see the confused, bewildered, fearful, shrinking, hating, lying, deceiving, cheating, debauched, drunken, frustrated, unhappy, poverty-stricken, sickly souls who have fallen by the wayside because of the miserable inertia of their own starved minds. They will cry out to you to help them on the upward struggle. They will claim their load is heavier than yours. They will denounce man and God for creating their limitations. They will label humanity as being unkind and vicious. They will claim they were the victims of prejudice and conspiracy, that their gifts were unappreciated, their talents unrecognized. They will speak of foul play and utter imprecations on your head for passing them on the upward path to the light. And because you are evolved, because you are one of the illumined souls of the universe, and cannot carry their burdens because you know they are being tested, and that they have created the mire which threatens to engulf them, you will meet their threats and vindictiveness with eyes veiled by kindness, gentility, and love. You will scorn none, no matter how humble or lowly. Help all within the limited capacity of your mind and body, but descend with them into the mire, never, on peril of destruction of your mortal soul. Your duty now as a pilgrim on the upward path to the magnificent life will be to inspire, elevate, and ennoble humanity. The divine spark within has now burst into a sacred flame, searing all obstructions that come into your path. 
illuminating all souls who will but follow the sacred light, igniting in all hearts the divine emotion of universal love, purging all experiences of the dross and common, until the pure gold of life manifests itself in every person and situation that your life touches. Truly you are now released from the mundane and limited. Your soul now grows wings and soars into the illimitable reaches of the universe, where bonds of time and space do not exist. There you may consort with the immortals of all time. There discover the hidden secrets of the universe, and know that your soul, now expanded into its rightful comprehension of all things, has never known a beginning and will never know an ending. The inevitability and rightness of your destiny is now a reality. Struggle is ended. Mind is freed. Sensations are conquered. Goals are attained. You have at last obtained a glimpse beyond the mystic cloud that veils the blue horizon, and have there discovered the land of eternal youth and beauty, wherein reside those who have found the magnificent life. This recording of The Magnificent Life by Anthony Norvell was presented by David DeAngelis. Sound recording copyright 2022 and produced by Deep Sen Limited 2022.